Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 1 My father's family name being Pirrip, and my Christian name Philip, my infant tongue could make of both names nothing longer or more explicit than Pip. So I called myself Pip, and came to be called Pip. I give Pirrip as my father's family name on the authority of his tombstone, and my sister, Mrs. Joe Gargery, who married the blacksmith. As I never saw my father or mother, and never saw any likeness of either of them, for their days were long before the days of photographs, my first fancies regarding what they were like were unreasonably derived from their tombstones. The shape of the letters on my father's gave me an odd idea that he was a square, stout, dark man with curly black hair. From the character and turn of the inscription, also Georgina, wife of the above, I drew a childish conclusion that my mother was freckled and sickly. To five little stone lozenges, each about a foot and a half long, which were arranged in a neat row beside their grave, and were sacred to the memory of five little brothers of mine, who gave up trying to get a living exceedingly early in that universal struggle, I am indebted for a belief I religiously entertained that they had all been born on their backs with their hands in their trouser pockets, and had never taken them out in this state of existence. Ours was the marsh country down by the river, within as the river wound twenty miles of the sea. My first most vivid and broad impression of the identity of things seems to me to have been gained on a memorable raw afternoon towards evening. At such a time I found out for certain that this bleak place overgrown with nettles was the churchyard, and that Philip Pirrip, late of this parish, and also Georgina, wife of the above, were dead and buried, and that Alexander, Bartholomew, Abraham, Tobias, and Roger, infant children of the aforesaid, were also dead and buried, and that the dark flat wilderness beyond the churchyard, intersected with dikes and mounds and gates, with scattered cattle feeding on it, was the marshes, and that the low leaden line beyond was the river, and that the distant savage lair from which the wind was rushing was the sea, and that the small bundle of shivers growing afraid of it all, and beginning to cry, was Pip. "'Hold your noise!' cried a terrible voice, as a man started up from among the graves at the side of the church porch. "'Keep still, you little devil, or I'll cut your throat!' A fearful man, all in coarse grey, with a great iron on his leg, a man with no hat, and with broken shoes, and with an old rag tied round his head, a man who had been soaked in water, and smothered in mud, and lamed by stones, and cut by flints, and stung by nettles, and torn by briars, who limped and shivered and glared and growled, and whose teeth chattered in his head as he seized me by the chin. Oh, don't cut my throat, sir, I pleaded in terror. Pray don't do it, sir. Tell us your name, said the man. Quick! Pip, sir. Once more, said the man, staring at me. Give it mouth. Pip, Pip, sir. Show us where you live, said the man. Point out a place. I pointed to where our village lay on the flat inshore among the older trees and pollards, a mile or more from the church. The man, after looking at me for a moment, turned me upside down and emptied my pockets. There was nothing in them but a piece of bread. When the church came to itself, for he was so sudden and strong that he made it go head over heels before me, and I saw the steeple under my feet, when the church came to itself, I say, I was seated on a high tombstone, trembling while he ate the bread ravenously. "'You young dog,' said the man, licking his lips, "'what fat cheeks you have got!' I believe they were fat, though I was at that time undersized for my years, and not strong. "'Darn me if I couldn't eat em, said the man, with a threatening shake of his head, "'and if I ain't half a mind to.' I earnestly expressed my hope that he wouldn't, and held tighter to the tombstone, on which he had put me, partly to keep myself upon it, partly to keep myself from crying. Now look here, said the man, where's your mother? There, sir, I said. 
He started, made a short run, and stopped and looked over his shoulder. There, sir, I timidly explained. Also Georgina, that's my mother. Oh, said he, coming back. And is that your father along of your mother? Yes, sir, said I. Him too, late of this parish. Ah, he muttered, then considering. Who do he live with? Supposing you're kindly let to live. Which I ain't made up my mind about. My sister, sir, Mrs. Joe Gargery, wife of Joe Gargery, the blacksmith, sir. Blacksmith, eh? said he, and looked down at his leg. After darkly looking at his leg and me several times, he came closer to my tombstone, took me by both arms and tilted me back as far as he could hold me, so that his eyes looked most powerfully down into mine, and mine looked most helplessly up into his. Now looky here, he said. The question being whether you're to be let to live, do you know what a file is? Yes, sir. Do you know what Whittles is? Yes, sir. After each question, he tilted me over a little more, so as to give me a greater sense of helplessness and danger. You get me a file, he tilted me again, and you get me Whittles, he tilted me again. You bring them both to me, he tilted me again, or I'll have your heart and liver out. He tilted me again. I was dreadfully frightened, and so giddy that I clung to him with both hands, and said, If you would kindly please to let me keep upright, sir, perhaps I shouldn't be sick, and perhaps I could attend more. He gave me a most tremendous dip and roll, so that the church jumped over its own weather clock, and then he held me by the arms in an upright position on top of the stone, and went on in those fearful terms, you bring me tomorrow morning early that file and them whittles you bring the lot to me at that old battery over yonder you do it and you never dare to say a word or dare to make a sign concerning your having seen such a person as me or any person some ever and you should be let to live you file or you go from my words in any particular no matter how small it is and your heart and your liver shall be tore out roasted and ain't now i ain't alone as you may think i am there's a young man hid with me in comparison with which young man i am an angel that young man hears the words i speak that young man has a secret way peculiar to himself of getting at a boy and at his heart and at his liver it is wain for a boy to attempt to hide himself from that young man a boy may lock his door may be warm in his bed may tuck himself up, may draw the clothes over his head, may think himself comfortable and safe, but that young man will softly creep and creep his way to him, tear him open. I am keeping that young man from harming of you at the present moment with great difficulty. I find it very hard to hold that young man off your inside. Now what do you say? I said that I would get him the file, and I would get him what broken bits of food I could and I would come to him at the battery early in the morning. Say, Lord, strike you dead if you don't, said the man. I said so, and he took me down. Now, he pursued, you remember what you've undertook, and you remember that young man, and you get home. Good, good night, sir, I faltered. Much of that, said he, glancing about him over the cold, wet flat. I wish I was a frog or an eel. At the same time, he hugged his shuddering body in both his arms, clasping himself as if to hold himself together, and limped towards the low church wall. As I saw him go, picking his way among the nettles and among the brambles that bound the green mounds, he looked in my young eyes as if he were eluding the hands of the dead people, stretching up cautiously out of their graves to get a twist upon his ankle and pull him in. When he came to the low church wall, he got over it like a man whose legs were numbed and stiff, and then turned round to look for me. When I saw him turning, I set my face towards home, and made the best use of my legs, but presently I looked over my shoulder, and saw him going on again towards the river, still hugging himself in both arms, and picking his way with his sore feet among the great stones dropped into the marshes here and there for stepping places when the rains were heavy or the tide was in.
the marshes were just a long black horizontal line then as i stopped to look after him and the river was just another horizontal line not nearly so broad or yet so black and the sky was just a row of long angry red lines and dense black lines intermixed on the edge of the river i could faintly make out the only two black things in all the prospect that seemed to be standing upright one of these was the beacon by which the sailors steered like an unhooped cask upon a pole an ugly thing when you were near it the other a gibbet with some chains hanging to it which had once held a pirate the man was limping towards this latter as if he were a pirate come to life and come down and going back to hook himself up again it gave me a terrible turn when i thought so and as i saw the cattle lifting their heads to gaze after him i wondered whether they thought so too i looked all around for the horrible young man could see no signs of him but now i was frightened again and ran home without stopping chapter two my sister mrs joe gargery was more than twenty years older than i and had established a great reputation with herself and the neighbours because she had brought me up by hand having at that time to find out for myself what that expression meant and knowing her to have a hard and heavy hand and to be much in the habit of laying it upon her husband as well as upon me i suppose that joe gargery and i were both brought up by hand she was not a good-looking woman my sister and i had a general impression that she must have made joe gargery marry her by hand joe was a fair man with curls of flaxen hair on each side of his smooth face and with eyes of such very undecided blue that they seemed to have somehow got mixed up with their own whites he was a mild good-natured sweet-tempered easy-going foolish dear fellow a sort of hercules in strength and also in weakness my sister mrs joe with black hair and eyes had such a prevailing redness of skin that i sometimes used to wonder whether it was possible she washed herself with a nutmeg grater instead of soap she was tall and bony and almost always wore a coarse apron fastened over her figure behind with two loops and having a square impregnable bib in front that was stuck full of pins and needles she made it a powerful merit in herself and a strong reproach against joe that she wore this apron so much though i really see no reason why she should have worn it at all or why if she did wear it at all she should not have taken it off every day of her life joe's forge adjoined our house which was a wooden house as many of the dwellings in our country were most of them at that time when i ran home from the churchyard the forge was shut up and joe was sitting alone in the kitchen joe and i being fellow sufferers and having confidences as such joe imparted a confidence to me the moment i raised the latch of the door and peeped in at him opposite to it sitting in the chimney corner mrs joe has been out a dozen times looking for you pip and she's out now making it a baker's dozen is she yes pip said joe and what's worse she's got tickler with her at this dismal intelligence i twisted the only button on my waistcoat round and round and looked in great depression at the fire tickler was a wax-ended piece of cane worn smooth by collision with my tickled frame she sot down said joe and she got up and she made a grab at tickler and she rampaged out that's what she did said joe slowly clearing the fire between the lower bars with a poker and looking at it she rampaged out pip has she been gone long joe i always treated him as a larger species of child and no more than my equal well said joe glancing up at the dutch clock she's been on the rampage this last spell about five minutes pip she's a coming get behind the door old chap and have the jack towel betwixt you i took the advice my sister mrs joe throwing the door wide open and finding an obstruction behind it immediately divined the cause and applied tickler to its further investigation she concluded by throwing me i often served as a connubial missile at joe 
who, glad to get hold of me on any terms, passed me into the chimney and quietly fenced me up there with his great leg. "'Where have you been, you young monkey?' said Mrs. Joe, stamping her foot. "'Tell me directly what you've been doing to wear me away with the fret and fright and warrick, or I'll have you out of that corner if you was fifty pips and he was five hundred gargeries. "'I've only been to the churchyard,' said I from my stool, crying and rubbing myself. "'Churchyard?' repeated my sister. "'If it weren't for me, you'd have been to the churchyard long ago and stayed there. "'Who brought you up by hand?' "'You did,' said I. "'And why did I do it, I should like to know?' exclaimed my sister. "'I whimpered, I don't know.' "'I don't,' said my sister. "'I'll never do it again, I know that. "'I may truly say I've never had this apron of mine off since born you were. "'It's bad enough to be a blacksmith's wife, and him a gargery, without being your mother.' My thoughts strayed from that question as I looked disconsolately at the fire, for the fugitive out on the marshes with the iron leg, the mysterious young man, the file, the food, and the dreadful pledge I was under to commit a larceny on those sheltering premises, rose before me in the avenging coals. Ha! said Mrs. Joe, restoring Tickler to his station. Churchyard, indeed. You may well say churchyard, you two. One of us, by the by, had not said it at all. You'll drive me to the churchyard betwixt you, one of these days, and oh, a precious pair you'd be without me. As she applied herself to set the tea things, Joe peeped down at me over his leg as if he were mentally casting me and himself up, and calculating what kind of pair we practically should make under the grievous circumstances foreshadowed. After that he sat feeling his right side flaxen curls and whisker, and following Mrs. Joe about with his blue eyes, as his manner was always squally at times. My sister had a trenchant way of cutting our bread and butter for us, that never varied. First with her left hand she jammed the loaf hard and fast against her bib, where it sometimes got a pin into it, and sometimes a needle, which we afterwards got into our mouths. Then she took some butter, not too much, on a knife and spread it on the loaf, in an apothecary kind of way, as if she were making a plaster, using both sides of the knife with a slapping dexterity, and trimming and moulding the butter off round the crust. Then she gave the knife a final smart wipe on the edge of the plaster, and then sawed a very thick round off the loaf, which she finally, before separating it from the loaf, hewed into two halves, of which Joe got one, and I got the other. On the present occasion, though I was hungry, I dared not eat my slice. I felt that I must have something in reserve for my dreadful acquaintance, and his ally, the still more dreadful young man. I knew Mrs. Joe's housekeeping to be of the strictest kind, and that my larcenous researches might find nothing available in the safe. Therefore I resolved to put my hunk of bread and butter down the leg of my trousers. The effort of resolution necessary to the achievement of this purpose I found to be quite awful. It was as if I had to make up my mind to leap from the top of a high house, or plunge into a great depth of water, and it was made the more difficult by the unconscious Joe. In our already mentioned Freemasonry as fellow sufferers, and in his good-natured companionship with me, it was our evening habit to compare the way we bit through our slices by silently holding them up to each other's admiration now and then, which stimulated us to new exertions. Tonight, Joe several times invited me, by the display of his fast diminishing slice, to enter upon our usual friendly competition. But he found me, each time, with my yellow mug of tea on one knee, and my untouched bread and butter on the other. At last I desperately considered that the thing I contemplated must be done, that it had best be done in the least improbable manner, consistent with the circumstances. I took advantage of a moment when Joe had just looked at me, and got my bread and butter down my leg. Joe was evidently made uncomfortable by what he supposed to be my loss of appetite, and took a thoughtful bite out of his slice which he didn't seem to enjoy. He turned it about in his mouth much longer than usual, pondering over it a good deal, and after all gulped it down like a pill. 
He was about to take another bite, and he had just got his head on one side for a good purchase on it, when his eye fell on me, and he saw that my bread and butter was gone. The wonder and consternation with which Joe stopped on the threshold of his bite and stared at me were too evident to escape my sister's observation. "'What's the matter now?' she said smartly as she put down her cup. "'I say you know,' muttered Joe, shaking his head at me in a very serious remonstrance. "'Pip, old chap, you'll do yourself a mischief. It'll stick somewhere. You can't have chewed at all, Pip.' "'What's the matter now?' repeated my sister more sharply than before. "'If you can cough any trifle on it up, Pip, I'd recommend you do it,' said Joe, all aghast. "'Manners is manners, but still your elf's your elf.' By this time my sister was quite desperate, so she pounced on Joe, and taking him by the two whiskers, knocked his head for a little while against the wall behind him, while I sat in the corner looking guiltily on. "'Now perhaps you'll mention what's the matter,' said my sister, out of breath. "'You staring great stuck pig!' Joe looked at her in a helpless way, then took a helpless bite, and looked at me again. "'You know, Pip,' said Joe solemnly, with his last bite in his cheek, and speaking in a confidential voice, as if we two were quite alone, "'you and me is always friends, and I'd be the last to tell upon you any time. But such a—' He moved his chair and looked about the floor between us, and then again at me. "'Such a most uncommon bolt as that. "'Been bolting his food, has he?' cried my sister. "'You know, old chap,' said Joe, looking at me, and not at Mrs. Joe, with his bite still in his cheek. "'I bolted myself when I was your age. "'Frequent, and as a boy I've been among many bolters. "'But I never see your bolting equal yet, Pip. "'And it's a mercy you ain't bolted dead.' My sister made a dive at me, and fished me up by the hair, saying nothing more than the awful words, You come along and be dozed. Some medical beast had revived tar water in those days as a fine medicine, and Mrs. Joe always kept a supply of it in the cupboard, having a belief in its virtues correspondent to its nastiness. At the best of times, so much of this elixir was administered to me as a choice restorative, that I was conscious of going about smelling like a new fence. On this particular evening, the urgency of my case demanded a pint of this mixture, which was poured down my throat for my greater comfort, while Mrs. Joe held my head under her arm, as a boot would be held in a boot-jack. Joe got off with half a pint, but was made to swallow that, much to his disturbance as he sat slowly munching and meditating before the fire, because he had had a turn. Judging from myself, I should say he certainly had a turn afterwards, if he had none before. Conscience is a dreadful thing when it accuses man or boy, but when in the case of a boy that secret burden cooperates with another secret burden down the leg of his trousers, it is, as I can testify, a great punishment. The guilty knowledge that I was going to rob Mrs. Joe, I never thought I was going to rob Joe, for I never thought of any of the housekeeping property as his, united to the necessity of always keeping one hand on my bread and butter as I sat, or when I was ordered about the kitchen, on any small errand, almost drove me out of my mind. Then, as the marsh winds made the fire glow and flare, I thought I heard the voice outside of the man with the iron on his leg who had sworn me to secrecy, declaring that he couldn't and wouldn't starve until tomorrow, but must be fed now. At other times I thought, what if the young man, who was with so much difficulty restrained from embrewing his hands in me, should yield to a constitutional impatience, or should mistake the time and should think himself accredited to my heart liver tonight, instead of tomorrow? If ever anybody's hair stood on end with terror, Mine must have done so then, but perhaps nobody's ever did. It was Christmas Eve, and I had to stir the pudding for next day, with a copper stick, from seven to eight by the Dutch clock. I tried it with a load upon my leg, and that made me think afresh of the man with the load on his leg, and found the tendency of exercise to bring the bread and butter out at my ankle, quite unmanageable. 
Happily, I slipped away and deposited that part of my conscience in my garret bedroom. Hark, said I, when I had done my stirring and was taking a final warm in the chimney corner before being sent up to bed. Was that great guns, Joe? Ah, said Joe, there's another convict off. What does that mean, Joe, said I? Mrs. Joe, who always took explanations upon herself, said snappishly, Escaped, escaped, administering the definition like tar water. While Mrs. Joe sat with her head bending over her needlework, I put my mouth into the forms of saying to Joe, What's a convict? Joe put his mouth into the forms of returning such a highly elaborate answer that I could make out nothing of it but the single word, Pip. There was a convict off last night, said Joe aloud, after sunset gun, and they fired warning of him, and now it appears they're firing warning of another. Who's firing, said I. Drat that boy, interposed my sister, frowning at me over her work. What a questioner he is. Ask no questions, and you'll be told no lies. I thought to imply that I should be told lies by her, even if I did ask questions. But she never was polite, unless there was company. At this point, Joe greatly augmented my curiosity by taking the utmost pains to open his mouth very wide, and to put it in the form of a word that looked to me like sulks. Therefore I naturally pointed to Mrs. Joe and put my mouth into the form of saying, her. But Joe wouldn't hear of that at all, and again he opened his mouth very wide and shook the form of a most emphatic word out of it. But I could make nothing of the word. Mrs. Joe, said I, as a last resort, I should like to know, if you wouldn't much mind, where the firing comes from. Lord bless the boy, exclaimed my sister, as if she didn't quite mean that, but rather the contrary. From the hulks. Oh, said I, looking at Joe, hulks. Joe gave a reproachful cough, as much as to say, Well, I told you so. And please, what's hulks, said I? That's the way with this boy, exclaimed my sister, pointing me out with her needle and thread, and shaking her head at me. Answer him one question, and he'll ask you a dozen directly. Hulks are prison ships, right across the meshes. We always use that name for marshes in our country. I wonder who's put into prison ships and why they're put there, said I, in a general way and with quiet desperation. It was too much for Mrs. Joe, who immediately rose. I'll tell you what, young fellow, said she, I didn't bring you up by hand to badger people's lives out. It would be blame to me and not praise if I had. People are put in the hulks because they murder and because they rob and forge and do all sorts of bad, and they always begin by asking questions. Now you get along to bed. I was never allowed a candle to light me to bed, and as I went upstairs in the dark with my head tingling, from Mrs. Joe's thimble having played the tambourine upon it to accompany her last words, I felt fearfully sensible of the great convenience that the hulks were handy for me. I was clearly on my way there. I had begun by asking questions, and I was going to rob Mrs. Joe. Since that time, which is far enough away now, I have often thought that few people know what secrecy there is in the young under terror. No matter how unreasonable the terror, so that it be terror, I was in mortal terror of the young man who wanted my heart and liver. I was in mortal terror of my interlocutor with the iron leg. I was in mortal terror of myself, from whom an awful promise had been extracted. I had no hope of deliverance through my all-powerful sister, who repulsed me at every turn. I am afraid to think of what I might have done on requirement in the secrecy of my terror. If I slept at all that night, it was only to imagine myself drifting down the river on a strong spring tide to the hulks, a ghostly pirate calling out to me through a speaking trumpet as I passed the gibbet station, that I had better come ashore and be hanged there at once and not put it off. I was afraid to sleep, even if I had been inclined, for I knew that at the first faint dawn of morning I must rob the pantry. There was no doing it in the night, for there was no getting a light by easy friction then. To have got one I must have struck it out of a flint and steel, 
and have made a noise like the very pirate himself rattling his chains. As soon as the great black velvet pall outside my little window was shot with grey, I got up and went downstairs, every board upon the way, and every crack in every board calling after me, Stop thief, and get up, Mrs. Joe. In the pantry, which was far more abundantly supplied than usual owing to the season, I was very much alarmed by a hare hanging up by the heels, whom I rather thought I caught when my back was half turned, winking. I had no time for verification, no time for selection, no time for anything, for I had no time to spare. I stole some bread, some rind of cheese, about half a jar of mincemeat, which I tied up in my pocket handkerchief with my last night's slice, some brandy from a stone bottle, which I decanted into a glass bottle I had secretly used for making that intoxicating fluid, Spanish licorice water, up in my room, diluting the stone bottle from a jug in the kitchen cupboard, a meat bone with very little on it, and a beautiful round compact pork pie. I was nearly going away without the pie, but I was tempted to mount upon a shelf to look what it was that was put away so carefully in a covered earthenware dish in a corner, and I found it was the pie, and I took it in the hope it was not intended for early use and would not be missed for some time. There was a door in the kitchen communicating with the forge. I unlocked and unbolted that door and got a file from among Joe's tools. Then I put the fastenings as I had found them, opened the door at which I had entered when I ran home last night, shut it, and ran for the misty marshes. Chapter 3 It was a rimy morning, and very damp. I had seen the damp lying on the outside of my little window, as if some goblin had been crying there all night, and using the window for a pocket handkerchief. Now I saw the damp lying on the bare hedges and spare grass, like a coarser sort of spider's webs, hanging itself from twig to twig and blade to blade. On every rail and gate, wet lay clammy, and the marsh mist was so thick that the wooden finger on the post directing people to our village, a direction which they never accepted, for they never came there, was invisible to me until I was quite close under it. Then, as I looked up at it, while it dripped, it seemed to my oppressed conscience like a phantom devoting me to the hulks. The mist was heavier yet when I got out upon the marshes, so that instead of my running at everything, everything seemed to run at me. This was very disagreeable to a guilty mind. The gates and dikes and banks came bursting at me through the mist, as if they cried as plainly as could be, A boy with somebody else's pork pie, stop him! The cattle came upon me with a like suddenness, staring out of their eyes and steaming out of their nostrils. Hello, a young thief, one black ox with a white cravat on, who even had to my awakened conscience something of a clerical air, fixed me so obstinately with his eyes and moved his blunt head round in such an accusatory manner as I moved around that I blubbered out to him. I couldn't help it, sir. It wasn't for myself. I took it upon which he put down his head, blew a cloud of smoke out of his nose, and vanished with a kick-up of his hind legs and a flourish of his tail. At this time I was getting on towards the river, but however fast I went I couldn't warm my feet, to which the damp cold seemed riveted, as the iron was riveted to the leg of the man I was running to meet. I knew my way to the battery, pretty straight, for I had been down there on a Sunday with Joe, and Joe, sitting on an old gun, had told me that when I was apprenticed to him regularly bound, we would have such larks there. However, in the confusion of the mist, I found myself at last too far to the right, and consequently had to try back along the riverside, on the bank of loose stones above the mud, and the stakes that staked the tide out. Making my way along here with all dispatch, I had just crossed a ditch which I knew to be very near the battery, and had just scrambled up the mound beyond the ditch, when I saw the man sitting before me. His back was towards me, and he had his arms folded, and he was nodding forward, heavy with sleep. I thought he would be more glad if I came upon him with his breakfast, in that unexpected manner, so I went forward softly and touched him on the shoulder. 
he instantly jumped up and it was not the same man but another man and yet this man was dressed in coarse grey too and he had a great iron on his leg and was lame and hoarse and cold and was everything that the other man was except he had not the same face and had a flat broad-brimmed low-crowned felt hat on all this i saw in a moment for i only had a moment to see it in he swore an oath at me made a hit at me it was a round it's the young man i thought feeling my heart shoot as i identified him i dare say i should have felt a pain in my liver too if i had known where it was i was soon at the battery after that and there was the right man hugging himself and limping to and fro as if he had never all night left off hugging and limping waiting for me he was awfully cold to be sure i half expected to see him drop down before my face and die of deadly cold his eyes looked so awfully hungry too that when i handed him the phial and he laid it down on the grass it occurred to me he would have tried to eat it if he had not seen my bundle he did not turn me upside down this time to get at what i had but left me right side upwards while i opened the bundle and emptied my pockets what's in the bottle boy said he brandy said i he was already handing mincemeat down his throat in the most curious manner more like a man who was putting it away somewhere in a violent hurry than a man who was eating it but he left off to take some of the liquor he shivered all the while so violently that it was quite as much as he could do to keep the neck of the bottle between his teeth without biting it off i think you have got the egg said i or oh, much of your opinion boy said he it's bad about here i told him you've been lying out on the meshes and they're dreadful aguish rheumatic too i'll eat my breakfast afore they're the death of me said he i'd do that even if i was going to be strung up to that there gallows as is over there directly afterwards i'll beat the shiver so far i'll bet you he was gobbling mincemeat meat bone bread cheese and pork pie all at once staring distrustfully while he did so at the mist all around us and often stopping even stopping his jaws to listen some real or fancied sound some clink upon the river or breathing of beast upon the marsh now gave him a start and he said suddenly you're not a deceiving imp you brought no one with you no sir no nor give no one the office to follow you no well said he i believe you you'd be but a fierce young hound indeed if at your time of life you could help to hunt a wretched warmint as hunted near deaf and dunghill as this poor wretched warmint is something clicked in his throat as if he had works in him like a clock and was going to strike and he smeared his ragged rough sleeve over his eyes pitying his desolation and watching him as he gradually settled down upon the pie i made bold to say i'm glad you enjoy it did you speak i said i was glad you enjoyed it thank you my boy i do i had often watched a large dog of ours eating his food and i now noticed a decided similarity between the dog's way of eating and the man's the man took strong sharp sudden bites just like the dog he swallowed or rather snapped up every mouthful too soon and too fast and he looked sideways here and there while he ate as if he thought there was a danger in every direction of somebody's coming to take the pie away he was altogether too unsettled in his mind over it to appreciate it comfortably i thought or to have anybody to dine with him without making a chop with his jaws at the visitor in all of which particulars he was very like the dog i'm afraid you won't leave any of it for him said i timidly after a silence during which i had hesitated to the politeness of making the remark there's no more to be got where that came from it was the certainty of this fact that impelled me to offer the hint leave any for him who's him said my friend stopping his crunching of pie crust the young man that you spoke of that was hid with you oh ah he returned with something like a gruff laugh him yes yes he don't want no wittles i thought he looked as if he did said i the man stopped eating and regarded me with the keenest scrutiny and the greatest surprise looked when just now where yonder said i pointing over there where i found him nodding asleep and i thought it was you he held me by the collar and stared at me so that i began to think his first idea about cutting my throat had revived dressed like you you know only with a hat i explained trembling and i was very anxious to put this delicately and with 
the same reason for wanting to borrow a file. Didn't you hear the cannon last night? Then there was a firing, he said to himself. I wonder you shouldn't have been sure of that, I returned, for we heard it up at home, and that's farther away, and we were shut in besides. Why, well, see now, said he, when a man's alone on these flats, with a light head and a light stomach, perishing of cold and want, he hears nothing all night but guns firing and voices calling. Here's, he sees the soldiers with their red coats lighted up by the torches carried afore, closing in around him. He hears his number called, he hears himself challenged, he hears the rattle of the muskets, he hears the orders, make ready, present, cover him steady, men, and he's laid hands on, and there's nothing. Why, if I see one pursuing party last night coming up in order, damn em with their tramp, tramp, I see a hundred, and as to firing, why, I see the mist shake with a cannon art, it was broad day. But this man, he had said all the rest as if he had forgotten my being there. Did you notice anything in him? He had a badly bruised face, said I, recalling what I hardly knew I knew. Not here, exclaimed the man, striking his left cheek mercilessly with the flat of his hand. Yes, there. Where is he? He crammed what little food was left into the breast of his grey jacket. Show me the way he went. I'll pull him down, like a bloodhound. Curse this iron on my sore leg. Give us a hold of the file, boy. I indicated in what direction the mist had shrouded the other man, and he looked up at it for an instant but he was down on the rank wet grass, filing at his iron like a madman, and not minding me or minding his own leg, which had an old chafe upon it and was bloody, but which he handled as roughly as if it had been no more feeling in it than the file. I was very much afraid of him again, now that he had worked himself into this fierce hurry, and I was likewise very much afraid of keeping away from home any longer. I told him I must go, but he took no notice, so I thought the best thing I could do was to slip off. The last I saw of him, his head was bent over his knee, and he was working hard at his fetter, muttering impatient imprecations at it and his leg. The last I heard of him, I stopped in the mist to listen, and the file was still going. Chapter 4 I fully expected to find a constable in the kitchen, waiting to take me up. But not only was there no constable there, but no discovery had yet been made of the robbery. Mrs. Joe was prodigiously busy in getting the house ready for the festivities of the day, and Joe had been put upon the kitchen doorstep to keep him out of the dustpan, an article into which his destiny always led him sooner or later, where my sister was vigorously reaping the floors of her establishment. "'Where the deuce have you been?' was Mrs. Joe's Christmas salutation, when I and my conscience showed ourselves. I said I had been down to hear the carols. Ah, well, observed Mrs. Joe. You might have done worse. Not a doubt of that, I thought. Perhaps if I weren't a blacksmith's wife, and, what's the same thing, a slave with her apron never off, I should have been to hear the carols, said Mrs. Joe. I'm rather partial to carols myself, and that's the best reasons for my never hearing any. Joe, who had ventured into the kitchen after me, as the dustbin had retired before us, drew the back of his hand across his nose with a conciliatory air, when Mrs. Joe darted a look at him, and when her eyes were withdrawn, secretly crossed his two fingers and exhibited them to me, as our token that Mrs. Joe was in a cross temper. This was so much her normal state, that Joe and I would often, for weeks together, be as to our fingers like monumental crusaders as to their legs. We were to have a superb dinner, consisting of a leg of pickled pork and greens and a pair of roast stuffed fowls. A handsome mince pie had been made yesterday morning, which accounted for the mincemeat not being missed, and the pudding was already on the boil. These extensive arrangements occasioned us to be cut off unceremoniously in respect of breakfast, for I ain't, said Mrs. Joe, I ain't going to have no formal cramming and busting and washing up now, but with what I've got before me, I promise you. So we had our slices served out, as if we were two thousand troops on a forced march, instead of a man and a boy at home, and we took gulps of milk and water, with apologetic countenances, from a jug on the dresser. In the meantime, Mrs. Joe put clean white curtains up, 
and tacked a new flowered flounce across the wide chimney to replace the old one, and uncovered the little state parlour across the passage, which was never uncovered at any other time, but passed the rest of the year in a cool haze of silver paper, which even extended to the four little white crockery poodles on the mantel-shelf, each with a black nose and a basket of flowers in his mouth, and each the counterpart of the other. Mrs. Joe was a very clean housekeeper, but had an exquisite art of making her cleanliness more uncomfortable and unacceptable than dirt itself. Cleanliness is next to godliness, and some people do the same by their religion. My sister, having so much to do, was going to church vicariously, that is to say, Joe and I were going. In his working clothes, Joe was a well-knit, characteristic-looking blacksmith. In his holiday clothes, he was more like a scarecrow in good circumstances than anything else. Nothing that he wore fitted him or seemed to belong to him, and everything that he wore then grazed him. On the present festive occasion he emerged from his room, when the blithe bells were going, the picture of misery, in a full suit of Sunday penitentials. As to me, I think my sister must have had some general idea that I was a young offender, whom an accoucheur policeman had taken up on my birthday, and delivered over to her to be dealt with according to the outraged majesty of the law. I was always treated as if I had insisted on being born in opposition to the dictates of reason, religion, and morality, and against the dissuading arguments of my best friends. Even when I was taken to have a new suit of clothes, the tailor had orders to make them like a kind of reformatory, and on no account to let me have the free use of my limbs. Joe and I going to church, therefore, must have been a moving spectacle for compassionate minds. Yet what I suffered outside was nothing to what I underwent within. The terrors that had assailed me whenever Mrs. Joe had gone near the pantry, or out of the room, were only to be equalled by the remorse with which my mind dwelt on what my hands had done. Under the weight of my wicked secret, I pondered whether the church would be powerful enough to shield me from the vengeance of the terrible young man, if I divulged to that establishment. I conceived the idea that the time when the bands were read, and when the clergyman said, ye are now to declare it, would be the time for me to rise and propose a private conference in the vestry. I am far from being sure that I might not have astonished our small congregation by resorting to this extreme measure, but for its being Christmas Day and no Sunday. Mr. Wopsle, the clerk at the church, was to dine with us, and Mr. Hubble, the wheelwright, and Mrs. Hubble, and Uncle Pumblechook, Joe's uncle, but Mrs. Joe appropriated him, who was a well-to-do corn chandler in the nearest town, and drove his own chaise cart. The dinner hour was half past one. When Joe and I got home, we found the table laid, and Mrs. Joe dressed, and the dinner dressing, and the front door unlocked, it never was at any other time, for the company to enter by, and everything most splendid, and still not a word of the robbery. The time came without bringing with it any relief to my feelings, and the company came, Mr. Wopsle, united to a Roman nose and a large shining bald forehead, had a deep voice which he was uncommonly proud of. Indeed, it was understood among his acquaintances that if you could only give him his head, he would read the clergyman into fits. He himself confessed that if the church was thrown open, meaning to competition, he would not despair of making his mark in it. The church not being thrown open, he was, as I have said, our clerk, but he punished the amens tremendously, and when he gave out the psalm, always giving the whole verse, he looked all round the congregation first, as much as to say, You have heard my friend overhead, oblige me with your opinion of this style. I opened the door to the company, making believe it was a habit of ours to open that door, and I opened it first to Mr. Wopsle, next to him Mr. and Mrs. Hubble, and last of all to Uncle Pumblechook, N.B. I was not allowed to call him uncle under the severest penalties. Mrs. Joe, said Uncle Pumblechook, a large, hard-breathing, middle-aged, slow man, with a mouth like a fish, dull staring eyes and sandy hair standing upright on his head, so that he looked as if he had just been all but choked and had at that moment come to. 
I have bought you, as the compliments of the season, I have brought you, Mum, a bottle of sherry wine, and I have brought you, Mum, a bottle of port wine. Every Christmas day he presented himself as a profound novelty, with exactly the same words, and carrying, as she now replied, Oh, Uncle Pumblechook, that is kind. Every Christmas day he retorted, as he now retorted, It's no more than your merits, and now you're all bobbish. And how's sixpenn'orth or halfpence? meaning me. We dined on these occasions in the kitchen, and adjourned for the nuts and oranges and apples to the parlour, which was a change very like Joe's change from his working clothes to his Sunday dress. My sister was uncommonly lively on the present occasion, and indeed was generally more gracious in the society of Mrs. Hubble than any other company. I remember Mrs. Hubble as a little curly, sharp-edged person in sky blue, who held a conventionally juvenile position because she had married Mr. Hubble, I don't know at what remote period, when she was much younger than he. I remember Mr. Hubble as a tough, high-shouldered, stooping old man of a sawdusty fragrance, with his legs extraordinarily wide apart, so that in my short days I always saw some miles of open country between them when I met him coming up the lane. Among this good company I should have felt myself, even if I hadn't robbed the pantry, in a false position, not because I was squeezed in at an acute angle of the tablecloth, with the table in my chest and the pumble chooky and elbow in my eye, nor because I was not allowed to speak, I didn't want to speak, nor because I was regaled with the scaly tips of the drumsticks of the fowls and with those obscure corners of pork of which the pig, when living, had the least reason to be vain. No, I should not have minded that, if they would only have left me alone. But they wouldn't leave me alone. They seemed to think the opportunity lost if they failed to point the conversation at me every now and then, and stick the point into me. I might have been an unfortunate little bull in a Spanish arena. I got so smartingly touched up by these moral goads. It began the moment we sat down to dinner, Mr. Wopsle said grace with a theatrical declamation, as it now appears to me something like a religious cross of the ghost in Hamlet with Richard the Third, and ended with a very proper aspiration that we might be truly grateful, upon which my sister fixed me with her eye and said in a low reproachful voice, Do you hear that? Be grateful. Especially, said Mr. Pumblechook, be grateful, boy, to them which brought you up by hand. Mrs. Hubble shook her head, and contemplating me with a mouthful of presentiment that I should come to no good, asked, Why is it that the young are never grateful? This moral mystery seemed too much for the company, until Mr. Hubble tersely solved it by saying, Naturally wish us, and then everybody murmured true, and looked at me in a particularly unpleasant and personal manner. Joe's station and influence was something feebler, if possible, when there was company than when there was none, but he always aided and comforted me when he could, in some way of his own, and he always did so at dinner-time by giving me gravy, if there were any. There being plenty of gravy to-day, Joe spooned it into my plate, at this point about half a pint. A little later on in the dinner, Mr. Wopsall reviewed the sermon with some severity, and intimated in the usual hypothetical case of the church being thrown open, what kind of sermon he would have given them. After favouring them with some heads of that discourse, he remarked that he considered the subject of the day's homily ill-chosen, which was the less excusable, he added, when there were so many subjects going about. True again, said Uncle Pumblechook. You hit it, sir, plenty of subjects going about for them that know how to put salt upon their tails. That's what's wanted. A man needn't go too far to find a subject if he's ready with his salt box, Mr. Pumblechook added, after a short interval of reflection. Look at pork alone. There's a subject. If you want a subject, look at pork. True, sir. Many a moral for the young, returned Mr. Wopsle, and I knew that he was going to lug me in before he said it. Might be deduced from that text. You listen to this, said my sister to me in a severe parenthesis. Joe gave me some more gravy. Swine, 
pursued Mr. Wopsle in his deepest voice, and pointing his fork at my blushes, as if he were mentioning my Christian name, swine were the companions of the prodigal. The gluttony of swine is put before us as an example to the young. I thought this pretty well in him who had been praising up the pork for being so plump and juicy. What is detestable in a pig is more detestable in a boy. Or a girl, suggested Mr. Hubble. Of course, or a girl, Mr. Hubble, assented Mr. Wopsle rather irritably. But there is no girl present. Besides, said Mr. Pumblechook, turning sharp on me, think what you've got to be grateful for. If you'd been born a squeaker, he was, if ever a child was, said my sister most emphatically. Joe gave me some more gravy. Well, but I mean a four-footed squeaker, said Mr. Pumblechook. If you had been born such, would you have been here now, not you? Unless in that form, said Mr. Wopsle, nodding towards the dish. But I don't mean in that form, sir, returned Mr. Pumblechook, who had an objection to being interrupted. I mean enjoying himself with his elders and betters, and improving himself with their conversation, and rolling in the lap of luxury. Would he have been doing that? No, he wouldn't. And what would have been your destination? Turning on me again. You would have been disposed of for so many shillings according to the market price of the article, and Dunstable the butcher would have come up to you as you lay in your straw, and he would have whipped you under his left arm, and with his right he would have tucked you up his frock to get a penknife from out of his waistcoat pocket, and he would have shed your blood and had your life. No bringing up by hand then, not a bit of it. Joe offered me more gravy, which I was afraid to take. He was a world of trouble to you, ma'am, said Mrs. Hubble, commiserating my sister. Trouble, echoed my sister, trouble, and then entered on a fearful catalogue of all the illnesses I had been guilty of, and all the acts of sleeplessness I had committed, and all the high places I had tumbled from, and all the low places I had tumbled into, and all the injuries I had done myself, and all the times she had wished me in my grave, and I had contumaciously refused to go there. I think the Romans must have aggravated one another very much with their noses. Perhaps they became the restless people they were in consequence. Anyhow, Mr. Wopsle's Roman nose so aggravated me during the recital of my misdemeanours, that I should have liked to pull it until he howled. But all I had endured up to this time was nothing in comparison with the awful feelings that took possession of me when the pause was broken which ensued upon my sister's recital, and which pause everybody looked at me, as I felt painfully conscious, with indignation and abhorrence. Yes, said Mr. Pumblechook, leading the company gently back to the theme from which they had strayed. Pork! regarded as boiled, is rich too, ain't it? Have a little brandy, uncle, said my sister. Oh, heavens, it had come at last. He would find it was weak. He would say it was weak, and I was lost. I held tight to the leg of the table under the cloth with both hands, and awaited my fate. My sister went for the stone bottle, came back with the stone bottle, and poured his brandy out, no one else taking any. The wretched man trifled with his glass, took it up, looked at it through the light, put it down, prolonged my misery. All this time Mrs. Joe and Joe were briskly clearing the table for the pie and pudding. I couldn't keep my eyes off him, always holding tight by the leg of the table with my hands and feet. I saw the miserable creature finger his glass playfully, take it up, smile, throw his head back and drink the brandy off. Instantly afterwards the company was seized with an unspeakable consternation owing to his springing to his feet, turning round several times in an appalling spasmodic whooping cough dance, and rushing out at the door. He then became visible through the window, violently plunging and expectorating, making the most hideous faces, and apparently out of his mind. I held on tight, while Mrs. Joe and Joe ran to him. I don't know how I had done it, but I had no doubt I had murdered him somehow. In my dreadful situation it was a relief when he was brought back, and surveying the company all round as if they had disagreed with him, 
sank down into his chair with the one significant gasp. Ta! I had filled up the bottle from the tar water jug. I knew he would be worse by and by, and I moved the table, like a medium of the present day, by the vigour of my unseen hold upon it. Tar! cried my sister in amazement. Why, however, could tar come there? But Uncle Pumblechook, who was omnipotent in that kitchen, wouldn't hear the word, wouldn't hear of the subject, imperiously waved it all away with his hand, and asked for hot gin and water. My sister, who had begun to be alarmingly meditative, had to employ herself actively in getting the gin and hot water, the sugar and the lemon peel, and mixing them. For the time being at least I was saved. I still held on to the leg of the table, but clutched it now with the fervour of gratitude. By degrees I became calm enough to release my grasp and partake of pudding. Mr. Pumblechook partook of pudding. All partook of pudding. The course terminated, and Mr. Pumblechook had begun to beam under the genial influence of gin and water. I began to think I should get over the day when my sister said to Joe, Clean plates, cold. I clutched the leg of the table again immediately, and pressed it to my bosom as if it had been the companion of my youth and friend of my soul. I foresaw what was coming, and I felt that this time I really was gone. You must taste, said my sister, addressing the guests with her best grace, you must taste, to finish with, such a delightful and delicious present of Uncle Pumblechook's. Must they let them not hope to taste it? You must know, said my sister, rising, it is a pie, a savoury pork pie. The company murmured their compliments. Uncle Pumblechook, sensible of having deserved well of his fellow creatures, said, quite vivaciously, all things considered, Well, Mrs. Joe, we'll do our best endeavours. Let us have a cut at this same pie. My sister went out to get it. I heard her steps proceed to the pantry. I saw Mr. Pumblechook balance his knife. I saw reawakening appetite in the Roman nostrils of Mr. Wopsle. I heard Mr. Hubble remark, Bit of savoury pork pie would lay atop of anything you could mention, and do no harm. And I heard Joe say, You shall have some, Pip. I have never been absolutely certain whether I uttered a shrill yell of terror, merely in spirit, or in the bodily hearing of the company. I felt that I could bear no more, and that I must run away. I released the leg of the table and ran for my life, but I ran no farther than the house door, for there I ran head foremost into a party of soldiers with their muskets, one of whom held out a pair of handcuffs to me, saying, Here you are, look sharp, come on. Chapter 5 The apparition of a file of soldiers ringing down the butt-ends of their loaded muskets on our doorstep caused the dinner-party to rise from the table in confusion, and caused Mrs. Joe, re-entering the kitchen empty-handed, to stop short and stare in her wondering lament of, "'Gracious goodness, gracious me, what's gone with the pie?' The sergeant and I were in the kitchen, where Mrs. Joe stood staring, at which crisis partially recovered the use of my senses. It was the sergeant who had spoken to me, and he was now looking round at the company with his handcuffs invitingly extended towards them in his right hand and his left on my shoulder. "'Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen,' said the sergeant, "'but as I have mentioned at the door to this smart young shaver, which he hadn't, "'I want a chase in the name of the king, and I want the blacksmith. "'And pray what what you want with him,' retorted my sister, "'quick to resent his being wanted at all.' "'Mrs.' returned the gallant sergeant. "'Speaking for myself, I should reply, "'the honour and pleasure of his fine wife's acquaintance. "'Speaking for the king, I answer, a little job done.' "'This was received as rather neat in the sergeant, "'insomuch that Mr. Pumblechook cried audibly, "'Good again!' "'You see, blacksmith,' said the sergeant, "'who had by this time picked out Joe with his eye, "'we've had an accident with these, "'and I find the lock on one of them goes wrong, "'and the coupling don't act pretty.' As they are wanted for immediate service, will you throw your eye over them? Joe threw his eye over them, and pronounced that the job would necessitate the lighting of his forge fire, and would take nearer two hours than one. Will it? Then you will set about it at once, blacksmith, 
said the off-hand sergeant, as it's on his majesty's service, and if my men can bear a hand anywhere, they'll make themselves useful. With that he called his men, who came trooping into the kitchen one after another, and piled their arms in a corner. And then they stood about, as soldiers do now, with their hands loosely clasped before them, now resting a knee or a shoulder, now easing a belt or a pouch, now opening the door to spit stiffly over their high stocks out into the yard. All these things I saw without then knowing that I saw them, for I was in an agony of apprehension, but beginning to perceive that the handcuffs were not for me, and that the military had so far got the better of the pie as to put it in the background. I collected a little more of my scattered wits. "'Would you give me the time?' said the sergeant, addressing himself to Mr. Pumblechook, as to a man whose appreciative powers justified the inference that he was equal to the time. "'It's just gone half past two. That's not so bad,' said the sergeant, reflecting. "'Even if I was forced to halt here nigh two hours, that'll do. How far might you call yourselves from the marshes hereabouts? Not above a mile, I reckon?' "'Just a mile,' said Mrs. Joe. "'That'll do. We begin to close upon em about dusk, a little before dusk, my orders are. That'll do.' "'Convicts, sergeant?' asked Mr. Wopsle, in a matter-of-course way. "'Aye,' returned the sergeant. Two. They're pretty well known to be out on the marshes still, and they won't try to get clear of them before dusk. Anybody here seen anything of such game?' "'Everybody, myself, excepted, said no, with confidence. Nobody thought of me.' "'Well,' said the sergeant, "'they'll find themselves trapped in a circle, I expect, sooner than they count on. Now, blacksmith, if you're ready, His Majesty the King is.' Joe had got his coat and waistcoat and cravat off, and his leather apron on, and passed into the forge. One of the soldiers opened its wooden windows, another lighted the fire, another turned to at the bellows, the rest stood around the blaze, which was soon roaring. Then Joe began to hammer and clink, hammer and clink, and we all looked on. The interest of the impending pursuit not only absorbed the general attention, but even made my sister liberal. She drew a pitcher of beer from the cask for the soldiers, and invited the sergeant to take a glass of brandy. But Mr. Pumblechook said sharply, "'Give him wine, Mum. I'll engage there's no tar in that.' So the sergeant thanked him, and said that as he preferred his drink without tar, he would take wine, if it was equally convenient. When it was given to him, he drank His Majesty's health and compliments of the season, and took it all at a mouthful and smacked his lips. "'Good stuff, eh, sergeant?' said Mr. Pumblechook. "'I'll tell you something,' returned the sergeant. "'I suspect that stuff's of your providing.' Mr. Pumblechook, with a fat sort of laugh, said, "'Aye, aye, why?' "'Because,' returned the sergeant, clapping him on the shoulder, "'you're a man that knows what's what.' "'Do you think so?' said Mr. Pumblechook, with his former laugh. "'Have another glass.' "'With you, hob and knob,' returned the sergeant. "'The top of mine to the foot of yours, "'a foot of yours to the top of mine.' Ring once, ring twice, the best tune on the musical glasses, your health. May you live a thousand years and never be a worse judge of the right sort than you are at this present moment of your life. The sergeant tossed off his glass again and seemed quite ready for another glass. I noticed that Mr. Pumblechook, in his hospitality, appeared to forget that he had made a present of the wine, but took the bottle from Mrs. Joe and had all the credit of handing it about in a gush of joviality. Even I got some and he was so very free of the wine that he even called for the other bottle, and handed that about with the same liberality when the first was gone. As I watched them, while they stood all clustering about the forge, enjoying themselves so much, I thought what a terrible good source for a dinner my fugitive friend on the marshes was. They had not enjoyed themselves a quarter so much before the entertainment was brightened with the excitement he furnished, and now, when they were all in lively anticipation of the two villains being taken, and when the bellow seemed to roar for the fugitives, the fire to flare for them, the smoke to hurry away in pursuit of them, Joe to hammer and clink for them, and all the murky shadows on the wall to shake at them in menace as the blaze rose and sank, and the red-hot sparks dropped and died. The pale afternoon outside almost seemed in my pitying young fancy to have turned pale on their account, poor wretches. At last Joe's job was done, and the ringing and roaring stopped. As Joe got on his coat, he mustered courage to propose that some of us should go down with the soldiers and see what came of the hunt. Mr. Pumblechook and Mr. Hubble declined, on the plea of a pipe and lady's society, 
but Mr. Wopsle said he would go if Joe would. Joe said he was agreeable and would take me, if Mrs. Joe approved. We never should have got leave to go, I am sure, but for Mrs. Joe's curiosity to know all about it and how it ended. As it was, she merely stipulated, If you bring the boy back with his head blown to bits by a musket, don't look to me to put it together again. The sergeant took a polite leave of the ladies and parted from Mr. Pumblechook as from a comrade, though I doubt if you are quite as fully sensible of that gentleman's merits under arid conditions as when something moist was going. His men resumed their muskets and fell in. Mr. Wopsle, Joe and I received strict charge to keep in the rear and to speak no word after we reached the marshes. When we were all out in the raw air and were steadily moving towards our business, I treasonably whispered to Joe, I hope, Joe, we shan't find them. And Joe whispered to me, I'd give a shilling if they'd cut and run, Pip. We were joined by no stragglers from the village, for the weather was cold and threatening, the way dreary, the footing bad, darkness coming on, and the people had good fires indoors and were keeping the day. A few faces hurried to glowing windows and looked after us, but none came out. We passed the finger post and held straight on to the churchyard. There we were stopped a few minutes by a signal from the sergeant's hand, while two or three of his men dispersed themselves among the graves and also examined the porch. They came in again without finding anything, and then we struck out on the open marshes. Through the gate at the side of the churchyard, a bitter sleet came rattling against us here on the east wind, and Joe took me on his back. Now that we were out upon the dismal wilderness, where they little thought I had been within eight or nine hours, and had seen both men hiding, I considered for the first time, with great dread, if we should come upon them, would my particular convict suppose that it was I who had brought the soldiers there? He had asked me if I was a deceiving imp, and he had said I should be a fierce young hound if I joined the hunt against him. Would he believe that I was both imp and hound in treacherous earnest, and had betrayed him? It was of no use asking myself this question now. There I was on Joe's back, and there was Joe beneath me, charging at the ditches like a hunter, and stimulating Mr. Wopsle not to tumble on his Roman nose, and to keep up with us. The soldiers were in front of us, extending into a pretty wide line with an interval between man and man. We were taking the course I had begun with, and from which I diverged in the mist. Either the mist was not out again yet, or the wind had dispelled it. Under the low red glare of sunset, the beacon and the gibbet and the mound of the battery and the opposite shore of the river were plain, though all of a watery lead colour. With my heart thumping like a blacksmith at Joe's broad shoulder, I looked all about for any sign of the convicts. I could see none. I could hear none. Mr. Wopsle had greatly alarmed me more than once by his blowing and hard breathing, but I knew the sounds by this time, and I could disassociate them from the object of pursuit. I got a dreadful start when I thought I heard the file still going, but it was only a sheep bell. The sheep stopped in their eating and looked timidly at us, and the cattle, and their heads turned up from the wind and sleet, stared angrily, as if they held us responsible for both annoyances. But except these things, and the shudder of the dying day in every blade of grass, there was no break in the bleak stillness of the marshes. The soldiers were moving on in the direction of the old battery, and we were moving on a little way behind them, when all of a sudden we all stopped, for there had reached us on the wings of the wind and rain a long shout. It was repeated. It was at a distance towards the east, but it was long and loud. Nay, there seemed to be two or more shouts raised together, if one might judge for the confusion in the sound. To this effect the sergeant and the nearest men were speaking under their breath when Joe and I came up. After another moment's listening, Joe, who was a good judge, agreed, and Mr. Wopsle, who was a bad judge, agreed. The sergeant, a decisive man, ordered that the sound should not be answered, but that the course should be changed and that his men should make towards it at the double. So we slanted to the right, where the east was, and Joe pounded away so wonderfully that I had to hold on tight to keep my seat. 
It was a run indeed now, and what Joe called it, in the only two words he spoke all the time, a winder. Down banks, up banks, and over gates, splashing into dikes, breaking among coarse rushes, no man cared where he went. As we came nearer to the shouting, it became more and more apparent that it was made by more than one voice. Sometimes it seemed to stop altogether, and then the soldiers stopped. When it broke out again, the soldiers made for it at a greater rate than ever, and we after them. After a while we had so run it down that we could hear one voice calling, Murder! And another voice, Convicts! Runaways! Guard! This way for the runaway convicts! Then both voices would seem to be stifled in a struggle, and then would break out again. And when it had come to this, the soldiers ran like deer, and Joe too. The sergeant ran in first when we had run the noise quite down, and two of his men ran in close upon him. Their pieces were cocked and levelled when we all ran in. "'Here are both men,' panted the sergeant, struggling at the bottom of a ditch. "'Surrender you two and confound you two for wild beasts. Come asunder!' Water was splashing and mud was flying and oaths were being sworn and blows were being struck when some more men went down into the ditch to help the sergeant and dragged out separately my convict and the other one. Both were bleeding and panting and excrating and struggling, but of course I knew them both directly. Mind, said my convict, wiping blood from his face with his ragged sleeves and shaking torn hair from his fingers. I took him. I gave him up to you. Mind that. It's not much to be particular about, said the sergeant. It'll do you small good, my man, being of the same plight yourself. Handcuffs there. I don't expect it to do me any good. I don't want it to do me more good than it does now, said my convict with a greedy laugh. I took him. He knows it. That's enough for me. The other convict was livid to look at, and in addition to the old bruised left side of his face, seemed to be bruised and torn all over. He could not so much as get his breath to speak until they were both separately handcuffed, but leaned upon a soldier to keep himself from falling. Take notice, guard. He tried to murder me, were his first words. Tried to murder him, said my convict disdainfully. Try and not do it. I took him, and I'll give him up. That's what I've done. I not only prevented him getting off the marshes, but I dragged him here. Dragged him this far on his way back. He's a gentleman, if you please, this villain. Now the hulks has got his gentleman again through me. Murder him? Worth my while, too, to murder him, when I could do worse and drag him back. The other one still gasped. He tried, he tried to murder me. Bear, bear witness. Look a year, said my convict to the sergeant. Single-handed I got clear of the prison ship. I made a dash and I done it. I could have got clear of these deaf cold flats likewise. Look at my leg. You won't find much iron on it. If I hadn't made the discovery that he was here, let him go free. Let him profit by the means as I found out. Let him make a tool of me afresh and again. Once more, no, no, no. If I had died at the bottom there, and he made an emphatic swing at the ditch with his manacled hands, I'd have held to him with that grip that you should have seen safe to find him in my hold. The other fugitive, who was evidently in extreme horror of his companion, repeated, He tried to murder me. I should have been a dead man if you had not come up. He lies, said my convict with fierce energy. He's a liar, born, and he'll die a liar. Look at his face. Ain't it written there? Let him turn loose those eyes of his on me. I defy him to do it. The other, with an effort at a scornful smile, which could not, however, collect the nervous working of his mouth into any set expression, looked at the soldiers and looked about at the marshes and at the sky, but certainly did not look at the speaker. Do you see him? pursued my convict. Do you see what a villain he is? Do you see those grovelling and wandering eyes? That's how he looked when we were tried together. He never looked at me. The other, always working and working his dry lips and turning his eyes restlessly about him far and near, did at last turn them for a moment on the speaker with the words, You are not much to look at, and with a half-taunting glance at the bound hands. At that point, my convict became so frantically exasperated that he would have rushed upon him, but for the interposition of the soldiers. Didn't I tell you, said the other convict then, that he would murder me if he could? And any one could see that he shook with fear, and that there broke out upon his lips curious white flakes like thin snow. 
"'Enough of this parley,' said the sergeant. "'Light those torches.' As one of the soldiers, who carried a basket in lieu of a gun, went down on his knee to open it, my convict looked round him for the first time and saw me. I had alighted from Joe's back on the brink of the ditch when we came up, and had not moved since. I looked at him eagerly when he looked at me, and slightly moved my hands and shook my head. I had been waiting for him to see me that I might try to assure him of my innocence. It was not at all expressed to me that he even comprehended my intention for he gave me a look that I did not understand, and it all passed in a moment. But if he had looked at me for an hour or for a day, I could not have remembered his face ever afterwards as having been more attentive. The soldier with the basket soon got a light and lighted three or four torches and took one himself and distributed the others. It had been almost dark before, but now it seemed quite dark, and soon afterwards very dark. Before we departed from that spot, four soldiers standing in a ring fired twice into the air. Presently we saw other torches kindled at some distance behind us, and others on the marshes on the opposite bank of the river. All right, said the sergeant, march. We had not gone far when three cannon were fired ahead of us with a sound that seemed to burst something in my ear. You are expected on board, said the sergeant to my convict. They know you are coming. Don't straggle, my man. Close up here. The two were kept apart, and each walked surrounded by a separate guard. I had hold of Joe's hand now, and Joe carried one of the torches. Mr. Wopsle had been for going back, but Joe was resolved to see it out, so we went on with the party. It was a reasonably good path now, mostly on the edge of the river, with a divergence here and there where a dike came, with a miniature windmill on it and a muddy sluice gate. When I looked round I could see the other lights coming in after us. The torches we carried dropped great blotches of fire upon the track, and I could see those two lying smoking and flaring. I could see nothing else but black darkness. Our lights warmed the air about us with their pitchy blaze, and the two prisoners seemed rather to like that, as they limped along in the midst of the muskets. We could not go fast because of their lameness, and they were so spent that two or three times we had to halt while they rested. After an hour or so of this travelling, we came to a rough wooden hut and a landing place. There was a guard in the hut, and they challenged, and the sergeant answered. Then we went into the hut, where there was a smell of tobacco and whitewash, and a bright fire, and a lamp, and a stand of muskets, and a drum, and a low wooden bedstead, like an overgrown mangle without the machinery, capable of holding about a dozen soldiers all at once. Three or four soldiers who lay upon it in their greatcoats were not much interested in us, but just lifted their heads and took a sleepy stare and then lay down again. The sergeant made some kind of report and some entry in a book, and then the convict, whom I call the other convict, was drafted off with his guard to go on board first. My convict never looked at me, except that once. While we stood in the hut, he stood before the fire looking thoughtfully at it, or putting up his feet by turns upon the hob, and looking thoughtfully at them as if he pitied them for their recent adventures. Suddenly he turned to the sergeant and remarked, I wish to say something respecting this escape. It may prevent some persons laying under suspicion along of me. You can say what you like, returned the sergeant, standing coolly looking at him with his arms folded. But you have no call to say it here. You'll have opportunity enough to say about it and hear about it before it's done with, you know. I know, but this is another point, a separate matter. A man can't starve, at least I can't. I took some whittles up at the village over yonder, where the church stands almost out on the marshes. You mean stole, said the sergeant. And I'll tell you where from, from the blacksmiths. Halloa, said the sergeant, staring at Joe. Halloa, Pip, said Joe, staring at me. It was some broken whittles, that's what it was, and a dram of liquor and a pie. Have you happened to miss such an article as a pie, blacksmith? asked the sergeant, confidentially. My wife did at the very moment when you came in. Don't you know, Pip? So, said my convict, turning his eyes on Joe in a moody manner, and without the least glance at me. So you're the blacksmith, are you? Then I'm sorry to say I've eat your pie. God knows you're welcome to it, so far as it was ever mine, returned Joe with a saving remembrance of Mrs. Joe. 
we don't know what you have done but we wouldn't have you starved to death for it poor miserable fellow critter would us pip then something i had noticed before clicked in the man's throat again and he turned his back the boat had returned and his guard were ready so we followed him to the landing place made of rough stakes and stones and saw him put into the boat which was rowed by a crew of convicts like himself no one seemed surprised to see him or interested in seeing him or glad to see him or sorry to see him or spoke a word except that somebody in the boat growled as if to dogs give way you which was the signal for the dip of the oars by the light of the torches we saw the black hulk lying out a little way from the mud of the shore like a wicked noah's ark cribbed and barred and moored by massive rusty chains the prison ship seemed to my young eyes to be ironed like the prisoners we saw the boat go alongside and we saw him taken up the side and disappear then the ends of the torches were flung hissing into the water and went out as if it were all over with him chapter six my state of mind regarding the pilfering from which i had been so unexpectedly exonerated did not impel me to frank disclosure but i hope it had some dregs of good at the bottom of it i do not recall that i felt any tenderness of conscience in reference to mrs joe when the fear of being found out was lifted off me but i loved joe perhaps for no better reason in those early days than because the dear fellow let me love him and as to him my inner self was not so easily composed it was much upon my mind particularly when i first saw him looking about for his file that i ought to tell joe the whole truth yet i did not and for the reason that i mistrusted that if i did he would think me worse than i was the fear of losing joe's confidence and of thenceforth sitting in the chimney corner at night staring drearily at my forever lost companion and friend tied up my tongue i morbidly represented to myself that if joe knew it i never afterwards could see him glance however casually at yesterday's meat or pudding when it came on today's table without thinking that he was debating whether i had been in the pantry that if joe knew it and at any subsequent period of our joint domestic life remarked that his beer was flat or thick, the conviction that he suspected tar in it would bring a rush of blood to my face. In a word, I was too cowardly to do what I knew to be right, as I had been too cowardly to avoid doing what I knew to be wrong. I had had no intercourse with the world at that time, and I imitated none of its many inhabitants who act in this manner. Quite an untaught genius, I made the discovery of the line of action for myself. As I was sleepy before we were far away from the prison ship, Joe took me on his back again and carried me home. He must have had a tiresome journey of it, for Mr. Wopsle, being knocked up, was in such a very bad temper that if the church had been thrown open, he would probably have excommunicated the whole expedition, beginning with Joe and myself. In his lay capacity, he persisted in sitting down in the damp to such an insane extent that when his coat was taken off to be dried at the kitchen fire, the circumstantial evidence on his trousers would have hanged him if it had been a capital offence. By that time I was staggering on the kitchen floor like a little drunkard, through having been newly set upon my feet, and through having been fast asleep, and through waking in the heat and lights and noise of tongues. As I came to myself, with the aid of a heavy thump between the shoulders and the restorative exclamation "Ya, was there ever such a boy as this from my sister i found joe telling them about the convict's confession and all the visitors suggesting different ways by which he had got into the pantry mr pumblechook made out after carefully surveying the premises that he had first got upon the roof of the forge and had then got upon the roof of the house and had then let himself down the kitchen chimney by a rope made of his bedding cut into strips and as mr pumblechook was very positive and drove his own chase cart over everybody it was agreed that it must be so mr wopsle indeed wildly cried out no with a feeble malice of a tired man but as he had had no theory and no coat on he was unanimously set at naught not to mention his smoking hard behind as he stood with his back to the kitchen fire to draw the damp out, which was not calculated to inspire confidence. 
This was all I heard that night before my sister clutched me as a slumberous offence to the company's eyesight, and assisted me up to bed, with such a strong hand that I seemed to have fifty boots on, and to be dangling them all against the edges of the stairs. My state of mind, as I have described it, began before I was up in the morning, and lasted long after the subject had died out, and had ceased to be mentioned, saving on exceptional occasions. Chapter 7 At the time, when I stood in the churchyard reading the family tombstones, I had just enough learning to be able to spell them out. My construction, even of their simple meaning, was not very correct, for I read Wife of the Above as a complimentary reference to my father's exaltation to a better world. And if any one of my deceased relations had been referred to as below, I have no doubt I should have formed the worst opinions of that member of the family. Neither were my notions of the theological positions to which my catechism bound me at all accurate, for I have a lively remembrance that I suppose my declaration was to walk in the same all the days of my life, laid me under an obligation always to go through the village from our house in one particular direction, and never to vary it by turning down by the wheelwrights or up by the mill. When I was old enough, I was to be apprenticed to Joe, and until I could assume that dignity, I was not to be what Mrs. Joe called Pompeyed, or as I render it, pampered. Therefore, I was not only odd boy about the forge, but if any neighbour happened to want an extra boy to frighten birds, or pick up stones, or do any such job, I was favoured with the employment. In order, however, that our superior position might not be compromised thereby, a money-box was kept on the kitchen mantel-shelf, into which it was publicly made known that all my earnings were dropped. I have an impression that they were to be contributed eventually towards the liquidation of the national debt, but I know I had no hope of any personal participation in the treasure. Mr. Wopsle's great-aunt kept an evening school in the village. That is to say, she was a ridiculous old woman, of limited means and unlimited infirmity, who used to go to sleep from six to seven every evening, in the society of youth who paid two pence per week each, for the improving opportunity of seeing her do it. She rented a small cottage, and Mr. Wopsle had the room upstairs, where we students used to overhear him reading aloud in a most dignified and terrific manner, and occasionally bumping on the ceiling. There was a fiction that Mr. Wopsle examined the scholars once a quarter. What he did on those occasions was to turn up his cuffs, stick up his hair, and give us a Mark Antony's oration over the body of Caesar, that was always followed by Collins' Ode on the Passions, wherein I particularly venerated Mr. Wopsle as revenge, throwing his blood-stained sword in thunder down, and taking the war denouncing trumpet with a withering look. It was not with me then, as it was in later life, when I fell into the society of the passions, and compared them with Collins and Wopsle, rather to the disadvantage of both gentlemen. Mr. Wopsle's great-aunt, besides keeping this educational institution, kept in the same room a little general shop. She had no idea what stock she had, or what the price of anything in it was, but there was a little greasy memorandum book kept in a drawer, which served as a catalogue of prices and by this oracle Biddy arranged all the shop transaction. Biddy was Mr. Wopsle's great-aunt's granddaughter. I confess myself quite unequal to the working out of the problem, what relation she was to Mr. Wopsle. She was an orphan like myself, like me too, had been brought up by hand. She was most noticeable, I thought, in respect of her extremities, for her hair was always wanted brushing, her hands always wanted washing, and her shoes always wanted mending and pulling up at heel. This description must be received with a weekday limitation. On Sundays she went to church elaborated. Much of my unassisted self, and more by the help of Biddy than of Mr. Wopsle's great aunt, I struggled through the alphabet as if it had been a bramble bush, getting considerably worried and scratched by every letter. After that I fell amongst those thieves, the nine figures who seemed every evening to do something new to disguise themselves and baffle recognition. But at last I began, in a pure blind groping way, to read, write and cipher on the very smallest scale. One night I was sitting in the chimney corner with my slate, expending great efforts on the production of a letter to Joe. 
I think it must have been a full year after our hunt upon the marshes, for it was a long time after, and it was winter and a hard frost. With an alphabet on the hearth at my feet for reference, I contrived in an hour or two to print and smear this epistle. My dear Joe, I hope you can write well. I hope I shall soon be able for to teach you, Joe, and then we shall be so glad, and when I'm prenticed to you, Joe, what larks bleed me in, in XN pip. There was no indispensable necessity for my communicating with Joe by letter, inasmuch as he sat beside me and we were alone. But I delivered this written communication, slate and all, with my own hand, and Joe received it as a miracle of erudition. I say, Pip, old chap, cried Joe, opening his blue eyes wide. What a scholar you are, aren't you? I should like to be, said I, glancing at the slate as he held it, with a misgiving that the writing was rather hilly. Why, here's a J, said Joe, and an O, equal to anything. Here's a J and an O, Pip, and a J-O, Joe. I had never heard Joe read aloud to any greater extent than this monosyllable, and I observed at church last Sunday, when I accidentally held our prayer book upside down, that it seemed to suit his convenience quite as well as if it had been all right. Wishing to embrace the present occasion of finding out whether in teaching Joe, I should have to begin quite at the beginning, I said, Ah, but read the rest, Joe. The rest, eh, Pip? said Joe, looking at it with a slow, searching eye. One, two, three, why, here's three J's and three O's, and there's three J-O's, Joe's, in it, Pip. I leaned over Joe, and with the aid of my forefinger read him the whole letter. Astonishing, said Joe, when I had finished. You are a scholar. How do you spell Gargery, Joe? I asked him, with a modest patronage. I don't spell it at all, said Joe. But supposing you did? It can't be supposed, said Joe, though I'm uncommon fond of reading, too. Are you, Joe? Oncommon. Give me, said Joe, a good book or a good newspaper, and sit me down afore a good fire, and I ask no better. Lord, he continued, after rubbing his knee a little, when you do come to a J and an O, says you, here at last is a J and an O, Joe. How interesting reading is. I derived from this that Joe's education, like steam, was yet in its infancy. Pursuing the subject, I inquired, Didn't you ever go to school, Joe, when you were as little as me? No, Pip. Why didn't you ever go to school, Joe, when you were as little as me? Well, Pip, said Joe, taking up the poker and settling himself to his usual occupation when he was thoughtful, of slowly raking the fire between the lower bars. I'll tell you my father, Pip, he were given to drink, and when he were overtook with drink, he hammered away at my mother most unmerciful, if it were a most the only hammering he did, indeed, excepting at myself, and if he hammered at me with a wigger only to be equalled by the wigger which he didn't hammer at his anvil. You're a listening and understanding, Pip? Yes, Joe. Consequence, my mother and me, we ran away from my father several times. And then my mother, she'd go out to work, and she'd say, Joe, she'd say, now please God, you shall have some schooling, child, and she'd put me to school. But my father were that good in his heart that he couldn't abear to be without us, so he'd come with a most tremendous crowd and make such a row at the doors of the houses where we was that they used to be obligated to have no more to do with us and to give us up to him. And then he took us home and hammered us, which you see, Pip, said Joe, pausing in his meditative raking of the fire, and looking at me, were a drawback on my learning. Certainly, poor Joe. Though mind you, Pip, said Joe, with a judicial touch or two of the poker on the top bar, rendering unto all their due, and maintaining equal justice betwixt man and man, my father were that good in his heart, don't you see? I didn't see, but I didn't say so. Well, Joe pursued, Somebody must keep the pot a-biling. Pip, or the pot won't boil, don't you know? I saw that and said so. Consequence, my father didn't make objections to my going to work, so I went to work at my present calling, which were his too. 
if he would have followed it, and I worked tolerable hard, I assure you, Pip. In time I were able to keep him, and I kept him till he went off in a purpleptic fit, and it were my intentions to have had put upon his tombstone that, whatsoever of the failings on his part, remember, reader, he were that good in his heart. Joe recited this couplet with such manifest pride and careful perspicuity that I asked him if he had made it himself. I made it, said Joe, my own self. I made it in a moment. It was like striking out a horseshoe complete in a single blow. I never was so much surprised in all my life. I couldn't credit my own. To tell you the truth, hardly believed it were my own. As I was saying, Pip, it were my intentions to have it cut over him. But poetry costs money. Cut it how you will, small or large, and it were not done. Not to mention bearers, all the money that could be spared were wanted for my mother. She were in poor health and quite broke. She weren't long a following, poor soul, and her share of peace come round at last. Joe's blue eyes turned a little watery. He rubbed first one of them, and then the other, in a most uncongenial and uncomfortable manner, with a round knob on the top of the poker. "'It were but lonesome, then,' said Joe, "'living here alone, and I got acquainted with your sister. "'Now, Pip,' Joe looked firmly at me, "'as if he knew I was not going to agree with him. "'Your sister is a fine figure of a woman.' "'I could not help looking at the fire, "'in an obvious state of doubt. "'Whatever family opinions, "'or whatever the world's opinions on that subject may be, "'Pip, your sister is.' "'Joe tapped the top bar with a poker "'after every word following, a fine figure of a woman. I could think of nothing better to say than, I am glad you think so, Joe. So am I, returned Joe, catching me up. I am glad I think so, Pip. A little redness or a little matter of bone, here or there, what does it signify to me? I sagaciously observed, if it didn't signify to him, to whom did it signify? Certainly, assented Joe. That's it, you're right, old chap. When I got acquainted with your sister, it was the talk of how she was bringing you up by hand. Very kind of her, too. All the folks said, and I said, along with all the folks, as to you, Joe pursued with a countenance expressive of seeing something very nasty indeed, if you could have been aware of how small and flabby and mean you was, dear me, you'd have had formed the most contemptible opinion of yourself. Not exactly relishing this, I said. Never mind me, Joe. But I did mind you, Pip, he returned with tender simplicity. When I offered to your sister to keep company, and to be asked in church at such times as she were willing and ready to come to the forge, I said to her, And bring the poor little child. God bless the poor little child, I said to your sister. There's room for him at the forge. I broke out crying and begging pardon, and hugged Joe round the neck, who dropped the poker to hug me, and to say, Ever the best of friends, and us, Pip. Don't cry, old chap. When this little interruption was over, Joe resumed. Will you see, Pip, and here we are. That's about where it lights. Here we are. Now, when you take me in hand in my learning, Pip, and I'll tell you beforehand I'm awful dull, most awful dull. Mrs. Joe mustn't see too much of what we're up to. It must be done, as I may say, on the sly. And why on the sly? I'll tell you why, Pip. He had taken up the poker again, without which I doubt if he could have proceeded in his demonstration. Your sister is given to government. Given to government, Joe? I was startled, for I had some shadowy idea, and I'm afraid I must add hope, that Joe had divorced her in favour of the Lords of the Admiralty or Treasury. Given to government, said Joe, which I mean to say the government of you and myself. Oh, and she ain't over partial to having scholars on the premises, Joe continued, and in particular would not be over partial to my being a scholar, for fear as I might rise like a sort of rebel, don't you see? I was going to retort with an inquiry, and had got as far as why, when Joe stopped me. Stay a bit. I know what you're going to say, Pip. Stay a bit. I don't deny that your sister comes a mogul over us now and again. I don't deny that she do throw us backfalls, and she do drop down upon us heavy. At such times when your sister is on the rampage, Pip, Joe sank his voice to a whisper and glanced at the door. Candor compels for to admit that she is a buster. Joe pronounced this word as if it began with at least twelve capital B's. Why don't I rise? 
That was your observation when I broke it off, Pip? Yes, Joe. Well, said Joe, passing the poker into his left hand that he might feel his whisker, and I had no hope of him whenever he took to that placid occupation. Your sister's a mastermind, a mastermind. What's that, I asked, in some strange hope of bringing him to a stand. But Joe was readier with his definition than I had expected, and completely stopped me by arguing circularly, and answering with a fixed look, Her, and I ain't a mastermind, Joe resumed, when he had unfixed his look and got back to his whisker, and last of all, Pip, and this I want to say very serious to you, old chap, I see so much in my poor mother of a woman drudging and slaving and breaking her honest heart and never getting no peace in her mortal days that I'm dead afraid of going wrong in that way and not doing what's right by a woman and I'd far rather of the two go wrong t'other way and be a little inconvenience myself. I wish it was only me that got put out, Pip. I wish there weren't no tickler for you, old chap. I wish I could take it all on myself. But this is the up and down and straight on it, Pip, and I hope you'll overlook shortcomings. Young as I was, I believe that I dated a new admiration of Joe from that night. We were equals afterwards, as we had been before. But afterwards, at quiet times, when I sat looking at Joe and thinking about him, I had a new sensation of feeling conscious that I was looking up to Joe in my heart. However, said Joe, rising to replenish the fire. Here's the Dutch clock, working himself up to being equal to strike eight of them, and she's not come home yet. I hope Uncle Pumblechook's mare mayn't have set a forefoot on a piece of ice and gone down. Mrs. Joe made occasional trips with Uncle Pumblechook on market days to assist him in buying such household stuffs and goods as required a woman's judgment. Uncle Pumblechook, being a bachelor, and reposing no confidences in his domestic servant. This was market day, and Mrs. Joe was out on one of these expeditions. Joe made the fire and swept the hearth, and then we went to the door to listen for the chase cart. It was a dry, cold night, and the wind blew keenly, and the frost was white and hard. A man would die tonight of lying out on the marshes, I thought, and then I looked at the stars and considered how awful it would be for a man to turn his face up to them as he froze to death, and see no help or pity in all the glittering multitude. "'Here comes a mare,' said Joe, ringing like a peal of bells. The sound of her iron shoes upon the hard road was quite musical, as she came along at a much brisker trot than usual. We got a chair out ready for Mrs. Joe's alighting, and stirred up the fire that they may see a bright window, and took a final survey of the kitchen, that nothing might be out of its place. When we had completed these preparations, they drove up, wrapped to the eyes. Mrs. Joe was soon landed, and Uncle Pumblechook was soon down too, covering the mare with a cloth, and we were soon all in the kitchen, carrying so much cold air in with us that it seemed to drive all the heat out of the fire. Now, said Mrs. Joe, unwrapping herself with haste and excitement, and throwing her bonnet back on her shoulders where it hung by the strings, if this boy ain't grateful this night, he never will be. I looked as grateful as any boy possibly could who was wholly uninformed why he ought to assume that expression. It's only to be hoped, said my sister, that he won't be pompied, but I have my fears. She ain't in that line, mum, said Mr. Pumblechook. She knows better. She, I looked at Joe, making the motion with my lips and eyebrows. She, Joe looked at me, making the motion with his lips and eyebrows. She, my sister, catching him in the act. He drew the back of his hand across his nose with his usual conciliatory air on such occasions, and looked at her. Well, said my sister in a snappish way, what are you staring at? Is the house afire? Which some individual, Joe politely hinted, mentioned she. And she is a she, I suppose, said my sister, unless you call Miss Havisham a he. And I doubt even you'll go as far as that. Miss Havisham, uptown, said Joe. "'Is there any Miss Havisham downtown?' returned my sister. "'She wants this boy to go and play there, and of course he's going, and he'd better play there,' said my sister, shaking her head at me as an encouragement to be extremely light and sportive, or I'll work him. I had heard of Miss Havisham uptown. Everybody for miles around had heard of Miss Havisham uptown. 
as an immensely rich and grim lady who lived in a large and dismal house barricaded against robbers and who led a life of seclusion well to be sure said joe astounded i wonder how she come to know pip noodle cried my sister who said she knew him which some individual joe again politely hinted mentioned that she wanted him to go and play there and couldn't she ask uncle pumblechook if he knew of a boy to go and play there isn't it just barely possible that uncle pumblechook may be a tenant of hers and that he may sometimes we won't say quarterly or half yearly for that would be requiring too much of you but sometimes go there to pay his rent and couldn't she then ask uncle pumblechook if he knew of a boy to go and play there and couldn't uncle pumblechook being always considerate and thoughtful for us though you may not think it joseph in a tone of the deepest reproach as if he were the most callous of nephews then mention this boy standing prancing here which i solemnly declare i was not doing that i have for ever been a willing slave to good again cried uncle pumblechook well put prettily pointed good indeed now joseph you know the case no joseph said my sister still in a reproachful manner while joe apologetically drew the back of his hand across and across his nose you do not yet though you may not think it know the case you may consider that you do but you do not joseph for you do not know that uncle pumblechook being sensible that for anything we can tell this boy's fortune may be made by his going to miss havisham's has offered to take him into town to-night in his own chaise cart and to keep him to-night and to take him with his own hands to Miss Havisham's to-morrow morning. And Laura mussy me, cried my sister, casting off her bonnet in a sudden desperation. Here I stand talking to mere moon-calves, with Uncle Pumblechook waiting, and the mare catching cold at the door, and the boy grime with crock and dirt from the hair of his head to the sole of his foot. With that she pounced upon me, like an eagle on a lamb and my face was squeezed into wooden bowls in sinks, and my head was put under taps of water butts, and I was soaped and kneaded and toweled and thumped and harrowed and rasped, until I really was quite beside myself. I may here remark that I suppose myself to be a better acquaintance than any living authority with the ridgy effect of a wedding ring passing unsympathetically over the human countenance. When my ablutions were completed, I was put into clean linen of the stiffest character, like a young penitent into sackcloth, and was trussed up in my tightest and fearfullest suit. I was then delivered over to Mr. Pumblechook, who formally received me as if he were the sheriff, and who let off upon me the speech that I knew that he had been dying to make all along. Boy, be forever grateful to all friends, but especially unto them which brought you up by hand. Good-bye, Joe. God bless you, Pip, old chap. I had never parted from him before, and what with my feelings, and what with soap suds, I could at first see no stars from the chase cart, but they twinkled out one by one, without throwing any light on the questions why on earth I was going to play at Miss Havisham's, and what on earth I was expected to play at. Chapter 8 Mr. Pumblechook's premises in the high street of the market town were of a peppercorny, and a farnacious character, as the premises of a corn chander and seedsman should be. It appeared to me that he must be a very happy man indeed to have so many little drawers in his shop, and I wondered when I peeped into one or two on the lower tiers and saw the tied up brown paper packets inside whether the flower seeds and bulbs ever wanted of a fine day to break out of those jails and bloom. It was in the early morning after my arrival that I entertained this speculation. On the previous night I had been sent straight to bed in an attic with a sloping roof, which was so low in the corner where the bedstead was, that I calculated the tiles as being within a foot of my eyebrows. In the same early morning I discovered a singular affinity between seeds and corduroys. Mr. Pumblechoke wore corduroys, and so did his shopmen and somehow there was a general air and flavour about the corduroys, so much in the nature of seeds, and a general air and flavour about the seeds, so much in the nature of corduroys, that I hardly knew which was which. The same opportunity served me for noticing that Mr. Pumblechook appeared to conduct his business 
by looking across the street at the saddler, who appeared to transact his business by keeping his eye on the coachmaker, who appeared to get on in life by putting his hands in his pockets and contemplating the baker, who in his turn folded his arms and stared at the grocer, who stood at his door and yawned at the chemist, the watchmaker, always poring over a little desk with a magnifying glass at his eye, and always inspected by a group of smock-frocks poring over him through the glass shop of his window, seemed to be about the only person in the high street whose trade engaged his attention. Mr. Pumblechook and I breakfasted at eight o'clock in the parlour behind the shop, while the shopman took his mug of tea and a hunch of bread and butter on a sack of peas in the front of the premises. I considered Mr. Pumblechook wretched company. Besides being possessed by my sister's idea that a mortifying and penitential character ought to be imparted to my diet, besides giving me as much crumb as possible in combination with as little butter, and putting such a quantity of warm water into my milk that it would have been more candid to have left the milk out altogether. His conversation consisted of nothing but arithmetic. On my politely bidding him good morning, he said pompously, seven times nine, boy, and how should I be able to answer? Dodged in that way, in a strange place, on an empty stomach, I was hungry, but before I had swallowed a morsel, he began a running sum that lasted all through the breakfast, seven, and four, and eight, and six, and two, and ten, and so on, and after each figure was disposed of, it was as much as I could do to get a bite or a sup before the next came while he sat at his ease, guessing nothing, and eating bacon and hot roll, in, if I may be allowed the expression, a gorging and gormandising manner. For such reasons I was very glad when ten o'clock came and we started for Miss Havisham's, though I was not at all at my ease regarding the manner in which I should equip myself under that lady's roof. Within a quarter of an hour we came to Miss Havisham's house, which was of old brick and dismal, and had a great many iron bars to it. Some of the windows had been walled up. Of those that remained, all the lower were rustily barred. There was a courtyard in front, and that was barred. So we had to wait, after ringing the bell, until someone should come to open it. While we waited at the gate, I peeped in. Even then Mr. Pumblechook said, and fourteen. But I pretended not to hear him and saw that at the side of the house there was a large brewery. No brewing was going on in it, and none seemed to have gone on for a long time. A window was raised, and a clear voice demanded, What name? To which my conductor replied, Pumblechook. The voice returned, Quite right, and the window was shut again. And a young lady came across the courtyard with keys in her hand. This, said Mr. Pumblechook, is Pip. "'This is Pip, is it?' returned the young lady, who was very pretty and seemed very proud. "'Come in, Pip.' Mr. Pumbleshoot was coming in also, when she stopped him with the gate. "'Oh,' she said, "'did you wish to see Miss Havisham?' "'If Miss Havisham wished to see me,' returned Mr. Pumbleshoot, discomfited. "'Ah,' said the girl, "'but you see, she don't. She said it so finally, and in such an undiscussable way, that Mr. Pumbleshoot, though in a condition of ruffled dignity, could not protest, but he eyed me severely, as if I had done anything to him, and departed with the words reproachfully delivered, Boy, let your behaviour here be a credit unto them which brought you up by hand. I was not free from apprehension that he wouldn't come back to propound through the gate, and sixteen, but he didn't. My young conductress locked the gate, and we went across the courtyard. It was paved and clean but grass was growing in every crevice. The brewery buildings had a little lane of communication with it, and the wooden gates of that lane stood open, and all the brewery beyond stood open, away to the high enclosing wall, and all was empty and disused. The cold wind seemed to blow colder there than outside the gate, and it made a shrill noise in howling in and out at the open sides of the brewery, like the noise of wind in the rigging of a ship at sea. She saw me looking at it, and she said, You could drink without hurt all the strong beer that's brewed there now, boy. 
"'I should think I could, miss,' said I in a shy way. "'Better not try to brew there now, or it would turn sour, boy. "'Don't you think so?' "'It looks like it, miss. "'Not that anybody means to try,' she added. "'For that's all done with, and the place will stand as idle as it is till it falls. "'As to strong beer, there's enough of it in the cellars already to drown the manor house. "'Is that the name of this house, miss? "'One of its names, boy. "'It has more than one, then, miss.' One more. Its other name was Satis, which is Greek or Latin or Hebrew, or all three, or all one to me, for enough. Enough house, said I. That's a curious name, miss. Yes, she replied. But it meant more than it said. It meant, when it was given, that whoever had this house could want nothing else. They must have been easily satisfied in those days, I should think. But don't loiter, boy. Though she called me boy so often, and with a carelessness that was far from complimentary, she was of about my own age. She seemed much older than I, of course, being a girl, and beautiful and self-possessed, and she was as scornful of me as if she had been one and twenty and a queen. We went into the house by a side door. The great front entrance had two chains across it outside, and the first thing I noticed was that the passages were all dark and that she had left a candle burning there. She took it up, and we went through more passages and up a staircase, and still it was all dark, and only the candle lighted us. At last we came to the door of a room, and she said, Go in. I answered, more in shyness than politeness, After you, miss. To this she returned, Don't be ridiculous, boy. I'm not going in. And scornfully walked away, and, what was worse, took the candle with her. This was very uncomfortable, and I was half afraid. However, the only thing to be done being to knock at the door. I knocked, and was told from within to enter. I entered, therefore, and found myself in a pretty large room, well lighted with wax candles. No glimpse of daylight was to be seen in it. It was a dressing room, as I suppose from the furniture, though much of it was of forms and uses then quite unknown to me. But prominent in it was a draped table with a gilded looking glass, and that I made out at first sight to be a fine lady's dressing table. Whether I should have made out this object so soon, if there had been no fine lady sitting at it, I cannot say. In an armchair, with an elbow resting on the table, her head leaning on that hand, sat the strangest lady I have ever seen, or shall ever see. She was dressed in rich materials, satin and lace and silks, all white. Her shoes were white, and she had a long white veil dependent from her hair, and she had bridal flowers in her hair, but her hair was white. Some bright jewels sparkled on her neck and on her hands, and some other jewels lay sparkling on the table. Dresses, less splendid than the dress she wore, and half-back trunks were scattered about. She had not quite finished dressing, for she had but one shoe on, the other was on the table near her hand. Her veil was but half arranged, her watch and chain were not put on, and some lace for her bosom lay with those trinkets, and with her handkerchief and gloves and some flowers and a prayer book, all confusedly heaped about the looking-glass. It was not in the first few moments that I saw all these things though I saw more of them in the first few moments than might be supposed. But I saw that everything within my view which ought to be white had been white long ago, and had lost its lustre, and was faded and yellow. I saw that the bride within the bridal dress had withered like the dresses, and like the flowers, and had no brightness left but the brightness of her sunken eyes. I saw that the dress had been put upon the rounded figure of a young woman, and that the figure upon which it now hung loose had shrunk to skin and bone. Once I had been taken to see some ghastly waxwork at the fair representing I know not what impossible personage lying in state. Once I had been taken to one of our old marsh churches to see a skeleton in the ashes of a rich dress that had been dug out of a vault under the church pavement. Now waxwork and skeleton seemed to have dark eyes that moved and looked at me, I should have cried out if I could. Who is it? said the lady at the table. Pip, ma'am. Pip? Mr. Pumblechook's boy, ma'am. 
come to play. Come nearer, let me look at you. Come close. It was when I stood before her, avoiding her eyes, that I took note of the surrounding objects in detail, and saw that her watch had stopped at twenty minutes to nine, and that a clock in the room had stopped at twenty minutes to nine. Look at me, said Miss Havisham. You are not afraid of a woman who has never seen the sun since you were born. I regret to state that I was not afraid of telling the enormous lie, comprehended in the answer, no. Do you know what I touch here? she said, laying her hands, one upon the other on her left side. Yes, ma'am, it made me think of the young man. What do I touch? Your heart, broken. She uttered the word with an eager look, and with strong emphasis, and with a weird smile that had a kind of boast in it. Afterwards she kept her hands there for a little while, and slowly took them away as if they were heavy. I am tired, said Miss Havisham. I want diversion, and I have done with men and women. Play. I think it will be conceded by most of my disputatious reader that she could hardly have directed an unfortunate boy to do anything in the wide world more difficult than to be done under the circumstances. I sometimes have sick fancies, she went on, and I have a sick fancy that I want to see some play. There, there, with an impatient movement of the fingers of her right hand, play, play, play. For a moment, with the fear of my sisters working me before my eyes, I had a desperate idea of starting round the room in the assumed character of Mr. Pumblechook's chase cart, but I felt myself so unequal to the performance that I gave it up and stood looking at Miss Havisham in what I suppose she took for a dogged manner, inasmuch, she said, when we had taken a good look at each other, Are you sullen and obstinate? No, ma'am, I'm very sorry for you, and I'm very sorry I can't play just now. If you complain of me, I shall get into trouble with my sister, so I would do it if I could, but it's so new here, and so strange, and so fine, and melancholy, I stopped, fearing I might say too much or I had already said it, and we took another look at each other. Before she spoke again, she turned her eyes from me, and looked at the dress she wore, and at the dressing-table, and finally at herself in the looking-glass. So new to him, she muttered, so old to me, so strange to him, so familiar to me, so melancholy to both of us. Call Estella. As she was still looking at the reflection of herself, I thought she was still talking to herself, and kept quiet. "'Call Estella,' she repeated, flashing a look at me. "'You can do that. Call Estella, at the door. To stand in the dark in a mysterious passage of an unknown house, bawling Estella to a scornful young lady, neither visible nor responsive, and feeling it a dreadful liberty so to roar out her name.' was almost as bad as playing to order. But she answered at last, and her light came along the dark passage like a star. Miss Havisham beckoned her to come close, and took up a jewel from the table and tried its effect upon her fair young bosom, and against her pretty brown hair. Your own one day, my dear, and you will use it well. Let me see you play cards with this boy. With this boy? Why, he's a common labouring boy. I thought I overheard Miss Havisham answer. It only seemed so unlikely. Well, you can break his heart. What do you play, boy? asked Estella of myself, with the greatest disdain. Nothing but beggar my neighbour, miss. Beggar him, said Miss Havisham to Estella. So we sat down to cards. It was then I began to understand that everything in the room had stopped like the watch in the clock a long time ago. I noticed that Miss Havisham put the jewel exactly on the spot from which she had taken it up. As Estella dealt the cards, I glanced at the dressing-table again, and saw that the shoe upon it, once white, now yellow, had never been worn. I glanced down at the foot from which the shoe was absent, and saw that the silk stocking upon it, once white, now yellow, had been trodden ragged. Without this arrest of everything, this standing still of all the pale, decayed objects, not even the withered bridal dress on the collapsed form 
could have looked so like grave clothes or the long veils so like a shroud so she sat corpse-like as we played at cards the frillings and trimmings of her bridal dress looking like earthy paper i knew nothing then of the discoveries that are occasionally made of bodies buried in ancient times which fall to powder in the moment of being distinctly seen but i have often thought since that she must have looked as if the admission of the natural light of day would have struck her to dust. "'He calls the knaves jacks, this boy,' said Estella, with disdain, before our first game was out. "'And what coarse hands he has, and what thick boots!' I had never thought of being ashamed of my hands before, but I began to consider them a very different pair. Her contempt for me was so strong that it became infectious, and I caught it. She won the game, and I dealt. I misdealt, as was only natural, when I knew she was lying in wait for me to do wrong, and she denounced me for a stupid, clumsy, labouring boy. "'You say nothing of her,' remarked Miss Havisham to me, as she looked on. "'She says many hard things of you, but you say nothing of her. What do you think of her?' "'I don't like to say,' I stammered. "'Tell me in my ear,' said Miss Havisham, bending down. I think she's very proud, I replied in a whisper. Anything else? I think she's very pretty. Anything else? I think she's very insulting. She was looking at me then with a look of supreme aversion. Anything else? I think I should like to go home. And never see her again, though she is so pretty? I'm not sure that I shouldn't like to see her again. But I should like to go home now. You shall go soon, said Miss Havisham aloud. Play the game out. Saving for the one weird smile at first, I should have felt almost sure that Miss Havisham's face could not smile. It had dropped into a watchful and brooding expression, most likely when all the things about her had become transfixed, and it looked as if nothing could ever lift it up again. Her chest had dropped so that she stooped, and her voice had dropped so that she spoke low, and with a dead lull upon her. Altogether she had the appearance of having dropped body and soul, within and without, under the weight of a crushing blow. I played the game to an end with Estella, and she beggared me. She threw the cards down on the table when she had won them all, as if she despised them for having been one of me. "'When shall we have you here again?' said Miss Havisham. "'Let me think.' I was beginning to remind her that today was Wednesday, when she checked me with her former impatient movement of the fingers of her right hand. There, there, I know nothing of the days of the week. I know nothing of the weeks of the year. Come again after six days, you hear? Yes, ma'am. Estella, take him down. Let him have something to eat, and let him roam and look about him while he eats. Go, Pip. I followed the candle down as I had followed the candle up, and she stood in the place where we had found it, until she opened the side entrance I had fancied, without thinking about it, that it must necessarily be night-time. The rush of the daylight quite confounded me, and made me feel as if I had been in the candlelight of the strange room many hours. "'You are to wait here, you boy,' said Estella, and disappeared and closed the door. I took the opportunity of being alone in the courtyard to look at my coarse hands and my common boots. My opinion of those accessories was not favourable. They had never troubled me before, but they troubled me now as vulgar appendages. I determined to ask Joe why he had ever taught me to call those picture cards jacks, which ought to be called knaves. I wish Joe had been rather more genteelly brought up and then I should have been so too. She came back with some bread and meat and a little mug of beer. She put the mug down on the stones of the yard and gave me the bread and meat without looking at me, as insolently as if I were a dog in disgrace. I was so humiliated, hurt, spurned, offended, angry, sorry. I, I cannot hit upon the right name for the smart. God knows what its name was that tears started to my eyes. The moment they sprang there, the girl looked at me with a quick delight in having been the cause of them. 
this gave me the power to keep them back and to look at her so she gave a contemptuous toss but with a sense i thought of having made too sure that i was so wounded and left me but when she was gone i looked about me for a place to hide my face in and got behind one of the gates in the brewery lane and leaned my sleeve against the wall there and leaned my forehead on it and cried as i cried i kicked the wall and took a hard twist at my hair so bitter were my feelings and so sharp was the smart without a name that needed counteraction my sister's bringing up had made me sensitive in the little world which children have their existence whosoever brings them up there is nothing so finely perceived and so finely felt as injustice it may be only small injustice that the child can be exposed to but the child is small and his world is small and its rocking horse stands as many hands high according to scale as a big bone irish hunter within myself i had sustained from my babyhood a perpetual conflict with injustice i had known from the time when i could speak that my sister in her capricious and violent coercion was unjust to me i had cherished a profound conviction that her bringing me up by hand gave her no right to bring me up by jerks through all my punishments disgraces fasts and vigils and other penitential performances i had nursed this assurance and to my communing so much with it in a solitary and unprotected way in great part refer the fact that i was morally timid and very sensitive i got rid of my injured feelings for the time by kicking them into the brewery wall and twisting them out of my hair then i smoothed my face and my sleeve came from behind the gate the bread and meat were acceptable and the beer was warming and tingling and i was soon in spirits to look about me to be sure it was a deserted place down to the pigeon house in the brewery yard which had been blown crooked on its pool by some high wind and would have made the pigeons think themselves at sea if there had been any pigeons there to be rocked by it but there were no pigeons in the dovecote no horses in the stable no pigs in the sty no malt in the storehouse no smells of grain and beer in the copper or the vat all the uses and scents of the brewery might have evaporated with its last reek of smoke in a by-yard there was a wilderness of empty casks which had a certain sour remembrance of better days lingering about them but it was too sour to be accepted as a sample of the beer that was gone and in this respect i remember those recluses as being like most others behind the furthest end of the brewery was a rank garden with an old wall not so high but that i could not struggle up and hold on long enough to look over it and see that the rank garden was the garden of the house and it was overgrown with tangled weeds but there was a track upon the green and yellow paths as if someone sometimes walked there and that estella was walking away from me even then but she seemed to be everywhere for when i yielded to the temptation presented by the casks and began to walk on them i saw her walking on them at the end of the yard of casks she had her back towards me and held her pretty brown hair spread out in her two hands and never looked round and passed out of my view directly so in the brewery itself by which i mean the large paved lofty place in which they used to make the beer and where the brewing utensils still were when i first went into it and rather oppressed by its gloom stood near the door looking about me i saw her pass among the extinguished fires and ascended some light iron stairs and go out by a gallery high overhead as if she were going out into the sky it was in this place and at this moment that a strange thing happened to my fancy i thought it a strange thing then and i thought it a stranger thing long afterwards i turned my eyes a little dimmed by looking up at the frosty light towards a great wooden beam in a low nook of the building near me on my right hand side and i saw a figure hanging there by the neck a figure all in yellow white with but one shoe on the feet and it hung so that i could see the faded trimmings of the dress were like earthy paper 
and that the face was Miss Havisham's, with a movement going over the whole countenance as if she were trying to call me. In the terror of seeing the figure, and in the terror of being certain that it had not been there a moment before, I at first ran from it, and then ran towards it, and my terror was greatest of all when I found no figure there, nothing less than the frosty light of the cheerful sky, the sight of people passing beyond the bars of the courtyard gate, and the reviving influence of the rest of the bread and meat and beer, would have brought me round. Even with those aids, I might not have come to myself as soon as I did, but that I saw Estella approaching with the keys to let me out. She would have some fair reason for looking down upon me, I thought, if she saw me frightened, and she would have no fair reason. She gave me a triumphant glance in passing me, as if she rejoiced that my hands were so coarse and my boots were so thick, and she opened the gate and stood holding it. I was passing out without looking at her, when she touched me with a taunting hand. Why don't you cry? Because I don't want to. You do, she said. You have been crying till you are half blind, and you are near crying again now. She laughed contemptuously pushed me out and locked the gate upon me. I went straight to Mr. Pumblechooks, and was immensely relieved to find him not at home. So leaving word with the shopman on what day I was wanted at Miss Havisham's again, I set off on the four-mile walk to our forge, pondering as I went along on all I had seen, and deeply revolving that I was a common labouring boy, that my hands were coarse, that my boots were thick, that I had fallen into a despicable habit of calling knaves jacks, that I was much more ignorant than I had considered myself last night, and generally that I was in a low-lived bad way. CHAPTER Nine. When I reached home, my sister was very curious to know all about Miss Havisham's, and asked a number of questions, and I soon found myself getting heavily bumped from behind in the nape of the neck, and in the small of the back, and having my face ignominiously shoved against the kitchen wall, because I did not answer those questions at sufficient length. If a dread of not being understood be hidden in the breasts of other young people to anything like the extent to which it used to be hidden in mine, which I consider probable, as I have no particular reason to suspect myself of having been a monstrosity, it is the key to too many reservations. I felt convinced that if I described Miss Havisham's as my eyes had seen it, I should not be understood. Not only that, but I felt convinced that Miss Havisham too would not be understood, and although she was perfectly incomprehensible to me, I entertained an impression that there would be something coarse and treacherous in my dragging her, as she really was, to say nothing of Miss Estella, before the contemplation of Mrs. Joe. Consequently, I said as little as I could, and had my face shoved against the kitchen wall. The worst of it was that that bullying old Pumblechook, preyed upon by a devouring curiosity to be informed of all I had seen and heard, came gaping over in his chase cart at tea-time, to have the details divulged to him, and the mere sight of the torment, with his fishy eyes and mouth open, his sandy hair inquisitively on end, and his waistcoat heaving with windy arithmetic, made me vicious in my reticence. "'Well, boy,' Uncle Pumblechook began, as soon as he was seated in the chair of honour by the fire, "'how did you get on up town?' I answered, "'Pretty well, sir,' and my sister shook her fist at me. "'Pretty well,' Mr. Pumblechook repeated. "'Pretty well is no answer. Tell us what you mean by pretty well, boy.' Whitewash on the forehead hardens the brain into a state of obstinacy, perhaps. Anyhow, with whitewash from the wall on my forehead, my obstinacy was adamantine. I reflected for some time, and then answered, as if I had discovered a new idea, I mean pretty well. My sister, with an exclamation of impatience, was going to fly at me. I had no shadow of defence, for Joe was busy in the forge, when Mr. Pumblechook interposed with, No, don't lose your temper. Leave this lad to me, ma'am. Leave this lad to me. Mr. Pumblechook then turned me towards him, as if he were going to cut my hair, and said, First, 
to get our thoughts in order. Forty-three pence. I calculated the consequences of applying four hundred pound, and finding them against me, went as near the answer as I could, which was somewhere about eightpence off. Mr. Pumblechook then put me through my pence table, from twelve pence make one shilling, up to forty pence make three and fourpence, and then triumphantly demanded, as if he had done it for me, Now, how much is forty-three pence? To which I replied, after a long interval of reflection, I don't know. And I was so aggravated that I almost doubt if I did know. Mr. Pumblechook worked his head like a screw to screw it out of me, and said, Is forty-three pence seven and sixpence free fardens, for instance? Yes, said I, and although my sister instantly boxed my ears, it was highly gratifying to me to see that the answer spoiled his joke and brought him to a dead stop. Boy, what like is Miss Havisham? Mr. Pumblechook began again, when he had recovered, folding his arms tight on his chest and applying the screw. Very tall and dark, I told him. Is she, uncle? asked my sister. Mr. Pumblechook winked a scent from which I at once inferred that he had never seen Miss Havisham, for she was nothing of the kind. Good, said Mr. Pumblechook conceitedly. This is the way to have him. We are beginning to hold our own, I think, Mum. I am sure, Uncle, returned Mrs. Joe. I wish you had him always. You know so well how to deal with him. Now, boy, what was she a doing of when you went in today? asked Mr. Pumblechook. She was sitting, I answered, in a black velvet coach. Mr. Pumblechoke and Mrs. Joe stared at one another, as they well might, and both repeated, In a black velvet coach? Yes, said I, and Mrs. Stella, that's her niece, I think, handed her in cake and wine at the coach window on a gold plate, and we all had cake and wine on gold plates, and I got up behind the coach to eat mine because she told me to. "'Was anybody else there?' asked Mr. Pumblechook. Four dogs,' said I. "'Large or small?' "'Immense,' said I, and they fought for veal cutlets out of a silver basket. Mr. Pumblechook and Mrs. Joe stared at one another again in utter amazement. I was perfectly frantic, a reckless witness under the torture, and would have told them anything. "'Where was this coach in the name of Gracious?' asked my sister. In Miss Havisham's room. They stared again. But there weren't any horses to it, I added this saving clause, in the moment of rejecting four richly caparisoned courses, which I had had wild thoughts of harnessing. Can this be possible, Uncle? asked Mrs. Joe. What can the boy mean? I tell you, Mum, said Mr. Pumblechook. My opinion is, it's a sedan chair. She's flighty, you know. Very flighty quite flighty enough to pass her days in a sedan chair. Did you ever see her in it, uncle? asked Mrs. Joe. How could I? he returned, forced to the admission, when I never see her in my life, never clapped eyes upon her. Goodness, uncle, and yet you have spoken to her. Why don't you know, said Mr. Pumblechook testily, that when I've been there, I've been took up to the outside of her door, and the door has stood ajar, and she has spoken to me that way. Don't say you don't know that, Mum. Howsoever, the boy went there to play. What did you play at, boy? We played with flags, I said. I beg to observe that I think of myself with amazement when I recall the lies I told on this occasion. Flags? echoed my sister. Yes, said I. Estella waved a blue flag, and I waved a red one and Miss Havisham waved one sprinkled all over with little gold stars out at the coach window, and then we all waved our swords and hurrahed. Swords, repeated my sister. Where did you get swords from? Out of a cupboard, said I, and I saw pistols in it, and jam, and pills, and there was no daylight in the room, but it was all lighted up with candles. That's true, Mum, said Mr. Pumblechook with a grave nod. That's the state of the case. For that much I've seen myself. And they both stared at me, and I, with an obtrusive show of artlessness on my countenance, stared at them, and plaited the right leg of my trousers with my right hand. If they had asked me any more questions, I should have undoubtedly have betrayed myself, 
for I was even then on the point of mentioning that there was a balloon in the yard, and should have hazarded the statement but for my invention being divided between that phenomenon and a bear in the brewery. They were so much occupied, however, in discussing the marvels I had already presented for their consideration, that I escaped. The subject still held them when Joe came in from his work to have a cup of tea, to whom my sister, more for the relief of her own mind than for the gratification of his, related my pretended experiences. Now when I saw Joe open his blue eyes and roll them all around the kitchen in helpless amazement, I was overtaken by penitence, but only as regard him, not in the least as regarded the other two. Towards Joe and Joe only I considered myself a young monster, while they sat debating what results would come to me from Miss Havisham's acquaintance and favour. They had no doubt that Miss Havisham would do something for me. Their doubts related to the form that that something would take. My sister stood out for property. Mr. Pumblechoop was in favour of a handsome premium for binding me apprentice to some genteel trade, say the corn and seed trade, for instance. Joe fell into the deepest disgrace with both for offering the bright suggestion that I might only be presented with one of the dogs who had fought for the veal cutlets. If a fool's head can't express better opinions than that, said my sister, and you have got any work to do, you had better go and do it. So he went. After Mr. Pumblechook had driven off, and when my sister was washing up, I stole into the forge to Joe, and remained by him until he had done for the night. Then I said, Before the fire goes out, Joe, I should like to tell you something. Should you, Pip? said Joe. Joe, said I, taking hold of his rolled-up shirt-sleeve and twisting it between my fingers and thumb. You remember all that about Miss Havisham's? Remember? said Joe. I believe you. Wonderful. It's a terrible thing, Joe. It ain't true. What are you a-telling of, Pip? cried Joe, falling back in the greatest amazement. You don't mean to say it's... Yes, I do. It's lies, Joe. But not all of it. Why, sure, you don't mean to say, Pip, that there was no black velvet coach? For I stood shaking my head. But at least there was dogs, Pip. Come, Pip, said Joe persuasively. If there weren't no wheel cutlets, at least there was dogs. No, Joe. A dog, said Joe. A puppy. Come. No, Joe, there was nothing at all of the kind. As I fixed my eyes hopelessly on Joe, Joe contemplated me in dismay. Pip, old chap, this won't do, old fellow, I say. Where do you expect to go to? It's terrible, Joe, ain't it? Terrible, cried Joe. Awful. What possessed you? I don't know what possessed me, Joe, I replied, letting his shirt sleeve go and sitting down in the ashes at his feet, hanging my head. But I wish you hadn't taught me to call knaves at cards jacks, and I wish my boots weren't so thick nor my hands so coarse. And then I told Joe that I felt very miserable, and that I hadn't been able to explain myself to Mrs. Joe and Pumblechook, who were so rude to me, that there had been a beautiful young lady at Miss Havisham's who was dreadfully proud that she had said I was common, and that I knew I was common, and that I wished I was not common, and that the lies had come off it somehow, though I didn't know how. This was a case of metaphysics, at least as difficult for Joe to deal with as for me. But Joe took the case altogether out of the region of metaphysics, and by that means vanquished it. There's one thing you may be sure of, Pip, said Joe, after some rumination, namely that lies is lies. Howsoever they come, they didn't ought to come, and they come from the father of lies, and work round to the same. Don't you tell no more of em, Pip. That ain't the way to get out of being common, old chap. And as to being common, I don't make it out at all clear. You are uncommon in some things. You are uncommon small. Likewise, you are an uncommon scholar. No, I am ignorant and backward, Joe. Why, see what a letter you wrote last night. Wrote in print, even. I've seen letters, and ah, from gentlefolks, that I'll swear weren't wrote in print, said Joe. I've learnt next to nothing, Joe. You think much of me. It's only that. Well, Pip, said Joe, be it so or be it so, you must be a common scholar afore you can be an uncommon one. I should hope the king upon his throne, with his crown upon his head, can't sit and write his acts of parliament in print 
without having begun when he were an unpromoted prince with the alphabet ah added joe with a shake of the head that was full of meaning and begun at a too and worked his way to z and i know what that is to do though i can't say i've exactly done it there was some hope in this piece of wisdom and it rather encouraged me were there common ones as to callings and earnings pursued joe reflectively mightn't be the better of continuing for to keep company with common ones instead of going out to play with uncommon ones which reminds me to hope that there were a flag perhaps no joe i'm sorry there weren't a flag pip whether that might be or mightn't be is a thing that can't be looked into now without putting your sister on the rampage and that's a thing not to be thought of as being done intentional looky here pip at what is said to you by a true friend which this to you the true friend say if you can't get to be uncommon through going straight you'll never get to do it through going crooked so don't tell no more on em pip and live well and die happy you are not angry with me joe no old chap but bearing in mind that them were which i mayn't to say of a stunning and audacious sort alluding to them which bordered on wheel cutlets and dog fighting a sincere well-wisher would advise pip they're being dropped into your meditations when you go upstairs to bed that's all old chap and don't never do it no more when i got up to my little room and said my prayers i did not forget joe's recommendation and yet my young mind was in that disturbed and unthankful state that i thought long after i laid me down how common a stella would consider joe a mere blacksmith how thick his boots and how coarse his hands i thought how joe and my sister were then sitting in the kitchen and how i had come up to bed from the kitchen and how miss havisham and estella never sat in the kitchen but were far above the level of such common doings i fell asleep recalling what i used to do when i was at miss havisham's as though i had been there weeks or months instead of hours and as though it were quite an old subject of remembrance instead of one that had arisen only that day that was a memorable day to me for it made great changes in me but it is the same with any life imagine one selected day struck out of it and think how different its course would have been pause you who read this and think for a moment of the long chain of iron or gold of thorns or flowers that would never have bound you but for the formation of the first link on one memorable day chapter ten the felicitous idea occurred to me a morning or two later when i woke that the best step i could take towards making myself uncommon was to get out of biddy everything she knew in pursuance of this luminous conception i mentioned to biddy when i went to mr wopsle's great aunt's at night that i had a particular reason for wishing to get on in life and that i should feel very much obliged to her if she would impart all her learning to me biddy who was the most obliging of girls immediately said she would and indeed began to carry out her promise within five minutes the educational scheme or course established by mr wopsle's great-aunt may be resolved into the following synopsis the pupils ate apples and put straws down one another's backs until mr wopsle's great-aunt collected her energies and made an indiscriminate totter at them with a birch rod after receiving the charge with every mark of derision the pupils formed in line and buzzingly passed a ragged book from hand to hand the book had an alphabet in it some figures and tables and a little spelling that is to say it had once as soon as this volume began to circulate mr wopsle's great-aunt fell into a state of coma arising either from sleep or a rheumatic paroxysm the pupils then entered among themselves upon a competitive examination on the subject of boots with the view of ascertaining who could tread the hardest upon whose toes this mental exercise lasted until biddy made a rush at them and distributed three defaced bibles shaped as if they had been unskilfully cut off the chump end of something more illegibly printed at the best than any curiosities of literature i have since met with speckled all over with iron mould and having various specimens of the insect world smashed between their leaves 
This part of the course was usually lightened by several single combats between Biddy and refractory students. When the fights were over, Biddy gave out the number of a page, and then we all read aloud what we could, or what we couldn't, in a frightful chorus. Biddy, leading with a high, shrill, monotonous voice, and none of us having the least notion of, or reverence for, what we were reading about. When this horrible din had lasted a certain time, it mechanically awoke Mr. Wopsle's great aunt, who staggered at a boy fortuitously and pulled his ears. This was understood to terminate the course for the evening, and we emerged into the air with shrieks of intellectual victory. It is fair to remark there was no prohibition against any pupil's entertaining himself with a slate, or even with the ink, when there was any, but that it was not easy to pursue that branch of study in the winter season on account of the little general shop in which the classes were holden, and which was also Mr. Wopsle's great-aunt's sitting-room and bedchamber, being but faintly illuminated through the agency of one low-spirited dip-candle and no snuffers. It appeared to me that it would take time to become uncommon under these circumstances. Nevertheless, I resolved to try it, and that very evening Biddy entered on our special agreement by imparting some information from a little catalogue of prices under the head of moist sugar and lending me to copy at home a large old english d which she had imitated from the heading of some newspaper and which i supposed until she told me what it was to be a design for a buckle of course there was a public house in the village and of course joe liked sometimes to smoke his pipe there I had received strict orders from my sister to call for him at the Three Jolly Bargemen that evening on my way from school, and bring him home at my peril. To the Three Jolly Bargemen, therefore, I directed my steps. There was a bar at the Jolly Bargemen, with some alarmingly long chalk scores in it on the wall at the side of the door, which seemed to me to be never paid off. They had been there ever since I could remember, and had grown more than I had but there was a quantity of chalk about our country, and perhaps the people neglected no opportunity of turning it into account. It being Saturday night, I found the landlord looking rather grimly at these records, but as my business was with Joe and not with him, I merely wished him good evening and passed into the common room at the end of the passage, where there was a bright large kitchen fire and where Joe was smoking his pipe in company with Mr. Wopsle and a stranger. Joe greeted me as usual with, "'Hello, a pip, old chap!' And the moment he said that, the stranger turned his head and looked at me. He was a secret-looking man whom I had never seen before. His head was all on one side, and one of his eyes was half shut up, as if he were taking aim at something with an invisible gun. He had a pipe in his mouth, and he took it out, and after slowly blowing all his smoke away, and looking hard at me all the time, nodded. So I nodded, and then he nodded again and made a room on the settle beside him that I might sit down there. But as I was used to sit beside Joe whenever I entered that place of resort, I said, No, thank you, sir, and fell into the space Joe made for me on the opposite settle. The strange man, after glancing at Joe and seeing that his attention was otherwise engaged, nodded to me again when I had taken my seat and then rubbed his leg in a very odd way as it struck me. You were saying, said the strange man, turning to Joe, that you was a blacksmith. Yes, I said it, you know, said Joe. What do you drink, mister? You didn't mention your name, by the by. Joe mentioned it now, and the strange man called him by it. What do you drink, Mr. Gargery, at my expense, to top up with? Well, said Joe, tell you the truth, I ain't much in the habit of drinking at anybody's expense but my own. Habit? No, returned the stranger, but once in a way and on a Saturday night too. Come, put a name to it, Mr. Gargery. I wouldn't wish to be stiff company, said Joe. Rum. Rum, repeated the stranger, and will the other gentleman originate a sentiment? Rum, said Mr. Wopsle. Three rums, cried the stranger, calling to the landlord. Glasses round. This other gentleman observed Joe, by way of introducing Mr. Wopsle, is a gentleman that you would like to hear give it out, our clerk at church. 
Aha, said the stranger, quickly and cocking his eye at me. The lonely church right out on the marshes with graves round it. That's it, said Joe. The stranger, with a comfortable kind of grunt over his pipe, put his legs up on the settle that he had to himself. He wore a flapping broad-brimmed traveller's hat, and under it a handkerchief tied over his head in the manner of a cap, so that he showed no hair. As he looked at the fire, I thought I saw a cunning expression, followed by a half-laugh, come into his face. I am not acquainted with this country, gentlemen, but it seems a solitary country towards the river. Most marshes is solitary, said Joe. No doubt, no doubt. Do you find any gypsies now, or tramps, or vagrants of any sort out there? No, said Joe. None but a runaway convict now and then, and we don't find them easy, eh, huh, Mr. Wopsle? Mr. Wopsle, with a majestic remembrance of, of old discomfiture, assented, but not warmly. Seems you have been out after such, asked the stranger. Once, returned Joe. Not that we wanted to take them. You understand, we went out as lookers-on, me and Mr. Wopsle and Pip. Didn't us, Pip? Yes, Joe. The stranger looked at me again, still cocking his eye as if he were expressly taking aim at me with his invisible gun, and said, He's a likely young parcel of bones, that. What is it you call him? Pip, said Joe. Christen Pip? No, not Christen Pip. Surname Pip? No, said Joe. It's a kind of family name what he gave himself when an infant and is called by. Son of yours? Well, said Joe, meditatively. Not, of course, that it could be in any ways necessary to consider about it, but because it was the way at the Jolly Bargeman to seem to consider deeply about everything that was discussed over pipes. Well, no, no he ain't. Nevy, said the strange man. Well, said Joe, with the same appearance of profound cogitation, he is not, no, not to deceive you, he is not my nevy. What in the blue blazes is he? asked the stranger, which appeared to me to be an inquiry of unnecessary strength. Mr. Wopsle struck in upon that as one who knew all about relationships, having professional occasion to bear that in mind what female relations a man might not marry, and expound the ties between me and Joe. Having his hand in, Mr. Wopsle finished off with a most terrifically snarling passage from Richard the Third, and seemed to think he had done quite enough to account for it when he added, As a poet says. And here I may remark that when Mr. Wopsle referred to me, he considered it a necessary part of such reference to rumple my hair and poke it into my eyes. I cannot conceive why everybody of his standing who visited at our house should always have to put me through the same inflammatory process under similar circumstances. Yet I do not call to mind that I was ever in my earlier youth the subject of remark in our social family circle, but some large-handed person took some such ophthalmic steps to patronise me. All this while the strange man looked at nobody but me and looked at me as if he were determined to have a shot at me at last, and bring me down. But he said nothing after offering his blue blazes observation until the glasses of rum and water were brought. And then he made his shot, and a most extraordinary shot it was. It was not a verbal remark, but a proceeding in dumb show, and was pointedly addressed to me. He stirred his rum and water pointedly at me, and he tasted his rum and water pointedly at me, and he stirred it and he tasted it, not with a spoon that was brought to him, but with a file. He did this so that nobody but I saw the file, and when he had done it, he wiped the file and put it in a breast pocket. I knew it to be Joe's file, and I knew that he knew my convict the moment I saw the instrument. I sat gazing at him, spellbound, but he now reclined on his settle, taking very little notice of me, and talking principally about turnips. There was a delicious sense of cleaning up and making a quiet pause before going on in life afresh in our village on Saturday nights, which stimulated Joe to dare to stay out half an hour longer on Saturdays than at other times. The half hour and the rum and water running out together, Joe got up to go and took me by the hand. "'Stop half a moment, Mr. Gargery,' said the strange man. 
I think I've got a bright new shilling somewhere in my pocket, and if I have, the boy shall have it. He took it out from a handful of small change, folded it in some crumpled paper, and gave it to me. Yours, said he. Mind, your own. I thanked him, staring at him, far beyond the bounds of good manners, and holding tight to Joe. He gave Joe good night, and he gave Mr. Wopsle good night, who went out with us. And he gave me only a look with his aiming eye. No, not a look, for he shut it up. But wonders may be done with an eye by hiding it. On the way home, if I had been in a humour for talking, the talk must have been all on my side, for Mr. Wopsle parted from us at the door of the Jolly Bargeman, and Joe went all the way home with his mouth wide open to rinse the rum out with as much air as possible. But I was in a manner stupefied by this turning up of my old misdeed and old acquaintance, and could think of nothing else. My sister was not in a very bad temper when we presented ourselves in the kitchen, and Joe was encouraged by that unusual circumstance to tell her about the bright shilling. A bad and I'll be bound, said Mrs. Joe triumphantly, or he wouldn't have given it to the boy. Let's look at it. I took it out of the paper, and it proved to be a good one. But what's this? said Mrs. Joe, throwing down the shilling and catching up the paper. Two one-pound notes? Nothing less than two fat sweltering one-pound notes that seem to have been on terms of the warmest intimacy with all the cattle markets in the county. Joe caught up his hat again and ran with them to the jolly bargeman to restore them to their owner. While he was gone, I sat down on my usual stool and looked vacantly at my sister, feeling pretty sure that the man would not be there. Presently Joe came back, saying that the man was gone but that he, Joe, had left word at the three jolly bargemen concerning the notes. Then my sister sealed them up in a piece of paper and put them under some dried rose leaves in an ornamental teapot on the top of a press in the state parlour. There they remained, a nightmare to me, many and many a night and day. I had sadly broken sleep when I got to bed through thinking of the strange man taking aim at me with his invisible gun and of the guiltily coarse and common thing it was to be on secret terms of conspiracy with convicts, a feature in my low career that I had previously forgotten. I was haunted by the file, too. A dread possessed me that when I least expected it the file would reappear. I coaxed myself to sleep thinking of Miss Havisham's next Wednesday, and in my sleep I saw the file coming at me out of a door, without seeing who held it and I screamed myself awake. Chapter 11 At the appointed time I returned to Miss Havisham's, and my hesitating ring at the gate brought out Estella. She locked it after admitting me, as she had done before, and again preceded me into the dark passage where her candle stood. She took no notice of me until she had the candle in her hand, when she looked over her shoulder, superciliously saying, "'You are to come this way to-day.' and took me to quite another part of the house. The passage was a long one, and seemed to pervade the whole square basement of the manor house. We traversed but one side of the square, however, and at the end of it she stopped, and put her candle down and opened a door. Here the daylight reappeared, and I found myself in a small paved courtyard, the opposite side of which was formed by a detached dwelling-house that looked as if it had once belonged to the manager or head clerk of the extinct brewery. There was a clock in the outer wall of this house, like the clock in Miss Havisham's room, and like Miss Havisham's watch it had stopped at twenty minutes to nine. We went in at the door, which stood open, and into a gloomy room with a low ceiling on the ground floor at the back. There was some company in the room, and Estella said to me as she joined it, "'You are to go and stand there, boy, till you are wanted.' There being the window. I crossed to it and stood there, in a very uncomfortable state of mind, looking out. It opened to the ground, and looked into a most miserable corner of the neglected garden, upon a rank ruin of cabbage stalks, and one box tree that had been clipped round long ago like a pudding, and had a new growth at the top of it, out of shape, and of a different colour, as if that part of the pudding had stuck to the saucepan and got burned. This was my homely thought as I contemplated the box tree. 
There had been some light snow overnight, and it lay nowhere else to my knowledge, but it had not quite melted from the cold shadow of this bit of garden, and the wind caught it up in little eddies and threw it at the window, as if it pelted me for coming there. I divined that my coming had stopped conversation in the room, and that its other occupants were looking at me. I could see nothing of the room except the shining of the fire in the window glass, but I stiffened in all my joints with the consciousness that I was under close inspection. There were three ladies in the room and one gentleman. Before I had been standing at the window for five minutes, they somehow conveyed to me that they were all toadies and humbugs, but that each of them pretended not to know that the others were toadies and humbugs, because the admission that he or she did know it would have made him or her out to be a toady and a humbug. They all had a listless and dreary air of waiting somebody's pleasure, and the most talkative of the ladies had to speak quite rigidly to repress a yawn. This lady, whose name was Camilla, very much reminded me of my sister, with the difference that she was older, and, as I found out when I caught sight of her, of a blunter cast of features. Indeed, when I knew her better, I began to think it was a mercy she had any features at all, so very blank and high was the dead wall of her face. "'Poor dear soul,' said this lady, with an abruptness of manner, quite my sister's. "'Nobody's enemy but his own.' "'It would be much more commendable to be somebody else's enemy,' said the gentleman. "'Far more natural.' "'Cousin Raymond,' observed another lady, "'we are to love our neighbour. "'Sarah Pocket,' returned Cousin Raymond. "'If a man is not his own neighbour, who is?' Miss Pocket laughed, and Camilla laughed, and said, checking a yawn, "'The idea!' but I thought they seemed to think it rather a good idea too. The other lady, who had not spoken yet, said gravely and emphatically, Very true. Poor soul, Camilla presently went on. I knew they had all been looking at me in the meantime. He is so very strange, would anyone believe that when Tom's wife died, he actually could not be induced to see the importance of the children's having the deepest of trimmings to their mourning. Good Lord, says he, Camilla, what can it signify so long as the poor bereaved little things are in black? So like Matthew, the idea. Good points in him, good points in him, said Cousin Raymond. Heaven forbid that I should deny the good points in him, but he never had and he never will have any sense of the proprieties. You know I was obliged, said Camilla. I was obliged to be firm. I said, it will not do, for the credit of the family. I told him that without deep trimmings the family was disgraced. I cried about it from breakfast till dinner. I injured my digestion, and at last he flung out in his violent way and said with a D, Then do as you like. Thank goodness it will always be a consolation to me to know that I instantly went out in a pouring rain and bought the things. He paid for them, did he not? asked Estella. It is not the question, my dear child, who paid for them, returned Camilla. I bought them, and I shall often think of that with peace when I wake up in the night. The ringing of a distant bell, combined with the echoing of some cry or call along the passage by which I had come, interrupted the conversation and caused Estella to say to me, Now, boy, on my turning round they all looked at me with the utmost contempt, and as I went out I heard Sarah Pocket say, Well, I'm sure, what next? And Camilla add with indignation, Was there ever such a fancy? The idea! As we were going with our candle along the dark passage, Estella stopped all of a sudden, and facing round, said in her taunting manner, with her face quite close to mine, Well? Well, miss, I answered, almost falling over her and checking myself. She stood looking at me, and of course I stood looking at her. Am I pretty? Yes, I think you are very pretty. Am I insulting? Not so much as you were last time, said I. Not so much so. No. She fired when she asked the last question, and she slapped my face with such a force as she had when I answered it. Now, said she, you little coarse monster, what do you think of me now? I shall not tell you, because you're going to tell upstairs, is that it? No, said I, that's not it. Why don't you cry again, you little wretch? Because I'll never cry for you again, said I, which was, I suppose, as false a declaration as ever was made for I was inwardly crying for her then, and I know what I know of the pain she cost me afterwards. We went on our way upstairs after this episode, and as we were going up we met a gentleman groping his way down. Whom have we here? asked the gentleman, stopping and looking at me. A boy, 
said Estella. He was a burly man of an exceedingly dark complexion, with an exceedingly large head and a corresponding large hand. He took my chin in his large hand, and he turned up my face to have a look at me by the light of the candle. He was prematurely bald on the top of his head, and had bushy black eyebrows that wouldn't lie down but stood up bristling. His eyes were set very deep in his head, and were disagreeably sharp and suspicious. He had a large watch-chain and strong black dots where his beard and whiskers would have been if he had let them. He was nothing to me, and I could have had no foresight then that he ever would be anything to me, but it happened that I had this opportunity of observing him well. "'Boy of the neighbourhood, hey?' said he. "'Yes, sir,' said I. "'How do you come here?' "'Miss Havisham sent for me, sir,' I explained. "'Well, behave yourself. I have a pretty large experience of boys, and you're a bad set of fellows. Now mind,' said he, biting the side of his great forefinger as he frowned at me, "'you behave yourself.' With those words he released me, which I was glad of, for his hand smelt of scented soap, and went his way down the stairs. I wondered whether he could be a doctor, but no, I thought, he couldn't be a doctor, or he would have had a quieter and more persuasive manner. There was not much time to consider the subject, for we were soon in Miss Havisham's room, where she and everything else were just as I had left them. Estella left me standing near the door, and I stood there until Miss Havisham cast her eyes upon me from the dressing-table. So, she said, without being startled or surprised, the days have worn away, have they? Yes, ma'am, today is there, 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 with an impatient movement of her fingers. I don't want to know. Are you ready to play? I was obliged to answer in some confusion. I don't think I am, ma'am. Not at cards again, she demanded, with a searching look. Yes, ma'am, I could do that, if I was wanted. "'Since this house strikes you old and grave, boy,' said Miss Havisham impatiently, "'and you are unwilling to play, are you willing to work?' I could answer this inquiry with a better heart than I had been able to find for the other question, and I said I was quite willing. "'Then go into that opposite room,' said she, pointing at the door behind me with her withered hand, "'and wait there till I come.' I crossed the staircase landing, and entered the room she indicated. From that room, too, the daylight was completely excluded, and it had an airless smell that was oppressive. A fire had been lately kindled in the damp old-fashioned grate, and it was more disposed to go out than to burn up, and the reluctant smoke which hung in the room seemed colder than the clearer air, like our own marsh mist. Certain wintry branches of candles on the high chimney-piece faintly lighted the chamber, or it would be more expressive to say, faintly troubled its darkness. It was spacious, and I dare say had once been handsome, but every discernible thing in it was covered with dust and mould and dropping to pieces. The most prominent object was a long table, with a tablecloth spread upon it, as if a feast had been in preparation, when the house and the clocks all stopped together. An apern, or centrepiece of some kind, was in the middle of this cloth, it was so heavily overhung with cobwebs that its form was quite undistinguishable, and as I looked along the yellow expanse out of which I remember it seeming to grow, like a black fungus, I saw speckle-legged spiders with blotchy bodies running home to it, and running out from it as if some circumstances of the greatest public importance had just transpired in the spider community. I heard the mice, too, rattling behind the panels, as if the same occurrence were important to their interests. But the black beetles took no notice of the agitation, and groped about the hearth in a ponderous elderly way, as if they were short-sighted and hard of hearing, and not on terms with one another. These crawling things had fascinated my attention, and I was watching them from a distance when Miss Havisham laid a hand upon my shoulder. In her other hand she had a crutch-headed stick on which she leaned, and she looked like the witch of the place. This, said she, pointing to the long table with her stick, is where I will be laid when I am dead. They shall come and look at me here. With some vague misgiving that she might get upon the table then and there and die at once, the complete realisation of the ghastly waxwork at the fair, I shrank under her touch. What do you think that is? she asked me again, pointing with her stick. 
that where those cobwebs are i can't guess what it is mum it's a great cake a bride cake mine she looked all round the room in a glaring manner and then said leaning on me while her hand twitched on my shoulder come 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 walk me walk me i made out from this that the work i had to do was to walk miss havisham round and round the room accordingly i started at once and she leaned upon my shoulder and we went away at a pace that might have been an imitation founded on my first impulse under that roof of mr pumblechook's chase cart she was not physically strong and after a little time said slower still we went at an impatient fitful speed and as we went she twitched the hand upon my shoulder and worked her mouth and led me to believe that we were going fast because her thoughts went fast after a while she said call us stella so i went out on the landing and roared that name as i had done on the previous occasion when her light appeared i returned to miss havisham and we started away again around and around the room if only estella had come to be a spectator of our proceedings i should have felt sufficiently discontented but as she brought with her the three ladies and the gentlemen whom i had seen below i didn't know what to do in my politeness i would have stopped but miss havisham twitched on my shoulder and we posted on with a shamefaced consciousness on my part that they would think it was all my doing dear miss havisham said miss sarah pocket how well you look i do not return miss havisham i am yellow skin and bone camilla brightened when miss pocket met with this rebuff and she murmured as she plaintively contemplated miss havisham poor dear soul certainly not to be expected to look well poor thing the idea and how are you said miss havisham to camilla as we were close to camilla then i would have stopped as a matter of course only miss havisham wouldn't stop we swept on and i felt that i was highly obnoxious to camilla thank you miss havisham she returned i am as well as can be expected why what's the matter with you asked miss havisham with exceeding sharpness nothing worth mentioning replied camilla i don't wish to make a display of my feelings but i have habitually thought of you more in the night than i am quite equal to then don't think of me retorted miss havisham very easily said remarked camilla amiably repressing a sob while a hitch came into her upper lip and her tears overflowed raymond is a witness what ginger and sal volatile i am obliged to take in the night raymond is a witness of what nervous jerkings i have in my legs chokings and nervous jerkings chokings and nervous jerkings however are nothing new to me when i think with anxiety of those i love if i could be less affectionate and sensitive i should have a better digestion and an iron set of nerves i am sure i wish it could be so but as to not thinking of you in the night the idea here a burst of tears the raymond referred to i understood to be the gentleman present and him i understood to be mr camilla he came to the rescue at this point and said in a consolatory and complimentary voice camilla my dear it is well known that your family feelings are gradually undermining you to the extent of making one of your legs shorter than the other i am not aware observed the grave lady whose voice i had heard but once that to think of any person is to make a great claim upon that person my dear miss sarah pocket whom i now saw to be a little dry brown corrugated old woman with a small face that might have been made of walnut shells and a large mouth like a cat's without the whiskers supported this position saying no indeed my dear mm. thinking is easy enough said the grave lady what is easier you know assented miss sarah pocket oh yes yes cried camilla whose fermenting feelings appeared to rise from her legs to her bosom it's all very true it's a weakness to be so affectionate but i can't help it no doubt my health would be much better if it was otherwise still i wouldn't change my disposition if i could it's the cause of much suffering but it's a consolation to know that i possess it when i wake up in the night here another burst of feeling miss havisham and i had never stopped all this time but kept going round and round the room now brushing against the skirts of the visitors now giving them the whole length of the dismal chamber there's matthew said camilla never mixing with any natural ties 
never coming here to see how Miss Havisham is. I have taken to the sofa with my stay lace cut, and have lain there hours insensible, with my head over the side and my hair all down, and my feet I don't know where. Much higher than your head, my love, said Mr. Camilla. I have gone off into that state hours and hours on account of Matthew's strange and inexplicable conduct, and nobody has thanked me. Really, I must say I should think not, interposed the grave lady. You see, my dear, added Miss Sarah Pocket, a blandly vicious personage, the question to put to yourself is, who did you expect to thank you, my love? Without expecting any thanks or anything of the sort, resumed Camilla, I have remained in that state hours and hours, and Raymond is a witness to the extent which I have choked and what the total inefficacy of ginger has been and I have been heard at the pianoforte tuners across the street, where the poor mistaken children have even supposed it to be pigeons cooing at a distance. And now to be told, here Camilla put her hand to her throat, and began to be quite chemical as to the formation of a new combination there. When this name Matthew was mentioned, Miss Havisham stopped me and herself and stood looking at the speaker. This change had a great influence in bringing Camilla's chemistry to a sudden end. Matthew will come and see me at last, said Miss Havisham sternly, when I am laid on that table. That will be his place, there, striking the table with a stick, at my head, and yours will be there, and your husband's there, and Sarah Pocket's there, and Georgina's there. Now you all know where to take your stations when you come to feast upon me, and now go. At the mention of each name she had struck the table with her stick in a new place, she now said, Walk me, walk me, and we went on again. I suppose there's nothing to be done, exclaimed Camilla, but comply and depart. It's something to have seen the object of one's love and duty for even so short a time. I shall think of it with a melancholy satisfaction when I wake up in the night. I wish Matthew could have that comfort, but he sets it at defiance. I am determined not to make a display of my feelings, but it's very hard to be told one wants to feast upon one's relations, as if one was a giant, and to be told to go. The bare idea. Mr. Camilla interposing, as Mrs. Camilla laid her hand upon her heaving bosom, that lady assumed an unnatural fortitude of manner, which I suppose to be expressive of an intention to drop and choke when out of view, and kissing her hand to Miss Havisham, was escorted forth. Sarah Pocket and Georgiana contended who should remain last, but Sarah was too knowing to be outdone, and ambled round Georgiana with that artful slipperiness that the latter was obliged to take precedence. Sarah Pocket then made her separate effect of parting with, Bless you, Miss Havisham, dear, and with a smile of forgiving pity on her walnut-shelled countenance for the weakness of the rest. While Estella was away lighting them down, Miss Havisham still walked with her hand on my shoulder, but more and more slowly. At last she stopped before the fire and said, after muttering and looking at it for some seconds, This is my birthday, Pip. I was going to wish her many happy returns when she lifted her stick. I don't suffer it to be spoken of. I don't suffer those who were here just now, or anyone to speak of it. They come here on the day but they dare not refer to it. Of course, I made no further effort to refer to it. On this day of the year, long before you were born, this heap of decay, stabbing with her crutch stick at the pile of cobwebs on the table, but not touching it, was brought here. It and I have worn away together. The mice have gnawed at it, and sharper teeth than teeth of mice have gnawed at me. She held the head of her stick against her heart as she stood looking at the table, she in her once white dress, all yellow and withered, the once white cloth, all yellow and withered, everything around in a state to crumble under a touch. When the ruin is complete, said she with a ghastly look, and when they lay me dead in my bride's dress on the bride's table, which shall be done and which will be the finished curse upon him, so much the better if it is done on this day. She stood looking at the table as if she stood looking at her own figure lying there. I remained quiet. Estella returned, and she too remained quiet. It seemed to me that we continued thus for a long time, in the heavy air of the room and the heavy darkness that brooded in its remoter corners. 
I even had an alarming fancy that Estella and I might presently begin to decay. At length, not coming out of a distraught state by degrees, but in an instant, Miss Havisham said, Let me see you two play cards. Why have you not begun? With that we returned to her room and sat down as before. I was beggared as before, and again as before. Miss Havisham watched us all the time, directed my attention to Stella's beauty, and made me notice it the more by trying her jewels on Stella's breast and hair. Estella, for her part, likewise treated me as before, except that she did not condescend to speak. When we had played some half-dozen games, a day was appointed for my return, and I was taken down into the yard to be fed in the former dog-like manner. There, too, I was again left to wander about as I liked. It is not much to the purpose whether a gate in that garden wall, which I had scrambled up to peep over on the last occasion, was, on that last occasion, open or shut, enough that I saw no gate then, and that I saw one now. As it stood open, and as I knew that Estella had let the visitors out, for she had returned with the keys in her hand, I strolled into the garden, and strolled all over it. It was quite a wilderness, and there were old melon frames and cucumber frames in it, which seemed in their decline to have produced a spontaneous growth of weak attempts at pieces of old hats and boots, with now and then a weedy offshoot into the likeness of a battered saucepan. When I had exhausted the garden and the greenhouse with nothing in it but a fallen down grapevine and some bottles, I found myself in the dismal corner upon which I had looked out of the window, never questioning for a moment that the house was now empty. I looked at another window and found myself, to my great surprise, exchanging a broad stare with a pale young gentleman with red eyelids and light hair. The pale young gentleman quickly disappeared and reappeared beside me. He had been at his books when I had found myself staring at him, and now that I saw that he was inky. Halloa, said he, young fellow. Halloa being a general observation, which I had usually observed to be best answered by itself, I said, Halloa, politely admitting young fellow. Who let you in? said he, Mrs. Stella. Who gave you leave to prowl about? Mrs. Stella. Come and fight, said the pale young gentleman. What could I do but follow him? I have often asked myself the question since, but what else could I do? His manner was so final, and I was so astonished that I followed where he led, as if I had been under a spell. Stop a minute, though, he said, wheeling round before we had gone many paces. I ought to give you a reason for fighting, too. There it is. In a most irritating manner, he instantly slapped his hands against one another, daintily flung one of his legs up behind him, pulled my hair, slapped his hands again, dipped his head, and butted it into my stomach. The bull-like proceeding last mentioned, besides that it was unquestionably to be regarded in the light of a liberty, was particularly disagreeable just after bread and meat. I therefore hit out at him, and was going to hit out again when he said, Aha, would you? and began dancing backwards and forwards in a manner quite unparalleled within my limited experience. "'Laws of the game,' said he. Here he skipped from his left leg on to his right. "'Regular rules!' Here he skipped from his right leg on to his left. "'Come to the ground and go through the preliminaries.' Here he dodged backwards and forwards, and did all sorts of things while I looked helplessly at him. I was secretly afraid of him when I saw him so dexterous, but I felt morally and physically convinced that his light head of hair could have had no business in the pit of my stomach, and that I had a right to consider it irrelevant when so obtruded on my attention. Therefore I followed him without a word to a retired nook of the garden, formed by the junction of two walls and screened by some rubbish. On his asking me if I was satisfied with the ground, and on my replying yes, he begged my leave to absent himself for a moment, and quickly returned with a bottle of water, and a sponge dipped in vinegar. Available for both, he said, placing these against the wall, and then fell to pulling off not only his jacket and waistcoat, but his shirt too, in a manner at once light-hearted, business-like, and bloodthirsty. Although he did not look very healthy, having pimples on his face, and breaking out of his mouth, these dreadful preparations quite appalled me. I judged him to be about my own age, but he was much taller, and he had a way of spinning himself about that was full of appearance. For the rest he was a young gentleman in a grey suit, when not denuded for battle, 
with his elbows, knees, wrists, and heels considerably in advance of the rest of him, as to development. My heart failed me when I saw him squaring at me with every demonstration of mechanical nicety, and eyeing my anatomy as if he were minutely choosing his bone. I never had been so surprised in my life as I was when I let out the first blow, and saw him lying on his back looking up at me with a bloody nose, and his face exceedingly foreshortened. But he was on his feet directly, and after sponging himself with a great show of dexterity, began squaring again. The second greatest surprise I have ever had in my life was seeing him on his back again, looking up at me out of a black eye. His spirit inspired me with great respect. He seemed to have no strength, and he never once hit me hard, and he was always knocked down, but he would be up again in a moment, sponging himself or drinking out of the water bottle, with the greatest satisfaction in seconding himself according to form, and then came at me with an air and a show that made me believe he was really going to do for me at last. He got heavily bruised, for I am sorry to record that the more I hit him, the harder I hit him. But he came up again and again and again, until at last he got a bad fall with the back of his head against the wall. Even after that crisis in our affairs, he got up and turned round and round confusedly a few times, not knowing where I was, but finally went on his knees to his sponge and threw it up, at the same time panting out, That means you have won. He seemed so brave and innocent that although I had not proposed the contest, I felt but a gloomy satisfaction in my victory. Indeed, I go so far as to hope that I regarded myself while dressing as a species of savage young wolf or other wild beast. However, I got dressed, darkly wiping my sanguinary face at intervals, and I said, can I help you? And he said, No, thank ye. And I said, Good afternoon. And he said, Same to you. When I got into the courtyard, I found Estella waiting with the keys, but she neither asked me where I had been, nor why I had kept her waiting, and there was a bright flush upon her face, as though something had happened to delight her. Instead of going straight to the gate too, she stepped back into the passage and beckoned me. Come here. You may kiss me if you like. I kissed her cheek as she turned it to me. I think I would have gone through a great deal to kiss her cheek, but I felt that the kiss was given to the coarse common boy as a piece of money might have been, and that it was worth nothing. What with the birthday visitors, and what with the cards, and what with the fight, my stay had lasted so long that when I neared home the light on the spit of sand off the point on the marshes was gleaming against a black night sky and Joe's furnace was flinging a path of fire across the road. Chapter 12 My mind grew very uneasy on the subject of the pale young gentleman. The more I thought of the fight and recalled the pale young gentleman on his back, in various stages of puffy and encrimsoned countenance, the more certain it appeared that something would be done to me. I felt that the pale young gentleman's blood was on my head, and that the law would avenge it. Without having any definite idea of the penalties I had incurred, it was clear to me that village boys could not go stalking about the country, ravaging the houses of gentlefolks, and pitching into the studious youth of England, without laying themselves open to severe punishment. For some days I even kept close at home, and looked out of the kitchen door with the greatest caution and trepidation before going on an errand, lest the officers of the county jail should pounce upon me. The pale young gentleman's nose had stained my trousers, and I tried to wash out that evidence of my guilt in the dead of night. I had cut my knuckles against the pale young gentleman's teeth, and I twisted my imagination into a thousand tangles, as I devised incredible ways of accounting for that damnatory circumstance when I should be hailed before the judges. When the day came round for my return to the scene of the deed of violence, my terrors reached their height whether myrmidons of justice, specially sent down from London, would be lying in ambush behind the gate, whether Miss Havisham, preferring to take personal vengeance for an outrage done to her house, might rise in those grave clothes of hers, draw a pistol and shoot me dead, whether suborned boys, a numerous band of mercenaries, might be engaged to fall upon me in the brewery and cuff me until I was no more. 
it was high testimony to my confidence in the spirit of the pale young gentleman that i never imagined him accessory to these retaliations they always came to my mind as the acts of injudicious relatives of his goaded on by the state of his visage and an indignant sympathy with the family features however go to miss havisham's i must and go i did and behold nothing came of the late struggle it was not alluded to in any way and no pale young gentleman was to be discovered on the premises i found the same gate open and i explored the garden and even looked in at the windows of the detached house but my view was suddenly stopped by the closed shutters within and all was lifeless only in the corner where the combat had taken place could i detect any evidence of the young gentleman's existence there were traces of his gore in that spot and i covered them with garden mould from the eye of man on the broad landing between miss havisham's own room and that other room in which the long table was laid out i saw a garden chair a light chair on wheels that you push from behind it had been placed there since my last visit and i entered that same day on a regular occupation of pushing miss havisham in this chair when she was tired of walking with her hand upon my shoulder round her own room and across the landing and around the other room over and over again we would make these journeys and sometimes they would last as long as three hours at a stretch i insensibly fall into a general mention of these journeys as numerous because it was at once settled that i should return every alternate day at noon for these purposes and because i am now going to sum up a period of at least eight or ten months as we began to be more used to one another miss havisham talked more to me and asked me such questions as what i had learned and what i was going to be i told her i was going to be apprenticed to joe i believed and i enlarged upon my knowing nothing and wanting to know everything in the hope she might offer some help towards that desirable end but she did not on the contrary she seemed to prefer my being ignorant neither did she ever give me any money or anything but my daily dinner nor ever stipulate that i should be paid for my services stella was always about and always let me in and out but never told me that i might kiss her again sometimes she would coldly tolerate me sometimes she would condescend to me sometimes she would be quite familiar with me sometimes she would tell me energetically that she hated me miss havisham would often ask me in a whisper or when we were alone does she grow prettier and prettier pip and when i said yes for indeed she did would seem to enjoy it greedily also when we played at cards miss havisham would look on with a miserly relish of estella's moods whatever they were and sometimes when her moods were so many and so contradictory of one another that i was puzzled as what to say or do miss havisham would embrace her with a lavish fondness murmuring something in her ear that sounded like break their hearts my pride and hope break their hearts and have no mercy there was a song joe used to hum fragments of at the forge of which the burden was old clem this was not a very ceremonious way of rendering homage to a patron saint but i believe old clem stood in that relation towards smith's it was a song that imitated the measure of beating upon iron and was a mere lyrical excuse for the introduction of old clem's respected name thus you were to hammer boys around old clem with a thump and a sound old clem beat it out beat it out old clem with a clink for the stout old clem blow the fire blow the fire old clem roaring drier soaring higher old clem one day soon after the appearance of the chair miss havisham suddenly sang to me with the impatient movement of her fingers there 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 sing i was surprised into crooning this ditty as i pushed her over the floor it happened so to catch her fancy that she took it up in a low brooding voice as if she was singing in her sleep after that it became customary with us to have it as we moved about and estella would often join in though the whole strain was so subdued even when there were three of us that it made less noise in the grim old house than the lightest breath of wind what could i become with these surroundings how could my character fail to be influenced by them is it to be wondered at if my thoughts were dazed as my eyes were when i came out into the natural light from the misty yellow rooms perhaps i might have told joe about the pale young gentleman if i had not previously been betrayed 
into those enormous inventions which I had confessed. Under the circumstances, I felt that Joe could hardly fail to discern in the pale young gentleman an appropriate passenger to be put into the black velvet coach. Therefore I said nothing of him. Besides, that shrinking from having Miss Havisham and Estella discussed, which had come upon me in the beginning, grew much more potent as time went on. I reposed complete confidence in no one but Biddy, but I told poor Biddy everything. Why it came natural to me to do so, and why Biddy had a deep concern in everything I told her, I did not know then, though I think I know now. Meanwhile, councils went on in the kitchen at home, fraught with almost insupportable aggravation to my exasperated spirit. That ass Pumblechook used to often come over of a night for the purpose of discussing my prospects with my sister, and I really do believe, to this hour with less penitence than I ought to feel, that if these hands could have taken a linchpin out of his chase cart, they would have done it. The miserable man was a man of that confined stolidity of mind that he could not discuss my prospects without having me before him, as it were, to operate upon, and he would drag me up from my stool, usually by the collar, where I was quiet in a corner, and putting me before the fire as if I was going to be cooked, would begin by saying, Now, Mum, here is this boy, here is this boy which you brought up by hand. Hold up your head, boy, and be for ever grateful unto them which so did do. Now, Mum, with respections to this boy, and then he would rumple my hair the wrong way, which from my earliest remembrance, as already hinted, I have in my soul denied the right of any fellow creature to do, and would hold me before him by the sleeve, a spectacle of imbecility only to be equalled by himself. Then he and my sister would pair off in such nonsensical speculations about Miss Havisham and about what she would do with me and for me, that I used to want, quite painfully, to burst into spiteful tears, fly at Pumbletruck, and pummel him all over. In these dialogues my sister spoke to me as if she were morally wrenching one of my teeth out at every reference, while Pumblechook himself, self-constituted my patron, would sit supervising me with a depreciatory eye, like the architect of my fortunes who thought himself engaged on a very unremunerative job. In these discussions Joe bore no part. But he was often talked at while they were in progress, by reason of Mrs. Joe's perceiving that he was not favourable to my being taken from the forge. I was fully old enough now to be apprenticed to Joe, and when Joe sat with the poker on his knees, thoughtfully raking out the ashes between the lower bars, my sister would so distinctly construe that innocent action into opposition on his part that she would dive at him, take the poker out of his hands, shake him and put it away. There was a most irritating end to every one of these debates. All in a moment, with nothing to lead up to it, my sister would stop herself in a yawn, and catching sight of me, as it were incidentally, would swoop upon me with, Come, there's enough of you. You get along to bed. You've given trouble enough for one night, I hope. As if I had besought them as a favour to bother my life out. We went on in this way for a long time and it seemed likely that we should continue to go on in this way for a long time. When one day Miss Havisham stopped short as she and I were walking, she leaning on my shoulder and said with some displeasure, You are growing tall, Pip. I thought it best to hint through the medium of a meditative look that this might be occasioned by circumstances over which I had no control. She said no more at the time, but she presently stopped and looked at me again, and presently again and after that looked frowning and moody. On the next day of my attendance, when our usual exercise was over, and I had landed at her dressing-table, she stayed me with a movement of her impatient fingers. Tell me the name again of that blacksmith of yours. Joe Gargery, ma'am. Meaning the master you were to be apprenticed to. Yes, Miss Havisham. Would Gargery come here with you and bring your indentures, do you think? I signified that I had no doubt he would take it as an honour to be asked. Then let him come. At any particular time, Miss Havisham? There, there, I know nothing about times. 
let him come soon and come along with you when i got home at night and delivered this message for job my sister went on the rampage in a more alarming degree than any previous period she asked me and joe whether we supposed she was doormats under our feet and how we dared to use her so and what company we graciously thought she was fit for when she had exhausted a torrent of such inquiries she threw a candlestick at joe burst into a loud sobbing got out the dustpan which was always a very bad sign put on her coarse apron and began cleaning up to a terrible extent not satisfied with the dry cleaning she took to a pail and scrubbing brush and cleaned us out of the house and home so that we stood shivering in the back yard it was ten o'clock at night before we ventured to creep in again and then she asked joe why he hadn't married a negress slave at once joe offered no answer poor fellow but stood feeling his whisker and looking dejectedly at me as if he thought it really might have been a better speculation chapter thirteen it was a trial to my feelings on the next day but one to see joe arraying himself in his sunday clothes to accompany me to miss havisham's however as he thought his court suit necessary to the occasion it was not for me to tell him that he looked far better in his working dress the rather because i knew he made himself so dreadfully uncomfortable entirely on my account and that it was for me he pulled up his shirt collar so very high behind that it made the hair on the crown of his head stand up like a tuft of feathers at breakfast time my sister declared her intention of going to town with us and being left at uncle pumblechook's and called for when we had done with our fine ladies a way of putting the case from which joe appeared inclined to augur the worst the forge was shut up for the day and joe inscribed in chalk upon the door as it was his custom to do on the very rare occasions when he was not at work the monosyllable hout accompanied by a sketch of an arrow supposed to be flying in the direction he had taken we walked to town my sister leading the way in a very large beaver bonnet and carrying a basket like the great seal of england in plaited straw a pair of patterns a spare shawl and an umbrella though it was a fine bright day i am not quite clear whether those articles were carried penitentially or ostentatiously but i rather think they were displayed as articles of property much as cleopatra or any other sovereign lady on the rampage might exhibit her wealth in a pageant or procession when we came to pumblechooks my sister bounced in and left us as it was almost noon joe and i held straight on to miss havisham's house estella opened the gate as usual and the moment she appeared joe took his hat off and stood weighing it by the brim in both his hands as if he had had some urgent reason in his mind for being particular to half a quarter of an ounce estella took no notice of either of us but led us the way that i knew so well i followed next to her and joe came last when i looked back at joe in the long passage he was still weighing his hat with the greatest care and was coming after us in long strides on the tips of his toes estella told me we were to both go in so i took joe by the coat cuff and conducted him to miss havisham's presence she was seated at her dressing table and looked round at us immediately oh said she to joe you are the husband of the sister of this boy i could hardly have imagined dear old joe looking so unlike himself or so like some extraordinary bird standing as he did speechless with his tuft of feathers ruffled and his mouth opened as if he wanted a worm you are the husband repeated miss havisham of the sister of this boy it was very aggravating but throughout the interview joe persisted in addressing me instead of miss havisham which i mean to say pip joe now observed in a manner that was at once expressive of forcible argumentation strict confidence and great politeness as i happen married your sister and i were at the same time what you might call if you was any ways inclined a single man well said miss havisham 
and you have reared the boy with the intention of taking him for your apprentice is that so mr gargery you know pip replied joe as you and me were ever friends and it were looked forward and to betwixt us being calculated to lead to larks not but what pip if you had ever made objections to the business such as it being open to black and soot or such like but not what they would have been attended to don't you see has the boy said miss havisham ever made any objection does he like the trade which it is well been to yourself pip returned joe strengthening his former mixture of argumentation confidence and politeness that it were the wish of your own heart i saw the idea suddenly break upon him that he would adapt his epitaph to the occasion before he went on to say and there weren't no objection on your part and pip it were great wish of your heart it was quite in vain for me to endeavour to make him sensible that he ought to speak to miss havisham the more i made faces and gestures to him to do it the more confidential argumentative and polite he persisted in being to me have you brought his indentures with you asked miss havisham well pip you know replied joe as if that were a little unreasonable you yourself see me put em in my hat and therefore you know as they are here with which he took them out and gave them not to miss havisham but to me i am afraid i was ashamed of the dear good fellow i know i was ashamed of him when i saw that estella stood at the back of miss havisham's chair and that her eyes laughed mischievously i took the indentures out of his hand and gave them to miss havisham you expected said miss havisham as she looked them over no premium with the boy joe i remonstrated for he made no reply at all why don't you answer pip returned joe cutting me short as if he were hurt which i mean to say that were it not a question of requiring an answer betwixt yourself and me and which you know the answer to be full well no you know it to be no pip and wherefore should i say it miss havisham glanced at him as if she understood what he really was better than i had thought possible seeing that he was there and took up a little bag from the table beside her pip has earned a premium here she said and here it is there are five and twenty guineas in this bag give it to your master pip as if he were absolutely out of his mind with the wonder awakened in him by her strange figure in the strange room joe even at this pass persisted in addressing me this is wery liberal on your part pip said joe and it is such received and grateful welcome though never looked for far nor near nor nowheres and now old chap said joe conveying to me a sensation first of burning and then of freezing for i felt as if that familiar expression were applied to miss havisham and now old chap may we do our duty may you and me do our duty both on us by one another and by them which your liberal present have conveyed to be for the satisfaction of mind of them as never here joe showed that he felt he had fallen into frightful difficulties until he triumphantly rescued himself with the words and from myself far be it these words had such a round and convincing sound for him that he said them twice good-bye pip said miss havisham let them out estella am i to come again miss havisham i asked no gargery is your master now gargery one word thus calling him back as i went out of the room i heard her say to joe in a distinct emphatic voice the boy has been a good boy here and that is his reward of course as an honest man you would expect no other and no more how joe got out of the room i have never been able to determine but i know that when he did get out he was steadily proceeding up the stairs instead of coming down and was deaf to all remonstrances until i went after him and laid hold of him in another minute we were outside the gate and it was locked and estella was gone when we stood in the daylight alone again joe backed up against a wall and said to me astonishing and there he remained so long saying astonishing at intervals so often that i began to think his senses were never coming back at length he prolonged his remark into pip i do assure you this is as astonishing and so by degrees became conversational and able to walk away 
I have reason to think that Joe's intellects were brightened by the encounter they had passed through, and that on our way to Pumblechooks he invented a subtle and deep design. My reason is to be found in what took place in Mr. Pumblechook's parlour, where on our presenting ourselves, my sister sat in conference with that detested seedsman. Well, cried my sister, addressing us both at once, and what's happened to you? I wonder you condescend to come back to such poor society as this, I am sure I do. Miss Haversham, said Joe, with a fixed look at me, like an effort of remembrance, made it very particular that we should give her, were it compliments or respects, Pip. Compliments, said I. Which that were my own belief, answered Joe, her compliments to Mrs. J. Gargery. Much good they'll do me, observed my sister, but rather gratified too, and wishing pursued Joe, with another fixed look at me, like another effort of remembrance, that the state of Miss Havisham's health were such as would have allowed, were it Pip, of her having the pleasure, I added. Of ladies' company, said Joe, and drew a long breath. Well, cried my sister, with a mollified glance at Mr. Pumblechook, she might have had the politeness to send that message at first, but it's better late than never, and what did she give young ranty Pole here? She give him, said Joe, nothing. Mrs. Joe was going to break out, but Joe went on. What she give, said Joe, she give to his friends, and by his friends were her explanation, I mean into the hands of his sister, Mrs. J. Gargery. Then were her words, Mrs. J. Gargery. She mayn't have knowed, added Joe, with an appearance of reflection, whether it were Joe or George. My sister looked at Pumblechook who smoothed the elbows of his wooden armchair and nodded at her and at the fire, as if he had known about it all beforehand. "'And how much have you got?' asked my sister, laughing, positively laughing. "'What would present company say to ten pound?' demanded Joe. "'They'd say,' returned my sister curtly, "'pretty well. Not too much, but pretty well.' "'It's more than that, then,' said Joe. That fearful impostor Pumblechook immediately nodded and said, as he rubbed the arms of his chair, "'It's more than that, Mum.' "'Why, you don't mean to say,' began my sister. "'Yes, I do, Mum,' said Pumblechook. "'But wait a bit. Go on, Joseph. Go in, you. Go on.' "'What would present company say,' proceeded Joe, "'to twenty pound?' "'Handsome would be the word,' returned my sister. "'Well, then,' said Joe, "'it's more than twenty pound.' That abject hypocrite Pumblechook nodded again, and said, with a patronising laugh, "'It's more than that, Mum. Good again. Follow her up, Joseph.' "'Then to make an end of it,' said Joe, delightedly handing the bag to my sister, "'it's five and twenty pound.' "'It's five and twenty pound, Mum,' echoed that basest of swindlers, Pumblechook, rising to shake hands with her. "'And it's no more than your merits.' as I said when my opinion was asked, and I wish you joy of the money. If the villain had stopped here, his case would have been sufficiently awful, but he blackened his guilt by proceeding to take me into custody, with a right of patronage that left all his former criminality far behind. Now you see, Joseph and wife, said Pumblechook, as he took me by the arm above the elbow, I'm one of them that always go right through with what they've begun. This boy must be bound out of hand. That's my way. Bound out of hand. Goodness knows, Uncle Pumblechook, said my sister, grasping the money. We're deeply beholden to you. Never mind me, Mum, returned that diabolical corn handler. A pleasure's a pleasure, all the world over. But this boy, you know, we must have him bound. I said I'd see to it, to tell you the truth. The justices were sitting in the town hall near at hand, and we at once went over to have me bound apprentice to Joe in the magisterial presence. I say we went over, but I was pushed over by Pumblechook, exactly as if I had the moment picked a pocket or fired a rick. Indeed, it was the general impression in court that I had been taken red-handed, for as Pumblechook shoved me before him through the crowd, I heard some people say, What's he done? and others, He's a young un too, but he looks bad, don't he? One person of mild and benevolent aspect even gave me a tract ornamented with a woodcut of a malevolent young man, 
fitted up with a perfect sausage shop of fetters and entitled to be read in my cell the hall was a queer place i thought with higher pews in it than a church and with people hanging over the pews looking on and with mighty justices one with a powdered head leaning back in chairs with folded arms or taking snuff or going to sleep or writing or reading the newspapers and with some shining black portraits on the walls which my unartistic eye regarded as a composition of hard bake and sticking plaster here in a corner my indentures were duly signed and attested and i was bound mr pumblechook holding me all the while as if we had looked in on our way to the scaffold to have those little preliminaries disposed of when we had come out again and had got rid of the boys who had been put in great spirits by the expectation of seeing me publicly tortured and who were much disappointed to find that my friends were merely rallying round me we went back to pumblechooks and there my sisters became so excited by the twenty-five guineas but nothing would serve her that we must have a dinner out of that windfall at the blue boar and that pumblechook must go over in his chase cart and bring the hubbles and mr wopsle it was agreed to be done and a most melancholy day i passed for it inscrutably appeared to stand to reason in the minds of the whole company that i was an excrescence on the entertainment and to make it worse they all asked me from time to time in short whenever they had nothing else to do why i didn't enjoy myself and what could i possibly do then but say i was enjoying myself when i wasn't however they were grown up and had their own way and they made the most of it that swindling pumblechook exalted into the beneficent contriver of the whole occasion actually took the top of the table and when he had addressed them on the subject of my being bound and had fiendishly congratulated them on my being liable to imprisonment if i played at cards drank strong liquors kept late hours or bad company or indulged in any other vagaries which the form of my indentures appeared to contemplate as next to inevitable he placed me standing on a chair beside him to illustrate his remarks my only other remembrances of the great festival are that they wouldn't let me go to sleep but whenever they saw me dropping off woke me up and told me to enjoy myself that rather late in the evening mr wopsle gave us collins ode and threw his blood-stained sword in thunder down with such effect that a waiter come in and said the commercials underneath sent up their compliments and it wasn't the tumblers arms that they were all in excellent spirits on the road home and sang o oh lady fair mr wopsle taking the bass and asserting with a tremendously strong voice in reply to the inquisitive bore who leads that piece of music in a most impertinent manner by wanting to know all about everybody's private affairs that he was the man with his white locks flowing and that he was upon the whole the weakest pilgrim going finally i remember that when i got into my little bedroom I was truly wretched and had a strong conviction on me that I should never like Joe's trade. I had liked it once, but once was not now. Chapter 14 It is a most miserable thing to feel ashamed of home. There may be black ingratitude in the thing, and the punishment may be retributive and well deserved, but that it is a miserable thing I can testify home had never been a very pleasant place to me because of my sister's temper but joe had sanctified it and i had believed in it i had believed in the best parlour as a most elegant saloon i had believed in the front door as a mysterious portal of the temple of state whose solemn opening was attended with a sacrifice of roast fowls i had believed in the kitchen as a chaste though not magnificent apartment I had believed in the forge as the glowing road to manhood and independence. Within a single year all this was changed. Now it was all coarse and common, and I would not have had Miss Havisham and Estella see it on any account. How much of my ungracious condition of mind may have been my own fault, how much Miss Havisham's, how much my sister's, is now of no moment to me or to anyone. The change was made in me, the thing was done. 
Once it had seemed to me that when I should at last roll up my shirt-sleeves and go into the forge, Joe's prentice, I should be distinguished and happy. Now the reality was in my hold. I only felt that I was dusty with the dust of small coal, and that I had a weight upon my daily remembrance to which the anvil was a feather. There have been occasions in my later life, I suppose as in most lives, when I have felt for a time as if a thick curtain had fallen on all its interest and romance, to shut me out from anything save dull endurance any more. Never has that curtain dropped so heavy and blank as when my way in life lay stretched out straight before me through the newly entered road of apprenticeship to Joe. I remember that at a later period of my time I used to stand about the churchyard on Sunday evenings when night was falling, comparing my own perspective with the windy marsh view, and making out some likeness between them by thinking how flat and low both were, and how on both there came an unknown way, and a dark mist, and then the sea. I was quite as dejected on the first working day of my apprenticeship as in that after-time, but I am glad to know that I never breathed a murmur to Joe while my indentures lasted. It is about the only thing I am glad to know of myself in that connection. For though it includes what I proceed to add, all the merit of what I proceed to add was Joe's. It was not because I was faithful, but because Joe was faithful that I never ran away and went for a soldier or a sailor. It was not because I had a strong sense of the virtue of industry, but because Joe had a strong sense of the virtue of industry, that I worked with tolerable zeal against the grain, it is not possible to know how far the influence of any amiable, honest-hearted, duty-doing man flies out into the world, but it is very possible to know how it is touch oneself in going by. And I know right well that any good intermixed itself with my apprenticeship came of plain, contented Joe and not of restlessly aspiring, discontented me. What I wanted, who can say? How can I say, when I never knew? What I dreaded was that in some unlucky hour, being at my grimiest and commonest, I should lift up my eyes and see Estella looking in at one of the wooden windows of the forge. I was haunted by the fear that she would sooner or later find me out, with a black face and hands, doing the coarsest part of my work and would exult over me and despise me. Often after dark, when I was pulling the bellows for Joe, and we were singing Old Clem, and when the thought of how we used to sing it at Miss Havisham's would seem to show me Estella's face in the fire, with her pretty hair fluttering in the wind, and her eyes scorning me. Often at such a time I would look towards those panels of black night in the wall, which the wooden windows then were, and would fancy that I saw her just drawing her face away and would believe that she had come at last. After that, when we went into supper, the place and the meal would have a more homely look than ever, and I would feel more ashamed of home than ever, in my own ungracious breast. Chapter 15 As I was getting too big for Mr. Wopsle's great-aunt's room, my education under that preposterous female terminated. Not, however, until Biddy had imparted to me everything she knew, from the little catalogue of prices to a comic song she had once bought for a halfpenny. Although the only coherent part of the latter piece of literature were the opening lines, When I went to London town, sirs, tooroo lull, tooroo lull, wasn't I done very brown, sirs, tooroo roll, tooroo roll. Still, in my desire to be wiser, I got this composition by heart with the utmost gravity, nor do I recollect that I questioned its merit except that I thought, as I still do, the amount of two rolls somewhat in excess of the poetry. In my hunger for information, I made proposals to Mr. Wopsall to bestow some intellectual crumbs upon me, with which he kindly complied. As it turned out, however, that he only wanted me for a dramatic lay figure, to be contradicted and embraced and wept over and bullied and clutched and stabbed and knocked about in a variety of ways. I soon declined that course of instruction, though not until Mr. Wopsall in his poetic fury had severely mauled me. 
Whatever I acquired, I try to impart to Joe. This statement sounds so well that I cannot in my conscience let it pass unexplained. I wanted to make Joe less ignorant and common, that he might be worthier of my society, and less open to Estella's reproach. The old battery out on the marshes was our place of study, and a broken slate and a short piece of slate pencil were our educational implements, to which Joe always added a pipe of tobacco. I never knew Joe to remember anything from one Sunday to another, or to acquire under my tuition any piece of information whatsoever. Yet he would smoke his pipe at the battery with a far more sagacious air than anywhere else, even with a learned air, as if he considered himself to be advancing immensely. Dear fellow, I hope he did. It was pleasant and quiet out there with the sails on the river passing beyond the earthwork, and sometimes when the tide was low, looking as if they belonged to sunken ships that were still sailing on at the bottom of the water. Whenever I watched the vessels standing out to sea with their white sails spread, I somehow thought of Miss Havisham and Estella, and whenever the light struck a slant afar off upon a cloud or a sail or a green hillside or waterline, it was just the same. Miss Havisham and Estella and the strange house and the strange life appeared to have something to do with everything that was picturesque. One Sunday, when Joe, greatly enjoying his pipe, had so plumed himself on being most awful dull that I have given him up for the day, I lay on the earthwork for some time with my chin on my hand, descrying traces of Miss Havisham and Estella all over the prospect, in the sky and in the water, until at last I resolved to mention a thought concerning them that had been much in my head. Joe, said I, don't you think I ought to make Miss Havisham a visit? Well, Pip, returned Joe, slowly considering. What for? What for, Joe? What is any visit made for? There are some visits, perhaps, said Joe, as forever remains open to the question, Pip. But in regard to visiting Miss Havisham, she might think you wanted something, expected something of her. Don't you think I might say that I did not, Joe? You might, old chap, said Joe. And she might credit it. Similarly, she mightn't. Joe felt, as I did, that he had made a point there, and he pulled hard at his pipe to keep himself from weakening it by repetition. You see, Pip, Joe pursued as soon as he was past that danger, Miss Havisham done the handsome thing by you. When Miss Havisham done the handsome thing by you, she called me back to say to me, as that were all. Yes, Joe, I heard her. All! Joe repeated very emphatically. Yes, Joe, I tell you, I heard her. Which I mean to say, Pip, it might be that her meaning were, make an end on it, as you was, me to the north, you to the south, keep in sunders. I had thought of that too, and it was very far from comforting to me to find that he had thought of it, for it seemed to render it more probable. But Joe, yes, old chap, here am I getting on in the first year of my time, and since the day of my being bound, I have never thanked Miss Havisham, or asked after her, or shown that I remember her. That's true, Pip, and unless you was to turn her out a set of shoes all four round, and which I mean to say as even set of shoes as all four round might not be acceptable as a present, in a total vacancy of hooves. I don't mean that sort of remembrance, Joe. I don't mean a present. But Joe had got the idea of a present in his head, and must harp upon it. Or even, said he, if you was helped to knockin' her up a new chain for the front door, or say a grocer to a shark-headed screws for general use, or some like fancy article such as a toasting fork when she took her muffins, or a gridiron when she took a sprat or such like. I don't mean any present at all, Joe, I interposed. Well, said Joe, still harping on as though I had particularly pressed it. If I was yourself, Pip, I wouldn't. No, I would not. For what's a door chain when she's got one always up? And Sharkheaders is open to misrepresentations. And if it was a toasting fork, you'd go into brass and do yourself no credit. And the uncommonest workman can't show himself uncommon in a gridiron, for a gridiron is a gridiron, said Joe steadfastly, impressing it upon me as if he were endeavouring to rouse me from a fixed delusion. 
and you may aim at what you like but a gridiron it will come out either by your leave or again your leave and you can't help yourself my dear joe i cried in desperation taking hold of his coat don't go on in that way i never thought of making miss havisham any present no pip joe assented as if he had been contending for that all along and what i say to you is you are right pip yes joe but what i wanted to say was that as we are rather slack just now if you would give me a half holiday tomorrow i think i would go up town and make a call on mrs St havisham which her name said joe gravely ain't esther havisham pip unless she had been rechristened i know joe i know it was a slip of mine what do you think of it joe in brief joe thought that if i had thought well of it he thought well of it but he was particular in stipulating that if i were not received with cordiality or if i were not encouraged to repeat my visit as a visit which had no ulterior object but was simply one of gratitude for a favour received then this experimental trip should have no successor by these conditions i promised to abide now joe kept a journeyman at weekly wages whose name was orlick he pretended that his christian name was dolger a clear impossibility but he was a fellow of that obstinate disposition that i believe him to have been the prey of no delusion in this particular but wilfully to have imposed that name upon the village as an affront to its understanding he was a broad-shouldered loose-limbed swarthy fellow of great strength never in a hurry and always slouching he never even seemed to come to his work on purpose but would slouch in as if by mere accident and when he went to the jolly bargeman to eat his dinner or went away at night he would slouch out like cain or the wandering jew as if he had no idea where he was going and no intention of ever coming back he lodged at a sluice keeper's out on the marshes and on working days would come slouching in from his hermitage with his hands in his pockets and his dinner loosely tied in a bundle round his neck dangling on his back on sundays he mostly lay all day in the sluice gates or stood against the ricks and barns he always slouched locomotively with his eyes on the ground and when accosted or otherwise required to raise them he looked up in a half resentful half puzzled way as though the only thought he ever had was that it was rather odd and injurious fact that he should never be thinking this morose journeyman had no liking for me when i was very small and timid he gave me to understand that the devil lived in a black corner of the forge and that he knew the fiend very well also that it was necessary to make up the fire once in seven years with a live boy and that i might consider myself fuel when i became joe's prentice all it was perhaps confirmed in some suspicion that i should displace him howbeit he liked me still less not that he ever said anything or did anything openly importing hostility i only noticed that he always beat his sparks in my direction and that whenever i sang old clem he came in out of time dolge orlick was at work and present next day when i reminded joe of my half holiday he said nothing at the moment for he and joe had just got a piece of hot iron between them and was at the bellows but by and by he said leaning on his hammer now master sure you're not going to favour only one of us if young pip has a half holiday do as much for old orlick i suppose he was about five and twenty but he usually spoke of himself as an ancient person why what'll you do with half holiday if you get it said joe what i'll do with it what he do with it i'll do as much with it as him said orlick as to pip he's going up town said joe well then as to old orlick he's going up town retorted that worthy two can go up town tain't the only one what can go up town don't lose your temper said joe shall if i like growled orlick some in their uptowning now master come no favouring in this shop be a man the master refusing to entertain the subject until the journeyman was in a better temper orlick plunged at the furnace drew out a red-hot bar made at me with it as if he were going to run it through my body whisked it round my head laid it on the anvil hammered it out as if it were i i thought and the sparks were my spurting blood and finally said when he had hammered himself hot and the iron cold and again he leaned on his hammer now master are you all right now demanded joe i'm all right said gruff old horlick 
then as in general you stick to your work as well as most men said joe let it be a half holiday for all my sister had been standing silent in the yard within hearing she was a most unscrupulous spy and listener and she instantly looked in at one of the windows like you you fool she said to joe giving holidays to great idle hulkers like that you're a rich man upon my life to waste wages in that way i wish i was his master you'd be everybody's master if you durst retorted Horlick with an ill-favoured grin let her alone said joe i'd be a match for all noodles and all rogues returned my sister beginning to work herself into a mighty rage and i couldn't be a match for the noodles without being a match for your master who's the dunder-headed king of all the noodles and i couldn't be a match for the rogues without being a match for you who are the blackest looking and the worst rogue between this and france now you're a foul shrew mother gargery growled the journeyman if that makes a judge of rogues you ought to be a good un let her alone will you said joe what did you say cried my sister beginning to scream what did you say what did that fellow all say to me pip what did he say to me with my husband standing by oh 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 each of these exclamations was a shriek and i must remark of my sister what is equally true of all the violent women i have ever seen that passion was no excuse for her because it is undeniable that instead of lapsing into passion she consciously and deliberately took extraordinary pains to force herself into it and became blindly furious by regular stages what was the name he gave to me before that base man who swore to defend me oh hold me oh ah growled the journeyman between his teeth i'd hold you if you was me wife i'd hold you under the pump and choke it out of you i tell you let her alone said joe oh to hear him cried my sister with a clap of her hands and a scream together which was her next stage to hear the names he's giving me that all in my own house me a married woman with my husband standing by oh oh here my sister after a fit of clappings and screamings beat her hands upon her bosom and upon her knees and threw her cap off and pulled her hair down which were the last stages on our road to frenzy being by this time a perfect fury and a complete success she made a dash at the door which i had fortunately locked what could the wretched joe do now after his disregarded parenthetical interruptions but stand up to his journeyman and ask him what he meant by interfering betwixt himself and mrs joe and further whether he was a man enough to come on old orlick felt that the situation admitted of nothing less than coming on and was on his defence straight away so without so much as putting off their singed and burnt aprons they went at one another like two giants but if any man in that neighbourhood could stand up long against joe i never saw the man orlick as if he had been of no more account than the pale young gentleman was very soon among the coal dust and in no hurry to come out of it then joe unlocked the door and picked up my sister who had dropped insensible at the window but who had seen the fight first i think and who was carried into the house and laid down and who was recommended to revive and would do nothing but struggle and clench her hands in joe's hair then came that singular calm and silence which succeeds all uproars and then with the vague sensation which i have always connected with such a lull namely that it was sunday and somebody was dead i went upstairs to dress myself when i came down again i found joe and orlick sweeping up without any other traces of discomposure than a slit in one of horlick's nostrils which was neither expressive nor ornamental a pot of beer had appeared from the jolly bargeman and they were sharing it by turns in a peaceable manner the lull had a sedative and philosophical influence on joe who followed me out into the road to say as a parting observation that might do me good on a rampage pip and off the rampage pip such is life with what absurd emotions for we think the feelings that are very serious in a man quite comical in a boy i found myself again going to miss havisham's matters little here nor how i passed and repassed the gate many times before i could make up my mind to ring nor how i debated whether i should go away without ringing nor how i should have undoubtedly have gone if my time had been my own to come back miss sarah pocket came to the gate no estella how then 
"'You here again?' said Miss Pocket. "'What do you want?' When I said that I only came to see how Miss Havisham was, Sarah evidently deliberated whether or no she should send me about my business, but unwilling to hazard the responsibility, she let me in, and presently brought the sharp message that I was to come up. Everything was unchanged, and Miss Havisham was alone. Well, said she, fixing her eyes upon me, I hope you want nothing, you'll get nothing. No, indeed, Miss Havisham, I only wanted you to know that I am doing very well in my apprenticeship, and I am always much obliged to you. There, there, with the old restless fingers, come now and then, come on your birthday. Ay, she cried suddenly, turning herself in her chair towards me. You are looking round for Estella, hey? I had been looking round, in fact, for Estella, and I stammered that I hoped she was well. Abroad, said Miss Havisham educating for a lady far out of reach, prettier than ever, admired by all who see her. Did you feel that you have lost her? There was such a malignant enjoyment in her utterance of the last words, and she broke into such a disagreeable laugh that I was at a loss what to say. She spared me the trouble of considering by dismissing me. When the gate was closed upon me by Sarah of the walnut-shell countenance, I felt more than ever dissatisfied with my home and my trade and with everything, and that was all I took by that motion. As I was loitering along the high street, looking in disconsolately at the shop windows, and thinking what I would buy if I were a gentleman, who should come out of the bookshop but Mr. Wopsle? Mr. Wopsle had in his hand the affecting tragedy of George Barnwell, in which he had at that moment invested sixpence, with the view of heaping every word of it upon the head of Pumblechook, with whom he was going to drink tea. No sooner did he see me than he appeared to consider that a special providence had put a prentice in his way to be read at, and he laid hold of me and insisted on my accompanying him to the Pumblechukian parlour. As I knew it would be miserable at home, and as the nights were dark and the way was dreary, and almost any companionship on the road was better than none, I made no great resistance. Consequently, we turned into Pumblechooks just as the street and the shops were lighting up. As I never assisted at any other representation of George Barnwell, I don't know how long it may usually take, but I know very well that it took until half-past nine o'clock that night, and that when Mr. Wopsle got into Newgate, I thought he would never go to the scaffold. He became so much slower than at any former period of his disgraceful career. I thought it a little too much that he should complain of being cut short in his flower after all, as if he had not been running to seed, leaf after leaf, ever since his course began. This, however, was a mere question of length and wearisomeness. What stung me was the identification of the whole affair with my unoffending self. When Barnwell began to go wrong, I declared that I felt positively apologetic. Pumblechook's indignant stare so taxed me with it, Wopsle, too, took pains to present me in the worst light. At once ferocious and maudlin, I was made to murder my uncle with no extenuating circumstances whatever. Millwood put me down in argument on every occasion. It became sheer monomania on my master's daughter to care a button for me, and all I can say from my gasping and procrastinating conduct on the fatal morning is that it was very worthy of the general feebleness of my character. Even after I was happily hanged and Wopsle had closed the book, Pumblechook sat staring at me and shaking his head and saying, Take a warning, boy, take a warning, as if it were a well-known fact that I contemplated murdering a near relation, provided I could only induce one to have the weakness to become my benefactor. It was a very dark night when it was all over, and when I set out with Mr. Wopsle on the walk home beyond town, we found a heavy mist out, and it fell wet and thick. The turnpike lamp was a blur, quite out of the lamp's usual place, apparently, and its rays looked solid substance on the fog. We were noticing this and saying how that the mist rose with a change of wind from a certain quarter of our marshes, when we came upon a man slouching under the lee of the turnpike house. Holloa, we said, stopping. Horlick there? Ah, he answered, slouching out. I was standing by a minute on the chance of company. You are late, I remarked. Orlick not unnaturally answered. Well, and you're late. 
We have been, said Mr. Wopsle, exalted with his late performance. We have been indulging, Mr. Orlick, in an intellectual evening. Old Orlick growled as if he had nothing to say about that, and we all went on together. I asked him presently whether he had been spending his half-holiday up and down town. Yes, said he, all of it. I come in behind yourself. I didn't see you, but I must have been pretty close behind you. By the by, the guns is going again. At the hulks, said I. Ay, there's some of the birds flown from the cages. The guns have been going since dark about. You'll hear one presently. In effect, we had not walked many yards further when the well-remembered boom came towards us, deadened by the mist, and heavily rolled away along the low grounds by the river, as if it were pursuing and threatening the fugitives. A good night for cutting off in, said Orlick. We'd be puzzled how to bring down a jailbird on the wing to-night. The subject was a suggestive one to me, and I thought about it in silence. Mr. Wopsle, as the ill-requited uncle of the evening's tragedy, fell to meditating aloud in his garden at Camberwell. Orlick, with his hands in his pockets, slouched heavily at my side. It was very dark, very wet, very muddy, and so we splashed along. Now and then the sound of the signal cannon broke upon us again and again rolled sulkily along the course of the river. I kept myself to myself and my thoughts. Mr. Wopsall died amiably at Camberwell, and exceedingly game on Bosworth Field, and in the greatest agonies at Glastonbury. Orlick sometimes growled, Beat it out, beat it out, old Clem, with a clink for the stout old Clem. I thought he had been drinking, but he was not drunk. Thus we came to the village. The way by which we approached it took us past the three jolly bargemen, which we were surprised to find, it being eleven o'clock, in a state of commotion, with the door wide open, and unwanted lights that had been hastily caught up and put down scattered about. Mr. Wopsall dropped in to ask what was the matter, surmising that a convict had been taken, but came running out in a great hurry. "'There's something wrong,' said he, without stopping. "'Up at your place, Pip. Run all!' "'What is it?' I asked, keeping up with him. So did Orlick at my side. "'I can't quite understand. The house seems to have been violently entered when Joe Gargery was out. Supposed by convicts. Somebody has been attacked and hurt. We were running too fast to admit of more being said, and we made no stop until we got into our kitchen. It was full of people. The whole village was there, or in the yard, and there was a surgeon, and there was Joe, and there were a group of women, all on the floor in the midst of the kitchen. The unemployed bystanders drew back when they saw me, and so I became aware of my sister, lying without sense or movement on the bare boards where she had been knocked down by a tremendous blow on the back of the head, dealt by some unknown hand when her face was turned towards the fire, destined never to be on the rampage again while she was the wife of Joe. CHAPTER Sixteen. With my head full of George Barnwell, I was at first disposed to believe that I must have had some hand in the attack upon my sister, or at all events that as her near relation, popularly known to be under obligations to her, I was a more legitimate object of suspicion than any one else. But when, in the clearer light of next morning, I began to reconsider the matter, and to hear it discussed around me on all sides, I took another view of the case, which was more reasonable. Joe had been at the Three Jolly Bargemen, smoking his pipe from a quarter after eight o'clock to a quarter before ten. While he was there my sister had been seen standing at the kitchen door, and had exchanged good night with a farm labourer going home. The man could not be more particular as to the time which he saw her. He got into dense confusion when he tried to be than it must have been before nine. When Joe went home at five minutes before ten, he found her struck down on the floor, and promptly called in assistance. The fire had not then burnt unusually low, nor was the snuff of the candle very long. The candle, however, had been blown out. Nothing had been taken away from any part of the house, neither beyond the blowing out of the candle, which stood on a table between the door and my sister, and was behind her when she stood facing the fire and was struck. 
was there any disarrangement of the kitchen excepting such as she herself had made in falling and bleeding but there was one remarkable piece of evidence on the spot she had been struck with something blunt and heavy on the head and spine after the blows were dealt something heavy had been thrown down at her with considerable violence as she lay on her face and on the ground beside her when joe picked her up was a convict's leg iron which had been filed asunder now joe examining this iron with a smith's eye declared it to have been filed asunder some time ago the hue and cry going off to the hulks and people coming thence to examine the iron joe's opinion was corroborated they did not undertake to say when it had left the prison ships to which it undoubtedly had once belonged but they claimed to know for certain that that particular manacle had not been worn by either of the two convicts who had escaped last night further one of those two was already retaken and he had not freed himself of his iron knowing what i knew i set up an inference of my own here i believe the iron to be my convict's iron the iron i had seen and heard him filing at on the marshes but my mind did not accuse him of having put it to its latest use for i believed one of two other persons to have become possessed of it and to have turned it to this cruel account either orlick or the strange man who had shown me the file now as to orlick he had gone to town exactly as he told us when we picked him up at the turnpike he had been seen about town all the evening he had been in diverse companies in several public houses and he had come back with myself and mr wopsle there was nothing against him save the quarrel and my sister had quarrelled with him and with everybody else about her ten thousand times as to the strange man if he had come back for his two banknotes there could have been no dispute about them because my sister was fully prepared to restore them besides there had been no altercation the assailant had come in so silently and suddenly that she had been felled before she could look round it was horrible to think that i had provided the weapon however undesignedly but i could hardly think otherwise i suffered unspeakable trouble when i considered and reconsidered whether i should at last dissolve that spell of my childhood and tell joe all the story for months afterwards i every day settled the question finally in the negative and reopened and re-argued it next morning the contention came after all to this the secret was such an old one now had so grown into me and become a part of myself that i could not tear it away in addition to the dread that having led up to so much mischief it would now be more likely than ever to alienate joe from me if he believed it i had a further restraining dread that he would not believe it but would assort it with the fabulous dogs and veal cutlets as a monstrous invention however i temporized with myself of course for i was not wavering between right and wrong when the thing is always done and resolved to make a full disclosure if i should see any such new occasion as a new chance of helping in the discovery of the assailant the constables and the bow street men from london for this happened in the days of the extinct red waistcoated police were about the house for a week or two and did pretty much what i have heard and read of like authorities doing in other such cases they took up several obviously wrong people and they ran their heads very hard against wrong ideas and persisted in trying to fit the circumstances to the ideas instead of trying to extract ideas from the circumstances also they stood about the door of the jolly bargeman with knowing and reserved looks that filled the whole neighborhood with admiration and they had a mysterious manner of taking their drink that was almost as good as taking the culprit but not quite for they never did it long after these constitutional powers had dispersed my sister lay very ill in bed her sight was disturbed so that she saw objects multiplied and grasped at visionary teacups and wine glasses instead of the realities her hearing was greatly impaired her memory also and her speech was unintelligible when at last she came round so far as to be helped downstairs it was still necessary to keep my slate always by her that she might indicate in writing what she could not indicate in speech as she was very bad handwriting apart 
a more than indifferent speller, and as Joe was a more than indifferent reader, extraordinary complications arose between them, which I was always called in to solve. The administration of mutton instead of medicine, the substitution of tea for Joe, and the baker for bacon were among the mildest of my own mistakes. However, her temper was greatly improved, and she was patient. A tremulous uncertainty of the action of all her limbs soon became a part of a regular state, and afterwards at intervals of two or three months she would often put her hands to her head, and would then remain for about a week at a time in some gloomy aberration of mind. We were at a loss to find a suitable attendant for her, until a circumstance happened conveniently to relieve us. Mr. Wopsle's great-aunt conquered a confirmed habit of living into which she had fallen, and Biddy became a part of our establishment. It may have been about a month after my sister's reappearance in the kitchen, when Biddy came to us with a small speckled box containing the whole of her worldly effects, and became a blessing to the household. Above all she was a blessing to Joe, for the dear old fellow was sadly cut up by the constant contemplation of the wreck of his wife, and had been accustomed while attending on her of an evening, to turn to me every now and then and say, with his blue eyes moistened, such a fine figure of a woman as she once were, Pip. Biddy, instantly taking the cleverest charge of her, as though she had studied her for an infancy, Joe became able in some sort to appreciate the greater quiet of his life, and to get down to the jolly bargeman now and then, for a change that did him good. It was a characteristic of the police people that they had all the more or less suspected poor Joe, though he never knew it, and that they had had to a man concurred in regarding him as one of the deepest spirits they had ever encountered. Biddy's first triumph in her new office was to solve a difficulty that had completely vanquished me. I had tried hard at it, but had made nothing of it. Thus it was, again and again and again, my sister had traced upon the slate a character that looked like a curious T, and then with the utmost eagerness had called our attention to it as something that she particularly wanted. I had in vain tried everything producible that began with a T, from tar to toast and tub. At length it had come into my head that the sign looked like a hammer, and on my lustily calling that word in my sister's ear, she began to hammer on the table and had expressed a qualified assent. Thereupon I had brought in all our hammers, one after another, but without avail. Then I bethought me of a crutch, the shape being much the same, and I borrowed one in the village, and displayed it to my sister with considerable confidence. But she shook her head, to that extent when she was shown it, that we were terrified lest in her weak and shattered state she should dislocate her neck. When my sister found that Biddy was very quick to understand her, this mysterious sign reappeared on the slate. Biddy looked thoughtfully at it, heard my explanation, looked thoughtfully at my sister, looked thoughtfully at Joe, who was always represented on the slate by his initial letter, and ran into the forge, followed by Joe and me. "'Why, of course!' cried Biddy, with an exultant face. "'Don't you see? It's him!' Orlick, without a doubt. She had lost his name and could only signify him by his hammer. We told him why we wanted him to come into the kitchen, and he slowly laid down his hammer, wiped his brow with his arm, took another wipe at it with his apron, and came slouching out, with a curious loose vagabond bend in the knees that strongly distinguished him. I confess that I expected to see my sister denounce him and that I was disappointed by the different result. She manifested the greatest anxiety to be on good terms with him, was evidently much pleased by his being at length produced, and motioned that she would have given him something to drink. She watched his countenance as if she were particularly wishful to be assured that he took kindly to his reception. She showed every possible desire to conciliate him, and there was an air of humble propitiation in all she did such as I have never seen pervade the bearing of a child towards a hard master. After that day, a day rarely passed without her drawing the hammer on her slate, and without Orlick slouching in and standing doggedly before her, 
as if he knew no more than I did what to make of it. Chapter 17 I now fell into a regular routine of apprenticeship life, which has varied beyond the limits of the village and the marshes, by no more remarkable circumstances than the arrival of my birthday and my paying another visit to Miss Havisham. I found Miss Sarah Pocket still on duty at the gate. I found Miss Havisham just as I had left her, and she spoke of Estella in the very same way, if not in the very same words. The interview lasted but a few minutes, and she gave me a guinea when I was going, and told me to come again on my next birthday. I may mention at once that this became an annual custom. I tried to decline taking the guinea on the first occasion, but with no better effect than causing her to ask me very angrily if I expected more. Then, after that, I took it. So unchanging was the dull old house, the yellow light in the darkened room, the faded spectre in the chair by the dressing-table glass, that I felt as if the stopping of the clocks had stopped time in that mysterious place, and while I and everything else outside it grew older, it stood still. Daylight never entered the house as to my thoughts and remembrances of it, any more than as to the actual fact. It bewildered me, and under its influence I continued at heart to hate my trade and be ashamed of home. Imperceptibly, I became conscious of a change in Biddy. However, her shoes came up at the heel, her hair grew bright and neat, her hands were always clean. She was not beautiful. She was common and could not be like Estella, but she was pleasant and wholesome and sweet-tempered. She had not been with us more than a year. I remember her being newly out of mourning at the time, it struck me when I observed to myself one evening that she had curiously thoughtful and attentive eyes, eyes that were very pretty and very good. It came of my lifting up my own eyes from a task I was poring at, writing some passages from a book to improve myself in two ways at once by a sort of stratagem, and seeing Biddy observant of what I was about. I laid down my pen, and Biddy stopped in her needlework without laying it down. Biddy, said I, how do you manage it? Either I am very stupid or you are very clever. What is it that I manage? I don't know, returned Biddy, smiling. She managed our whole domestic life, and wonderfully too. But I did not mean that, though that made what I did mean more surprising. How do you manage, Biddy, said I, to learn everything that I learn and always to keep up with me? I was beginning to be rather vain of my knowledge for I spent my birthday guineas on it and set aside the greater part of my pocket money for similar investment, though I have no doubt now that the little I knew was extremely dear at the price. I might as well ask you, said Biddy, how you manage. No, because when I come in from the forge of a night, anyone can see me turning to at it, but you never turn to at it, Biddy. I suppose I must catch it like a cough, said Biddy quietly, and went on with her sewing. Pursuing my idea, as I leaned back in my wooden chair and looked at Biddy sewing away with her head on one side, I began to think her rather an extraordinary girl, for I call to mind now that she was equally accomplished in the terms of our trade and the names of our different sorts of work and our various tools. In short, whatever I knew, Biddy knew. Theoretically, she was already as good a blacksmith as I, or better. You are one of those, Biddy, said I, who make the most of every chance. You never had a chance before you came here, and see how improved you are. Biddy looked at me for an instant, and went on with her sewing. I was your first teacher, though, wasn't I? said she as she sewed. Biddy, I exclaimed in amazement. Why, you are crying. No, I'm not, said Biddy, looking up and laughing. What put that in your head? What could have put it in my head but the glistening of a tear as it dropped on her work? I sat silent, recalling what a drudge she had been, until Mr. Wopsle's great aunt successfully overcome that bad habit of living, so highly desirable to got rid of by some people, I recalled the hopeless circumstances by which she had been surrounded in the miserable little shop and the miserable little noisy evening school, with that miserable old bundle of incompetence always to be dragged and shouldered. I reflected that even in those untoward times there must have been 
latent in Biddy what was now developing, for in my first uneasiness and discontent I had turned to her for help as a matter of course. Biddy sat quietly sewing, shedding no more tears, and while I looked at her and thought about it, it occurred to me that perhaps I had not been sufficiently grateful to Biddy. I might have been too reserved, and should have patronised her more, though I did not use that precise word in my meditations, with my confidence. Yes, Biddy, I observed, when I had done turning it over, you were my first teacher, and that at a time when we little thought of ever being together like this in this kitchen. Ah, poor thing, replied Biddy. It was like her self-forgetfulness to transfer the remark to my sister and to get up and be busy about her, making her more comfortable. That's sadly true. Well, said I, we must talk together a little more, as we used to do. And I must consult you a little more, as I used to do. Let us have a quiet walk on the marshes next Sunday, Biddy, and a long chat. My sister was never left alone now, but Joe more than readily undertook the care of her on that Sunday afternoon and Biddy and I went out together. It was summer time and lovely weather. When we had passed the village and the church in the churchyard, and we were out on the marshes, and I began to see the sails of the ships as they sailed on, I began to combine Miss Havisham and Estella with the prospect in my usual way. When we came to the riverside and sat down on the bank with the water rippling at our feet, making it all the more quiet than it would have been without that sound, I resolved that it was a good time and place for the admission of Biddy into my inner confidence. Biddy, said I, after binding her to secrecy, I want to be a gentleman. Oh, I wouldn't if I was you, she returned. I don't think it would answer. Biddy, said I, with some severity, I have particular reasons for wanting to be a gentleman. You know best, Pip, but don't you think you are happier as you are? Biddy, I exclaimed impatiently, I am not at all happy as I am. I am disgusted with my calling and with my life. I have never taken to either since I was bound. Don't be absurd. Was I absurd, said Biddy quietly, raising her eyebrows? I'm sorry for that. I didn't mean to be. I only want you to do well and to be comfortable. Well, understand once and for all that I never shall or can be comfortable or anything but miserable. There, Biddy unless I can lead a very different sort of life from the life I lead now. That's a pity, said Biddy, shaking her head with a sorrowful air. Now I too had often thought it a pity that in the singular kind of quarrel with myself which I was always carrying on, I was half inclined to shed tears of vexation and distress when Biddy gave utterance to her sentiment and my own. I told her she was right and I knew it was much to be regretted, but still it was not to be helped. If I could have settled down, I said to Biddy, plucking up the short grass within reach, much as I had once upon a time pulled my feelings out of my hair and kicked them into the brewery wall, if I could have settled down and been but half as fond of the forge as I was when I was little, I know it would have been much better for me. You and I and Joe would have wanted nothing then, and Joe and I would have perhaps gone partners when I was out of my time and I might even have grown up to keep company with you, and we might have sat on this very bank on a fine Sunday, quite different people. I should have been good enough for you, shouldn't I, Biddy? Biddy sighed as she looked at the ship sailing on, and returned for answer, Yes, I'm not over particular. It scarcely sounded flattering, but I knew she meant well. Instead of that, said I, plucking up more grass and chewing a blade or two, See how I am going on, dissatisfied and uncomfortable, and what would it signify to me being coarse and common if nobody had told me so? Biddy turned her face towards mine and looked far more attentively at me than she had looked at the sailing ships. It was neither a very true nor a very polite thing to say, she remarked, directing her eyes to the ships again. Who said it? I was disconcerted, for I had broken away without quite seeing where I was going to. It was not to be shuffled off now, however, and I answered, The beautiful young lady at Miss Havisham's, and she's more beautiful than anybody ever was, and I admire her dreadfully, and I want to be a gentleman on her account. Having made this lunatic confession, I began to throw my torn-up grass into the river, as if I had some thoughts of following it. 
Do you want to be a gentleman to spite her, or to gain her over? Biddy quietly asked me after a pause. I don't know, I moodily answered. Because if it's to spite her, Biddy pursued, I should think, but you know best, that might be better and more independently done by caring nothing for her words. And if it's to gain her over, I should think, but you know best, she was not worth gaining over. Exactly what myself had thought many times, exactly what was perfectly manifest to me at this moment. But how could I, a poor dazed village lad, avoid that wonderful inconsistency into which the best and wisest of men fall every day? It may be all quite true, said I to Biddy, but I admire her dreadfully. In short, I turned over on my face when I came to that, and got a good grasp on the hair on each side of my head, and wrenched it well, all the while knowing the madness of my heart to be so very mad and misplaced, that I was quite conscious that it would have served my face right if I had lifted it up by my hair and knocked it against the pebbles as a punishment for belonging to such an idiot. Biddy was the wisest of girls, and she tried to reason no more with me. She put her hand, which was a comfortable hand, though roughened by work, upon my hands one after another, and gently took them out of my hair. Then she softly patted my shoulder in a soothing way, while with my face upon my sleeve I cried a little, exactly as I had done in the brewery yard, and felt vaguely convinced that I was very much ill-used by somebody, or by everybody, I can't say which. I'm glad of one thing, said Biddy, and that is that you have felt you could give me your confidence, Pip. And I am glad of another thing, and that is that, of course, you know you may depend upon my keeping it, and always so far deserving it. If your first teacher, dear, such a poor one, and so much in need of being taught herself, had been your teacher at the present time, she thinks she knows what lessons she would set, but it would be a hard one to learn, and you have got beyond her, and it's of no use now. So with a quiet sigh for me, Biddy rose from the bank and said, with a fresh and pleasant change of voice, Shall we walk a little further, or go home? Biddy, I cried, getting up, putting my arm around her neck and giving her a kiss. I shall always tell you everything. Till you're a gentleman, said Biddy. You know I never shall be, so that's always. Not that I have any occasion to tell you anything, for you know everything I know, as I told you at home the other night. Ah, said Biddy, quite in a whisper, as she looked away at the ships, and then repeated with her former pleasant change, Shall we walk a little further, or go home? I said to Biddy we would walk a little further, and we did so, and the summer afternoon toned down into the summer evening, and it was very beautiful, and I began to consider whether I was not more naturally and wholesomely situated, after all, in these circumstances, than playing beggar my neighbour, by candlelight in the room with the stopped clocks, and being despised by Estella. I thought it would be very good for me if I could get her out of my head with all the rest of those remembrances and fancies, and could go to work determined to relish what I had to do, and stick to it, and make the best of it. I asked myself the question whether I did not surely know that if Estella were beside me at that moment instead of Biddy, she would make me miserable. I was obliged to admit that I did not know it for a certainty, and I said to myself, Pip, what a fool you are. We talked a good deal as we walked, and all that Biddy said seemed right. Biddy was never insulting or capricious, or Biddy today and somebody else tomorrow. She would have derived any pain and no pleasure from giving me pain. She would far rather have wounded her own breast than mine. How could it be then that I did not like her much the better of the two? Biddy, said I, when we were walking homeward, I wish you could put me right. I wish I could, said Biddy. If I could only get myself to fall in love with you, you don't mind me speaking so openly to such an old acquaintance. Oh dear, not at all, said Biddy, don't mind me. If I could only get myself to do it, that would be the thing for me. But you never will, you see, said Biddy. It did not appear quite so unlikely to me that evening, as it would have done if we had discussed it a few hours before. Therefore I observed I was not quite sure of that. But Biddy said she was, and she said it decisively. In my heart I believed her to be right, and yet I took it rather ill too that she should be so positive on the point. 
when we came near the churchyard we had to cross an embankment and get over a stile near a sluice gate there started up from the gate or from the rushes or from the ooze which was quite in his stagnant way old orlick halloa he growled where are you two going where should we be going but home well then said he i'm jiggered if i don't see you home this penalty of being jiggered was a favourite suppositious case of his he attached no definite meaning to the word that i am aware of but used it like his own pretended christian name to affront mankind and convey an idea of something savagely damaging when i was younger i had a general belief that if he had jiggered me personally he would have done it with a sharp and twisted hook biddy was much against his going with us and said to me in a whisper don't let him come i don't like him as i did not like him either i took the liberty of saying we thanked him but we didn't want seeing home he received that piece of information with a yell of laughter and dropped back but came slouching after us at a little distance curious to know whether biddy suspected him of having had a hand in that murderous attack of which my sister had never been able to give any account i asked her why she did not like him oh she replied glancing over her shoulder as he slouched after us because i i'm afraid he likes me did he ever tell you he liked you i asked indignantly no said biddy glancing over her shoulder again he never told me so but he dances at me whenever he can catch my eye however novel and peculiar this testimony of attachment i did not doubt the accuracy of the interpretation it was very hot indeed upon old orlick's daring to admire her as hot as if it were an outrage on myself but it makes no difference to you you know said biddy calmly no biddy it makes no difference to me only i don't like it i don't approve of it nor i either said biddy though that makes it no difference to you exactly said i but i must tell you that i should have no opinion of you biddy if he danced at you with your own consent i kept an eye on orlick after that night and whenever circumstances were favourable to his dancing at biddy i got before him to obscure that demonstration he had struck root in joe's establishment by reason of my sister's sudden fancy for him or i should have tried to get him dismissed he quite understood and reciprocated my good intentions as i had reason to know thereafter and now because my mind was not confused enough before i complicated its confusion fifty thousandfold by having states and seasons when i was clear that biddy was immeasurably better than estella and that the plain honest working life to which i was born had nothing in it to be ashamed of but offered me sufficient means of self-respect and happiness at those times i would decide conclusively that my disaffection to dear old joe and the forge was gone and that i was growing up in a fair way to be partners with joe and to keep company with biddy when all in a moment some confounding remembrance of the havisham days would fall upon me like a destructive missile and scatter my wits again scattered wits take a long time picking up and often before i had got them well together they would be dispersed in all directions by one stray thought that perhaps after all miss havisham was going to make my fortune when my time was out if my time had run out it would have left me still at the height of my perplexities i dare say it never did run out however but was brought to a premature end as i proceed to relate chapter eighteen it was in the fourth year of my apprenticeship to joe and it was a saturday night there was a group assembled round the fire at the three jolly bargemen attentive to mr wopsle as he read the newspaper aloud of that group i was one a highly popular murder had been committed and mr wopsle was imbrued in blood to the eyebrows he gloated over every abhorrent objective in the description and identified himself with every witness at the inquest he faintly moaned i am done for as the victim and he barbarously bellowed i'll serve you out as the murderer he gave the medical testimony in pointed imitation of our local practitioner and he piped and shook as the aged turnpike keeper who had heard blows to an extent so very paralytic as to suggest a doubt regarding the mental competency of that witness 
The coroner in Mr. Wopsle's hands became Timon of Athens, the beadle Corellianus. He enjoyed himself thoroughly, and we all enjoyed ourselves, and were delightfully comfortable. In this cosy state of mind we came to the verdict, willful murder. Then, and not sooner, I became aware of a strange gentleman leaning over the back of the settle opposite me, looking on. There was an expression of contempt on his face, and he bit the side of a great forefinger as he watched the group of faces. Well, said the stranger to Mr. Wopsle when the reading was done, you have settled it to all your own satisfaction, I have no doubt. Everybody started and looked up, as if it were the murderer. He looked at everybody coldly and sarcastically. Guilty, of course, said he. Out with it, come. Sir, returned Mr. Wopsle, without having the honour of your acquaintance, I do say guilty. Upon this we all took courage to unite in a confirmatory murmur. I know you do, said the stranger. I knew you would, I told you so, but now I'll ask you a question. Do you know, or do you not know, that the law of England supposes every man to be innocent until he is proved, proved to be guilty? Sir, Mr. Wopsle began to reply. As an Englishman myself, I come, said the stranger, biting his forefinger at him. Don't evade the question. Either you know it or you don't know it. Which is it to be? He stood with his head on one side and himself on one side in a bullying, interrogative manner and he threw his forefinger at Mr. Wopsle, as it were, to mark him out before biting it again. Now, said he, do you know it, or don't you know it? Certainly I know it, replied Mr. Wopsle. Certainly you know it, then. Why didn't you say so at first? Now I'll ask you another question, taking possession of Mr. Wopsle as if he had a right to him. Do you know that none of these witnesses have yet been cross-examined? Mr. Wopsle was beginning, I can only say, when the stranger stopped him, what? You won't answer the question, yes or no? Now I'll try you again, throwing his finger at him again. Attend to me. Are you aware, or are you not aware, that none of these witnesses have yet been cross-examined? Come, I only want one word for you, yes or no? Mr. Wopsle hesitated, and we all began to conceive a rather poor opinion of him. Come, said the stranger, I'll help you. You don't deserve help, but I'll help you. Look at that paper you hold in your hand. What is it? What is it? repeated Mr. Wopsle, eyeing it much at a loss. Is it? pursued the stranger in his most sarcastic and suspicious manner. The printed paper you have just been reading from. Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. Now turn to that paper and tell me whether it distinctly states that the prisoner expressly said that his legal advisers instructed him altogether to reserve his defence. I read that just now, Mr. Wopsle pleaded. Never mind what you read just now, sir. I don't ask what you read just now. You may read the Lord's Prayer backwards, if you like, and perhaps have done it before today. Turn to the paper. No, no, my friend. Not to the top of the column. You know better than that. To the bottom. To the bottom. We all began to think, Mr. Wopsle, full of subterfuge. Well, have you found it? Here it is, said Mr. Wopsle. Now follow that passage with your eye, and tell me whether it distinctly states that the prisoner expressly said that he was instructed by his legal advisers wholly to reserve his defence. Come, do you make that of it? Mr. Wopsle answered, those are not the exact words. Not the exact words, repeated the gentleman bitterly. Is that the exact substance? Yes, said Mr. Wopsle. Yes, repeated the stranger, looking round at the rest of the company, with his right hand extended towards the witness, Wopsle. And now I ask you what you say to the conscience of that man, who with that passage before his eyes, can lay his head upon his pillow, after having pronounced a fellow creature guilty, unheard. We all began to suspect that Mr. Wopsle was not the man we had thought him, and that he was beginning to be found out. And that same man, remember, pursued the gentleman, throwing his finger at Mr. Wopsle heavily, that same man might be summoned as a juryman upon this very trial, and having thus deeply committed himself, might return to the bosom of his family and lay his head upon his pillow, after deliberately swearing that he would well and truly try the issue joined between our sovereign lord the king and the prisoner at the bar, and would a true verdict give according to the evidence, so help him God. 
We were all deeply persuaded that the unfortunate Wopsle had gone too far, and had better stop in his reckless career while there was yet time. The strange gentleman, with an air of authority not to be disputed, and with a manner expressive of knowing something secret about every one of us, that would effectually do for each individual if he chose to disclose it, left the back of the settle and came into the space between the two settles in front of the fire, where he remained standing, his left hand in his pocket, and he biting the forefinger of his right. From information I have received, said he, looking round at us, we all quailed before him. I have reason to believe there is a blacksmith among you by name of Joseph, or Joe Gargery. Which is the man? Here is the man, said Joe. The strange gentleman beckoned him out of his place, and Joe went. You have an apprentice, pursued the stranger, commonly known as Pip. Is he here? I am here, I cried. The stranger did not recognise me, but I recognised him as the gentleman I had met on the stairs on the occasion of my second visit to Miss Havisham. I had known him the moment I saw him looking over the settle, and now that I stood confronting him with his hand upon my shoulder, I checked off again in detail his large head, his dark complexion, his deep-set eyes, his bushy black eyebrows, his large watch-chain, his strong black dots of beard and whisker, and even the smell of scented soap on his great hand. I wish to have a private conference with you two, said he, when he had surveyed me at his leisure. It will take a little time. Perhaps we had better go to your place of residence. I prefer not to anticipate my communication here. You will impart as much or as little of it as you please to your friends afterwards. I have nothing to do with that. Amidst a wandering silence, we three walked out of the Jolly Bargeman, and in a wandering silence walked home. While going along, the strange gentleman occasionally looked at me and occasionally bit the side of his finger. As we neared home, Joe, vaguely acknowledging the occasion as an impressive and ceremonious one, went on ahead to open the front door. Our conference was held in the state parlour, which was feebly lighted by one candle. It began with the strange gentleman sitting down at the table, drawing the candle to him, and looking over some entries in his pocket-book. He then put up the pocket-book and set the candle a little aside, after peering round it into the darkness at Joe and me, to ascertain which was which. "'My name,' he said, "'is Jaggers, and I am a lawyer in London. I am pretty well known. I have unusual business to transact with you, and I commence by explaining that it is not of my originating. If my advice had been asked, I should not have been here. It was not asked, and you see me here. What I have to do, as the confidential agent of another, I do. No less, no more. Finding that he could not see us very well from where he sat, he got up and threw one leg over the back of a chair, and leaned upon it, thus having one foot on the seat of the chair, and one foot on the ground. Now, Joseph Gargery, I am the bearer of an offer to relieve you of this young fellow, your apprentice. You would not object to cancel his indentures at his request and for his good. You would want nothing for so doing. Lord forbid that I should want anything for not standing in Pip's way, said Joe, staring. Lord forbidding is pious, but not to the purpose, returned Mr. Jaggers. The question is, would you want anything? Do you want anything? The answer is, returned Joe sternly, no. I thought Mr. Jaggers glanced at Joe, as if he considered him a fool for his disinterestedness, but I was too much bewildered between breathless curiosity and surprise to be sure of it. Very well, said Mr. Jaggers. Recollect the admission you have made, and don't try to go from it presently. Who's a-going to try? retorted Joe. I don't say anybody is. Do you keep a dog? Yes, I do keep a dog. Bear in mind, then, that Bragg is a good dog, but Holdfast is a better. Bear in mind, will you, repeated Mr. Jaggers, shutting his eyes and nodding his head at Joe, as if he were forgiving him something. Now I return to this young fellow, and the communication I have got to make is that he has great expectations. Joe and I gasped and looked at one another. I am instructed to communicate to him, said Mr. Jaggers, throwing his finger at me sideways, 
that he will come into a handsome property. Further, that it is the desire of the present possessor of that property that he should be immediately removed from his present sphere of life and from this place and be brought up as a gentleman, in a word, as a young fellow of great expectations. My dream was out. My wild fancy was surpassed by sober reality. Miss Havisham was going to make my fortune on a grand scale. Now, Mr. Pip, pursued the lawyer, I address the rest of what I have to say to you. You are to understand, first, that it is the request of the person from whom I take my instructions, that you always bear the name of Pip. You will have no objection, I dare say, to your great expectations being encumbered with that easy condition. But if you have any objection, this is the time to mention it. My heart was beating so fast, and there was such a singing in my ears, that I could scarcely stammer. I had no objection. I should think not. Now you are to understand, secondly, Mr. Pip, that the name of the person who is your liberal benefactor remains a profound secret until the person chooses to reveal it. I am empowered to mention that it is the intention of the person to reveal it at first hand by word of mouth to yourself. When or where that intention may be carried out, I cannot say. No one can say. It may be years hence. Now you are distinctly to understand that you are most positively prohibited from making any inquiry on this head or any allusion or reference, however distant, to any individual whomsoever as the individual in all the communications you may have with me. If you have suspicion in your own breast, keep that suspicion in your own breast. It is not the least to the purpose what reasons of this prohibition are. They may be the strongest and gravest reasons, or they may be mere whim. This is not for you to inquire into. The condition is laid down. Your acceptance of it and your observance of it as binding is the only remaining condition that I am charged with by the person from whom I take my instructions, and for whom I am not otherwise responsible. That person is the person from whom you derive your expectations, and the secret is solely held by that person and by me. Again, not a very difficult condition with which to encumber such a rise in fortune. But if you have any objection to it, this is the time to mention it. Speak out. Once more I stammered with difficulty that I had no objection. I should think not. Now, Mr. Pip, I have done with stipulations. Though he called me Mr. Pip and began rather to make up to me, he still could not get rid of a certain air of bullying suspicion, and even now he occasionally shut his eyes and threw his finger at me while he spoke as much to express that he knew all kind of things to my disparagement, if he only choose to mention them. We come next to mere details of arrangement. You must know that although I have used the term expectations more than once, you are not endowed with expectations only. There was already lodged in my hands a sum of money amply sufficient for your suitable education and maintenance. You will please consider me your guardian. Oh for I was going to thank him. I tell you at once, I am paid for my services, or I shouldn't render them. It is considered that you must be better educated, in accordance with your altered position, and that you will be alive to the importance and necessity of at once entering on that advantage. I said I had always longed for it. Never mind what you have always longed for, Mr. Pip, he retorted. Keep to the record. If you long for it now, that's enough. Am I answered that you are ready to be placed at once under some proper tutor? Is that it? I stammered, yes, that was it. Good. Now your inclinations are to be consulted. I don't think that wise, mind, but it's my trust. Have you ever heard of any tutor whom you would prefer to another? I had never heard of any tutor but Biddy and Mr. Wopsle's great aunt. So I replied in the negative. There is a certain tutor of whom I have some knowledge who I think might suit the purpose said Mr. Jaggers. I don't recommend him, observe, because I never recommend anybody. The gentleman I speak of is one Mr. Matthew Pocket. Ah, I caught at the name directly. Miss Havisham's relation, the Matthew whom Mr. and Mrs. Camilla had spoken of, the Matthew whose place was to be at Miss Havisham's head when she lay dead in her bride's dress on the bride's table. 
you know the name said mr jaggers looking shrewdly at me and then shutting up his eyes while he waited for my answer my answer was that i had heard of the name oh said he you have heard of the name but the question is what do you say of it i said or i tried to say that i was much obliged to him for his recommendation no my young friend he interrupted shaking his great head very slowly recollect yourself not recollecting myself i began again that i was much obliged to him for his recommendation no my young friend he interrupted shaking his head and frowning and smiling both at once no 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 it's very well done but it won't do you are too young to fix me with it recommendation is not the word mr pip try another correcting myself i said that i was much obliged to him for his mention of mr matthew pocket that's more like it cried mr jaggers and i added i would gladly try that gentleman good you'd better try him up at his own house the way shall be prepared for you and you can see his son first who is in london when will you come up to london i said glancing at joe who stood looking on motionless that i supposed i could come directly first said mr jaggers you should have some new clothes to come in and they should not be working clothes say this day week you'll want some money shall i leave you twenty guineas he produced a long purse with the greatest coolness and counted them out on the table and pushed them over to me this was the first time he had taken his leg from the chair he sat astride of the chair when he had pushed the money over and sat swinging his purse and eyeing joe well joseph gargery you look dumbfoundered i am said joe in a very decided manner it was understood that you wanted nothing for yourself remember it were understood said joe and it are understood and it ever will be similar according but what said mr jaggers swinging his purse what if it was in my instructions to make you a present as a compensation as compensation for what joe demanded for the loss of his services joe laid his hand upon my shoulder with the touch of a woman i have often thought of him since like the steam hammer that can crush a man or pat an eggshell in his combination of strength with gentleness pip is that hearty welcome said joe to go free with his services to honour and fortune as no words can tell him but if you think as money can make compensation to me for the loss of the little child what come to the forge and ever the best of friends oh dear good joe whom i was so ready to leave and so unthankful to i see you again with your muscular blacksmith's arms before your eyes and your broad chest heaving and your voice dying away oh dear good faithful tender joe i feel the loving tremble of your hand upon my arm as solemnly this day as if it had been the rustle of an angel's wing but i encouraged joe at the time i was lost in the mazes of my future fortunes and I could not retrace the bypaths we had trodden together. I begged Joe to be comforted, for, as he said, we had ever been the best of friends, and, as I said, we ever would be so. Joe scooped his eyes with his disengaged wrist, as if he were bent on gouging himself, but said not another word. Mr. Jaggers had looked on at this as one who recognised in Joe the village idiot, and in me his keeper. When it was over, he said, weighing in his hand the purse he had ceased to swing, Now, Joseph Gargery, I warn you this is your last chance. No half measures with me. If you mean to take a present that I have it in charge to make you, speak out, and you shall have it. If on the contrary you mean to say, Here, to his great amazement, he was stopped by Joe suddenly working round him with every demonstration of a fell pugilistic purpose which i mean or say cried joe that if you come into my place bull-baiting and badgering me come out which i mean to say such as if you're a man come on which i mean to say what i say i mean to say and stand by or fall by i drew joe away and he immediately became placable merely stating to me in an obliging manner and as a polite expostulatory notice to any one whom it might happen to concern that he were not going to be bull-baited and badgered in his own place. Mr. Jaggers had risen when Joe demonstrated, and had backed near the door, 
without evincing any inclination to come in again. Here he delivered his valedictory remarks. They were these. Well, Mr. Pip, I think the sooner you leave here, as you are to be a gentleman, the better. Let it stand for this day week, and you shall receive my printed address in the meantime. You can take a hackney coach at the stagecoach office in London, and come straight to me. Understand that I express no opinion one way or another on the trust I undertake. I am paid for undertaking it, and I do so now. Now understand that, finally. Understand that. He was throwing his finger at both of us, and I think would have gone on, but for his seeming to think Joe dangerous and going off. Something came into my head which induced me to run after him as he was going down to the Jolly Bargeman, where he had left a hired carriage. I beg your pardon, Mr. Jaggers. Halloa, said he, facing round. What's the matter? I wish to be quite right, Mr. Jaggers, and to keep to your directions. So I thought I had better ask. Would there be any objection to my taking leave of anyone I know about here before I go away? No, said he, looking as if he hardly understood me. I don't mean in the village only, but up town. No, said he, no objection. I thanked him and ran home again, and there I found that Joe had already locked the front door and vacated the state parlour and was seated by the kitchen fire, with a hand on each knee, gazing intently at the burning coals. I too sat down before the fire and gazed at the coals, and nothing was said for a long time. My sister was in her cushioned chair in her corner, and Biddy sat at her needlework before the fire, and Joe sat next Biddy, and I sat next Joe in the corner opposite my sister. The more I looked into the glowing coals, the more incapable I became of looking at Joe. The longer the silence lasted, the more unable I felt to speak. At length I got out. Joe, have you told Biddy? No, Pip, returned Joe, still looking at the fire, and holding his knees tight as if he had private information that they intended to make off somewhere. Which I left it to yourself, Pip. I would rather you told, Joe. Pip's a gentleman of fortune, then, said Joe, and God bless him in it. Biddy dropped her work and looked at me. Joe held his knees and looked at me. I looked at both of them. After a pause, they both heartily congratulated me. But there was a certain touch of sadness in their congratulations that I rather resented. I took it upon myself to impress Biddy, and through Biddy, Joe, with the grave obligation I considered my friends under, to know nothing and say nothing about the maker of my fortune. It would all come out in good time, I observed, and in the meanwhile nothing was to be said, save that I had come into great expectations from a mysterious patron. Biddy nodded her head thoughtfully at the fire as she took up her work again, and said she would be very particular, and Joe, still detaining his knees, said, Aye, aye, I'll be cleverly particular, Pip. Then they congratulated me again, and went on to express so much wonder at the notion of my being a gentleman, that I didn't half like it. Infinite pains were then taken by Biddy to convey to my sister some idea of what had happened. To the best of my belief, those efforts entirely failed. She laughed and nodded her head a great many times, and even repeated after Biddy the words, Pip, and property, but I doubt they had more meaning in them than an election cry. I cannot suggest a darker picture of her state of mind. I never could have believed it without experience, but as Joe and Biddy became more at their cheerful ease again, I became quite gloomy. Dissatisfied with my fortune? Of course I could not be, but it is possible that I may have been, without quite knowing it, dissatisfied with myself. Anyhow, I sat with my elbow on my knee and my face upon my hand, looking into the fire as those two talked about my going away, and about what they should do without me, and all that. And whenever I caught one of them looking at me, though never so pleasantly, and they often looked at me, particularly Biddy, I felt offended, as if they were expressing some mistrust of me, although heaven knows they never did by word or sign. At those times I would get up and look out at the door, for our kitchen door opened at once upon the night, and stood open on summer evenings to air the room. 
the very stars to which i then raised my eyes i am afraid i took to be but poor and humble stars for glittering on the rustic objects among which i had passed my life saturday night said i when we sat at our supper of bread and cheese and beer five more days and then the day before the day they'll go soon yes pip observed joe whose voice sounded hollow in his beer mug they'll soon go soon soon go said biddy i have been thinking joe that when i go down town on monday and order my new clothes i shall tell the tailor that i'll come and put them on there or that i'll have them sent to mr pumblechooks it would be very disagreeable to be stared at by all the people here mr and mrs hubble might like to see you in your new genteel figure too pip said joe industriously cutting his bread with his cheese on it in the palm of his left hand and glancing at my untasted supper as if he thought of the time when we used to compare slices so might wopsle and the jolly bargeman might take it as a compliment that's just what i don't want joe they would make such a business of it such a coarse and common business that i couldn't bear myself ah that indeed pip said joe if you couldn't a bear yourself biddy asked me here as she sat holding my sister's plate have you thought about when you'll show yourself to mr gargery and your sister and me you will show yourself to us won't you biddy i returned with some resentment you are so exceedingly quick that it is difficult to keep up with you she always were quick observed joe if you had waited another moment biddy you would have heard me say that i should bring my clothes here in a bundle one evening most likely on the evening before i go away biddy said no more handsomely forgiving her i soon exchanged an affectionate good-night with her and joe and went up to bed when i got into my little room i sat down and took a long look at it as a mean little room that i should soon be parted from and raised above for ever it was furnished with fresh young remembrances too and even at the same moment i fell into much the same confused division of mind between it and the better rooms to which i was going as i had been in so often between the forge and miss havisham's and biddy and estella the sun had been shining brightly all day on the roof of my attic and the room was warm as i put the window open and stood looking out i saw joe come slowly forth at the dark door below and take a turn or two in the air then i saw biddy come and bring him a pipe and light it for him he never smoked so late and it seemed to hint to me that he wanted comforting for some reason or another he presently stood at the door immediately beneath me smoking his pipe and biddy stood there too quietly talking to him and i knew that they talked of me for i heard my name mentioned in an endearing tone by both of them more than once i would not have listened for more if i could have heard more so i drew away from the window and sat down in my one chair by the bedside feeling it very sorrowful and strange that this first night of my bright fortunes should be the loneliest i had ever known looking towards the open window i saw light wreaths from joe's pipe floating there and i fancied it was like a blessing from joe not obtruded on me or paraded before me but pervading the air we shared together i put my light out and crept into bed and it was an uneasy bed now and i never slept the old sound sleep in it any more chapter nineteen morning made a considerable difference in my general prospect of life and brightened it so much that it scarcely seemed the same what lay heaviest on my mind was the consideration that six days intervened between me and the day of departure for i could not divest myself of a misgiving that something might happen to london in the meanwhile and that when i got there it would be either greatly deteriorated or clean gone joe and biddy were very sympathetic and pleasant when i spoke of our approaching separation but they only referred to it when i did after breakfast joe brought out my indentures from the press in the best parlour and we put them in the fire and i felt that i was free with all the novelty of my emancipation on me i went to church with joe and thought perhaps the clergyman wouldn't have read about the rich man and the kingdom of heaven if he had known all after our early dinner i strolled out alone proposing to finish off the marshes at once and to get them done with as i passed the church i felt 
as I had felt during service in the morning, a sublime compassion for the poor creatures who were destined to go there Sunday after Sunday, all their lives through, and to lie obscurely at last amongst the low green mounds. I promised myself that I would do something for them one of these days, and formed a plan in outline for bestowing a dinner of roast beef and plum pudding, a pint of ale and a gallon of condescension upon everybody in the village. I had often thought before, with something allied to shame, of my companionship with the fugitive who I had once seen limping among those graves. What were my thoughts on this Sunday when the place recalled the wretch ragged and shivering with his felon iron and badge? My comfort was that it happened a long time ago, and that he had doubtless been transported a long way off, and that he was dead to me, and might be veritably dead into the bargain. No more low wet grounds, no more dikes and sluices, no more of these grazing cattle, though they seemed in their dull manner to wear a more respectful air now, and to face round in order that they might stare as long as possible at the possessor of such great expectations. Farewell, monotonous acquaintances of my childhood. Henceforth I was for London and greatness, not for Smith's work in general, and for you I made my exultant way to the old battery, and lying down there to consider the question whether Miss Havisham intended me for Estella, fell asleep. When I awoke I was much surprised to find Joe sitting beside me, smoking his pipe. He greeted me with a cheerful smile on my opening my eyes, and said, as being the last time, Pip, I thought I'd follow her, and Joe, I'm very glad you did so. Thank ye, Pip. You may be sure, dear Joe, I went on, after we had shaken hands, that I shall never forget you. No, no, Pip, said Joe in a comfortable tone. I'm sure of that. Aye, aye, old chap, bless you. It were only necessary to get it well round a man's mind to be certain on it. But it took a bit of time to get well round. The change came so uncommon plump, didn't it? Somehow I was not best pleased with Joe's being so mightily secure of me. I should have liked him to have betrayed emotion, or to have said, It does you credit, Pip, or something of the sort. Therefore I made no remark on Joe's first head, merely saying as to his second that the tidings had indeed come suddenly, but that I had always wanted to be a gentleman, and had often and often speculated on what I would do if I were one. Have you, though? said Joe. Astonishing! It's a pity now, Joe, said I, that you did not get on a little more when we had our lessons here, isn't it? Well, I don't know, returned Joe. I'm so awful dull. I'm only master of my own trade. It was always a pity I was so awful dull. But it's no more of a pity now than it was this day twelve months, don't you see? What I had meant was that when I came into my property and was able to do something for Joe, it would have been much more agreeable if he had been better qualified for a rise in station. He was so perfectly innocent of my meaning, however, that I thought I would mention it to Biddy in preference. So when we had walked home and had tea, I took Biddy into our little garden by the side of the lane, and after throwing out in a general way for the elevation of her spirits that I should never forget her, I said I had a favour to ask of her. And it is Biddy said I, that you will not omit any opportunity of helping Joe on a little. How helping him on? asked Biddy, with a steady sort of glance. Well, Joe is a dear good fellow, in fact. I think he's the dearest fellow that ever lived. But he is rather awkward in some things. For instance, Biddy, in his learning and his manners. Although I was looking at Biddy as I spoke, and although she opened her eyes very wide when I had spoken, she did not look at me. Oh, his manners. Won't his manners do, then? asked Biddy, plucking a black currant leaf. My dear Biddy, they do very well here. Oh, they do very well here, interrupted Biddy, looking closely at the leaf in her hand. Hear me out. But if I were to remove Joe into a higher sphere, as I shall hope to remove him when I fully come into my property, they would hardly do him justice. And don't you think he knows that? asked Biddy. It was such a very provoking question for it had never in the most distant manner occurred to me, that I said snappishly, Biddy, what do you mean? Biddy, having rubbed the leaf into pieces between her hands, and the smell of a black currant bush has ever since recalled me to that evening in the little garden by the side of the lane, said, Have you never considered that he may be proud? Proud? 
I repeated with disdainful emphasis. Oh, there are many kinds of pride, said, said Biddy, looking full at me and shaking her head. Pride is not all of one kind. Well, what are you stopping for? I said. Not all of one kind, resumed Biddy. He may be too proud to let anyone take him out of a place that he is competent to fill, and fills it well and with respect. To tell you the truth, I think he is, though it sounds bold in me to say so, for you must know him far better than I do. Now, Biddy, said I, I am very sorry to see this in you. I did not expect to see this in you. You are envious, Biddy, and grudging. You are dissatisfied on account of my rise in fortune, and you can't help showing it. If you have the heart to think so, returned Biddy, say so. Say over and over again, if you have the heart to think so. If you have the heart to be so, you mean, Biddy, said I in a virtuous and superior tone. Don't put it off upon me. I am very sorry to see it. And it's a, a bad side of human nature. I did intend to ask you to use any little opportunities you might have, after I was gone, of improving dear Joe. But after this I ask you nothing. I am extremely sorry to see this in you, Biddy, I repeated. It's a bad side of human nature. Whether you scold me or approve of me, returned poor Biddy, you may equally depend upon my trying to do all that lies in my power, here at all times, and whatever opinion you take away of me shall make no difference in my remembrance of you. Yet a gentleman should not be unjust neither, said Biddy, turning away her head. I again warmly repeated that it was a bad side of human nature, in which sentiment, waiving its application, I have since seen reason to think I was right. And I walked down the little path away from Biddy, and Biddy went into the house, and I went out at the garden gate and took a dejected stroll until supper time, again feeling it very sorrowful and strange that this, the second night of my bright fortunes, should be as lonely and unsatisfactory as the first. But morning once more brightened my view, and I extended my clemency to Biddy, and we dropped the subject. Putting on the best clothes I had, I went into town as early as I could hope to find the shops open, and presented myself before Mr. Trabb, the tailor, who was having his breakfast in the parlour behind his shop, and who did not think it worth his while to come out to me, but called me in to him. Well, said Mr. Trabb, in a hail fellow, well met kind of way. How are you, and what can I do for you? Mr. Trabb had sliced his hot roll into three feather beds, and was slipping butter in between the blankets and covering it up. He was a prosperous old bachelor, and his open window looked into a prosperous little garden and orchard, and there was a prosperous iron safe let into the wall at the side of his fireplace, and I did not doubt that heaps of his prosperity were put away in it in bags. Mr. Trabb, said I, it's an unpleasant thing to have to mention, because it looks like boasting. But I have come into a handsome property. A change passed over Mr. Trabb. He forgot the butter in bed, got up from the bedside, wiped his fingers on the tablecloth, exclaiming, Lord bless my soul! I'm going up to my guardian in London, said I, casually drawing some guineas out of my pocket and looking at them, and I want a fashionable suit of clothes to go in. I wish to pay for them, I added, otherwise I thought he might only pretend to make them, with ready money. My dear sir, said Mr. Trabb, as he respectfully bent his body, opened his arms, and took the liberty of touching me on the outside of each elbow, don't hurt me by mentioning that. May I venture to congratulate you? Would you do me the favour of stepping into the shop? Mr. Trabb's boy was the most audacious boy in all that countryside. When I had entered, he was sweeping the shop, and he had sweetened his labours by sweeping over me. He was still sweeping when I came out into the shop with Mr. Trabb, and he knocked the broom against all possible corners and obstacles, to express, as I understood it, equality with any blacksmith alive or dead. Hold that noise, said Mr. Trabb with the greatest sternness, or I'll knock your head off. Do me the favour to be seated, sir. Now this, said Mr. Trabb, taking down a roll of cloth, and tidying it out in a flowing manner over the counter, preparatory to getting his hand under it to show the gloss, is a very sweet article. I can recommend it for your purpose, sir, because it really is extra super. But you shall see some others. Give me number four, you, to the boy, and with a dreadfully severe stare, foreseeing the danger of that miscreant's brushing me with it, 
or making some other sign of familiarity, Mr. Trabb never removed his stern eye from the boy until he had deposited number four on the counter and was at a safe distance again, and then he commanded him to bring number five and number eight. "'And let me have none of your tricks here,' said Mr. Trabb, "'or you shall repent it, you young scoundrel, the longest day you have to live.' Mr. Trabb then bent over number four, and in a sort of deferential confidence recommended it to me as a light article for summer wear, an article much in vogue among the nobility and gentry, an article that it would ever be an honour for him to reflect upon a distinguished fellow townsman's, if he might claim me for a fellow townsman, having worn. "'Are you bringing numbers five and eight, you vagabond?' said Mr. Tramp to the boy after that. Or shall I kick you out of the shop and bring them myself? I selected the materials for a suit with the assistance of Mr. Trabb's judgment, and re-entered the parlour to be measured, for although Mr. Trabb had measure already, and had previously been quite contented with it, he said apologetically that it wouldn't do under the existing circumstances, sir, wouldn't do at all. So Mr. Trabb measured and calculated me in the parlour, as if I were an estate, and he the finest species of surveyor and gave himself such a world of trouble that I felt that no suit of clothes could possibly remunerate him for his pains. When he had at last done and had appointed to send the articles to Mr. Pumblechooks on the Thursday evening, he said with his hand upon the parlour lock, I know, sir, that London gentlemen cannot be expected to patronise local work as a rule, but if you would give me a turn now and then in the quality of a townsman, I should greatly esteem it. Good morning, sir. Much obliged. Door. The last word was flung at the boy, who had not the least notion what it meant, but I saw him collapse as his master rubbed me out with his hands, and my first decided experience of the stupendous power of money was that it had morally laid upon his back Trab's boy. After this memorable event, I went to the hatters and the bootmakers and the hosiers and felt rather like Mother Hubbard's dog, whose outfit required the services of so many trades. I also went to the coach office and took my place for seven o'clock on Saturday morning. It was not necessary to explain everywhere that I had come into a handsome property, but whenever I said anything to that effect, it followed that the officiating tradesman ceased to have his attention diverted through the window by the high street, and concentrated his mind upon me. When I had ordered everything I wanted, I directed my steps towards Pumblechooks, and as I approached that gentleman's place of business, I saw him standing at his door. He was waiting for me with great impatience. He had been out early with the chase cart, and had called at the forge and heard the news. He had prepared a collation for me in the Barnwell parlour, and he too ordered his shopman to come out of the gangway as my sacred person passed. "'My dear friend,' said Mr. Pumblechook, taking me by both hands, when he and I and the collation were alone, "'I give you joy of your good fortune. Well deserved, well deserved.' This was coming to the point, and I thought it a sensible way of expressing himself. "'To think,' said Mr. Pumblechook, after snorting admiration at me for some moments, that I should have been the humble instrument of leading up to this is a proud reward. I begged Mr. Pumblechook to remember that nothing was to be ever said or hinted on that point. My dear young friend, said Mr. Pumblechook, if you will allow me to call you so. I murmured, certainly, and Mr. Pumblechook took me by both hands again and communicated a movement to his waistcoat, which had an emotional appearance though it was rather low down. My dear young friend, rely upon my doing my little all in your absence, by keeping the fact before the mind of Joseph. Joseph, said Mr. Pumblechook, in the way of a compassionate adjuration, Joseph, Joseph. Thereupon he shook his head and tapped it, expressing his sense of deficiency in Joseph. But my dear young friend, said Mr. Pumblechook, you must be hungry, you must be exhausted. Be seated. Here is a chicken had round from the boar. Here is a tongue had round from the boar. Here is one or two little things had round from the boar that I hope you may not despise. 
but do i said mr pumblechook getting up again the moment after he had sat down see afore me him as i ever sported with in his times of happy infancy and may i may i this may i meant might he shake hands i consented and he was fervent and then sat down again here is wine said mr pumblechook let us drink thanks to fortune and may she ever pick out her favourites with equal judgment and yet i cannot said mr pumblechook getting up again see afore me one and likewise drink to one without again expressing may i may i i said he might and he shook hands with me again and emptied his glass and turned it upside down i did the same and if i had turned myself upside down before drinking the wine could not have gone more direct to my head mr pumblechook helped me to the liver wing and to the best slice of tongue none of those out of the way no thoroughfares pork now and took comparatively speaking no care of himself at all ah poultry poultry you little thought said mr pumblechook apostrophizing the fowl in the dish when you was a young fledgling what was in store for you you little thought you was to be refreshment beneath this humble roof for one as call it a weakness if you will said mr pumblechook getting up again but may i may i it began to be unnecessary to repeat the form of saying he might so he did it at once however he did it so often without wounding himself with my knife i don't know and your sister he resumed after a little steady eating which had the honour of bringing you up by hand it's a sad picture to reflect she's no longer equal to fully understanding the honour may and i saw he was about to come at me again and i stopped him we'll drink her health said i ah cried mr pumblechook leaning back in his chair quite flaccid with admiration that's the way you know him sir i don't know who sir was but he certainly was not i and there was no third person present that's the way you know the noble-minded sir ever forgiving ever affable it might said the servile pumblechook putting down his untasted glass in a hurry and getting up again to a common person have the appearance of repeating but may i when he had done it he resumed his seat and drank to my sister let us never be blind said mr pumblechook to her faults of temper but it is to be hoped she meant well at about this time i began to observe that he was getting flushed in the face as to myself i felt all face steeped in wine and smarting i mentioned to mr pumblechook that i wished to have my new clothes sent to his house and he was ecstatic on my so distinguishing him i mentioned my reason for desiring to avoid observation in the village and he lauded it to the skies there was nobody but himself he intimated worthy of my confidence and in short mighty then he asked me tenderly if i remembered our boyish games at sums and how we had gone together to have me bound apprentice and in effect how he had ever been my favourite fancy and my chosen friend if i had taken ten times as many glasses of wine as i had i should have known that he never had stood in that relation towards me and should in my heart of hearts have repudiated the idea yet for all that i remember feeling convinced that i had been much mistaken in him and that he was a sensible practical good-hearted prime fellow by degrees he fell to reposing such great confidence in me as to ask my advice in reference to his own affairs he mentioned that there was an opportunity for a great amalgamation and monopoly of the corn and seed trade on those premises if he enlarged such as never occurred before in that or any other neighbourhood what alone was wanting to the realization of a vast fortune he considered to be more capital those were the two little words more capital now it appeared to him pumblechook that if that capital were got into the business through a sleeping partner sir which sleeping partner would have nothing to do but walk in by self or deputy whenever he pleased and examine the books and walk in twice a year and take his profits away in his pocket to the tune of fifty per cent it appeared to him that that might be an opening for a young gentleman of spirit combined with property 
which would be worthy of his attention. But what did I think? He had great confidence in my opinion. And what did I think? I gave as my opinion, wait a bit. The united vastness and distinctness of this view so struck him that he no longer asked if he might shake hands with me, but said he really must, and did. We drank all the wine, and Mr. Pumblechook pledged himself over and over again to keep Joseph up to the mark, I don't know what mark, and to render me efficient and constant service, I don't know what service. He also made known to me for the first time in my life, and certainly after having kept his secret wonderfully well, that he had always said of me, That boy is no common boy, and mark me his fortune will be no common fortune. He said with a tearful smile that it was a singular thing to think of it now, and I said so too. Finally I went out into the air with a dim perception that there was something unwanted in the conduct of the sunshine, and found that I had slumberously got to the turnpike without having taken any account of the road. There I was roused by Mr. Pumblechook's hailing me. He was a long way down the sunny street, and was making expressive gestures for me to stop. I stopped, and he came up, breathless. "'No, my dear friend,' said he, when he had recovered wind for speech. "'Not if I can help it. This occasion shall not entirely pass without that affability on your part. May I, as an old friend and well-wisher, may I?' We shook hands for the hundredth time at least, and he ordered a young carter out of my way with the greatest indignation. Then he blessed me and stood waving his hand to me until I had passed the crook in the road, and then I turned into a field and had a long nap under a hedge before I pursued my way home. I had scant luggage to take with me to London, for little of the little I possessed was adapted to my new station but I began packing that same afternoon, and wildly packed up things that I knew I should want next morning, in a fiction that there was not a moment to be lost. So Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday passed, and on Friday morning I went to Mr. Pumblechook's to put on my new clothes and pay my visit to Miss Havisham. Mr. Pumblechook's own room was given up to me to dress in, and was decorated with clean towels expressly for the event. My clothes were rather a disappointment, of course. Probably every new and eagerly expected garment ever put on since clothes came in, fell a trifle short of the wearer's expectation. But after I'd had my new suit on some half an hour, and gone through an immensity of posturing with Mr. Pumblechook's very limited dressing glass, in the futile endeavour to see my legs, it seemed to fit me better. It being market morning at a neighbouring town some ten miles off, Mr. Pumblechook was not at home. I had not told him exactly when I meant to leave, and was not likely to shake hands with him again before departing. That was all as it should be, and I went out in my new array, fearfully ashamed of having to pass the shopman, and suspicious after all that I was at a personal disadvantage, something like Joe's in his Sunday suit. I went circuitously to Miss Havisham's by all the back ways, and rang at the bell constrainedly on account of the stiff long fingers of my gloves. Sarah Pocket came to the gate, and positively reeled back when she saw me so changed. Her walnut-shell countenance likewise turned from brown to green and yellow. "'You,' said she, "'you, good gracious, what do you want?' "'I'm going to London, Miss Pocket,' said I, "'and want to say good-bye to Miss Havisham.' I was not expected, for she left me locked in the yard while she went to ask if I were to be admitted. After a very short delay she returned and took me up, staring at me all the way. Miss Havisham was taking exercise in the room with a long spread table, leaning on her crutch stick. The room was lighted as of yore, and at the sound of our entrance she stopped and turned. She was then just abreast of the rotted bride cake. Don't go, Sarah, she said. Well, Pip? I start for London, Miss Havisham, tomorrow. I was exceedingly careful what I said, and I thought you would kindly not mind me taking leave of you. This is a gay figure, Pip, said she, making her crutch stick play around me, as if she, the fairy godmother who had changed me, were bestowing the finishing gift. I have come into such good fortune since I saw you last, Miss Havisham, I murmured, and I am grateful for it, Miss Havisham. 
Ay, ay, she said, looking at the discomfited and envious Sarah with delight. I have seen Mr. Jaggers. I have heard about it, Pip, so you go to-morrow. Yes, Miss Havisham. And you are adopted by a rich person. Yes, Miss Havisham. Not named. No, Miss Havisham. And Mr. Jaggers is made your guardian. Yes, Miss Havisham. She quite gloated on these questions and answers, so keen was her enjoyment of Sarah Pocket's jealous dismay. Well, she went on. You have a promising career before you. Be good, deserve it, and abide by Mr. Jagger's instructions. She looked at me and looked at Sarah, and Sarah's countenance wrung out of her watchful face a cruel smile. Good-bye, Pip. You will always keep the name of Pip, you know. Yes, Miss Havisham. Good-bye, Pip. She stretched out her hand, and I went down on my knee and put it to my lips. I had not considered how I should take leave of her. It came naturally to me at the moment to do this. She looked at Sarah Pocket with triumph in her weird eyes. So I left my fairy godmother with both her hands on her crutch stick, standing in the midst of the dimly lighted room beside the rotten bride cake that was hidden in cobwebs. Sarah Pocket conducted me down as if I were a ghost who must be seen out. She could not get over my appearance and was in the last degree confounded. I said, Goodbye, Miss Pocket. She merely stared, and did not seem collected enough to know that I had spoken. Clear of the house, I made the best of my way back to Pumblechooks, and took off my new clothes, and made them into a bundle, and went back home in my old address, carrying it, to speak the truth, much more at my ease too, though I had the bundle to carry. And now those six days which were to have run out slowly had run out fast and were gone, and to-morrow looked me in the face more steadily than I could look at it. As the six evenings had dwindled away to five, to four, to three, to two, I had become more and more appreciative of the society of Joe and Biddy. On this last evening I dressed myself out in my new clothes, for their delight, and sat in my splendour until bedtime. We had a hot supper on the occasion, graced by the inevitable roast fowl, and we had some flip to finish with. We were all very low, and none the higher for pretending to be in spirits. I was to leave our village at five in the morning, carrying my little hand portman too, and I told Joe that I wished to walk away all alone. I am afraid, sore afraid, that this purpose originated in my sense of the contrast there would be between me and Joe if we went to the coach together. I pretended with myself that there was nothing of this taint in the arrangement, but when I went up to my little room on this last night, I felt compelled to admit that it might be so and had an impulse upon me to go down again and entreat Joe to walk with me in the morning. I did not. All night there were coaches in my broken sleep going to wrong places instead of London, and having in the traces, now dogs, now cats, now pigs, now men, never horses, fantastic failures of journeys occupied me until the day dawned and the birds were singing, and I got up and partly dressed and sat at the window to take a last look out and in taking it fell asleep. Biddy was astir so early to get my breakfast that although I did not sleep at the window an hour, I smelt the smoke of the kitchen fire when I started up with a terrible idea that it must be late in the afternoon. But long after that, and long after I had heard the clinking of the teacups and was quite ready, I wanted the resolution to go downstairs. After all, I remained up there repeatedly unlocking and unstrapping my small portmanteau and locking and strapping it up again, till Biddy called me that I was late. It was a hurried breakfast, with no taste in it. I got up from the meal, saying with a sort of briskness, as if it had only just occurred to me, Well, I suppose I must be off. Then I kissed my sister, who was laughing and nodding and shaking in her usual chair, and kissed Biddy, and threw my arms around Joe's neck. Then I took up my little portmanteau and walked out. The last I saw of them was when I presently heard a scuffle behind me, and looking back saw Joe throwing an old shoe after me, and Biddy throwing another old shoe. I stopped then to wave my hat, and dear old Joe waved his strong right arm above his head, crying huskily, Hurrah! and Biddy put her apron to her face. I walked away at a good pace, thinking it was easier to go than I had supposed it would be and recollecting that it would never have done to have an old shoe thrown after the coach in sight of all the high street. I whistled and made nothing of going, but the village was very peaceful and quiet, 
and the light mists were solemnly rising as if to show me the world and i had been so innocent and little there and beyond was so unknown and great that in a moment with a strong heave and sob i broke into tears it was by the finger post at the end of the village and i laid my hand upon it and said good-bye oh my dear dear friend heaven knows we need never be ashamed of our tears for they are rain upon the blinding dust of earth overlying our hard hearts i was better after i cried than before more sorry more aware of my own ingratitude more gentle if i had cried before i should have had joe with me then so subdued i was by those tears and by their breaking out again in the course of the quiet walk that when i was on the coach and it was clear of the town i deliberated with an aching heart whether i would not get down when we changed horses and walked back and have another evening at home and a better parting we changed and i had not made up my mind and still reflected for my comfort that it would be quite practicable to get down and walk back when we changed again and while i was occupied with these deliberations i would fancy an exact resemblance to joe in some man coming along the road towards us and my heart would beat high as if he could possibly be there we changed again and yet again and it was now too late and too far to go back and i went on and the mists had all solemnly risen now and the world lay spread before me this is the end of the first stage of pip's expectations <laughs>